Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. Welcome to another Twilight Takedown video review thingamajig. There's a lot of stuff in the Twilight world that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's like, why are they still going to high school? <laughs> like up until last year, it doesn't, they're a hundred years old. I'm actually really proud of myself for getting this far because usually uh, I'll have every intention of starting a project and then maybe work on it for an hour or two and then be really over it. Like, you know, recently I've gotten myself back into education because I decided that I should be a modern day philosopher. I'm generally opposed to wisdom. I think wisdom is the most disgusting thing you can imagine. We'll see how long that one lasts, but I'm at book three. I'm at book three. I've not done it yet, but I've get in there and I. That was horrible. Get in there, innit? I? Anyway, yes, welcome back to this Twilight Takedown video. Make sure that you've seen the first two. If you have no idea what I'm on about, what I'm on about is I'm going to slag off Twilight for the next three hours. So please enjoy. But before we get into that, climate change. What are you doing about it? Not as much as me, clearly. I'm Mrs. Climate Change. I'm gonna single-handedly save this planet. Well, Maybe not. But you know who can help the issue? Today's sponsor, Ren. Everyone's lifestyle emits CO2. You can't really help it. So I won't berate you for it, all right? I do it, we all do it. Some people more than others. And Ren is a very simple yet effective way to help make a difference in the climate crisis. Ren is a website where you can calculate your carbon footprint and then help offset it by funding projects such as tree planting, mineral weathering, and rainforest protection. All you need to do is answer a few questions about your lifestyle to find out your carbon footprint, and then you can learn how to reduce it. But remember, no one can reduce their carbon footprint to zero. Well, you mortals can't. So with Ren, you can offset what you have left after reducing. Once you sign up to make a monthly contribution, you receive monthly updates from the projects that you support. You get to see what your money is spent on with photographs and details. Here are some of the projects that you can sponsor. Ren members help fund four types of climate solutions. The first is technology. So you've got biochar in California, which helps prevent wildfires. You've got mineral weathering in Scotland, I'm so, so sorry to every Scottish person I know. <laughs> this helps speed up Earth's natural carbon cycle. Clean cooking fuel for refugees in Uganda. Second is tree planting, which is fairly self-explanatory. <laughs> self-explanatory. The third is policy. So a clean air task force, carbon 180. And conservation, Amazon rainforest protection. Do you know what? I think that is the one that I myself will go for to help against deforestation. Because if the rainforest goes, where's everyone gonna live? They're gonna have to all come live with me. All the animals, everyone. In my flat. Great. Climate change has affected me, personally. I, who does it think it is? We're currently having a little bit of hot weather in England. <laughs> That's always fun. You know, we're really not suited to seeing the sun for more than one week a year. So it's not great. And I've made changes to my life to try to live more sustainably from beauty products to my plant-based diet. I'm literally saving the world one vegan ice cream tub at a time. You're welcome. It will take a lot to end the climate crisis, but you can start helping out today by learning more on Ren.co. So offset your carbon footprint with Ren. The first 100 people who sign up using the special link in my description will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. So thank you, Ren, for sponsoring today's video. Now let's start the video. Honestly, I'm so honored and excited to be back here doing what I love, slagging stuff off. We're treated with a poem, Fire and Ice, by some bloke called Ross, some bloke, he's probably really famous, Robert Frost, Fire and Ice. This is meant to be a metaphor for Edward and Jacob and how I wish they'd both freeze and be set on fire. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great. My delivery of this is terrible. You can tell I'd never be a poet. Preface. All our attempts at subterfuge had been in vain. Hell yeah, finally, thank God. With ice in my heart. Ice. 
just like in the poem from one page ago. Stephanie Mayer is a genius. Underrated as well. Can't believe no one's ever heard of her. Anyway, Bella in this preface is all like, OMG, I'm definitely going to die this time because, you know, we've been teased with this before two times, but it never comes true. So I won't get my hopes up. Chapter one, ultimatum. I don't know why you're making Charlie carry notes to Billy like we're in second grade. If I wanted to talk to you, I would answer the, you made the choice here, okay? You can't have it both ways when, what part of mortal enemies is too complicated for you to, look, I know I'm being a jerk, but there's just no way around. We can't be friends when you're spending all your time with a bunch of, it just makes it worse when I think about you too much, so don't write anymore. Yeah, I miss you too, a lot. Doesn't change anything, sorry. Jacob. Why wouldn't he just write this all on a different sheet of paper instead of crossing it out so that Bella can read it, obviously? What a drama queen. Also, that poor tree that had to be cut down for this nonsense. The in book and outside of book. Clearly, these people have never heard of Wren.co. Jacob is big mad at Bella because she's dating dreamy Edward Cullen and not him, but he's using the we are wolves, they are vampires racism as an excuse. Did I really take a break? after doing five minutes of filming to eat cake and watch TV? Absolutely. Before we continue, I would like to shout out Richard Iwadi because he really needs my help. He's a very underrated, undiscovered gem. You've probably never heard of him. Ploppers. <laughs> this book is one of the funniest books I've ever read. This book single-handedly gave me more confidence in doing commentary as a valid source of work and entertainment because this is basically a commentary book it's about Gwyneth Paltrow's film called View from the Top that is what this book is about it's just him satirizing and mocking a film and it's hilarious so anyway where were we something about vampires and wolves and racism I'm sure um what was surprising was how much each crossed out line wounded me, as if the points of the letters had cutting edges. More than that, behind each angry beginning lurked a vast pool of hurt. Jacob's pain cut me deeper than my own. Oh my god, such an empath. Shouldn't have led him on for the entirety of New Moon then, should you have, silly Billy. Charlie acts as though he should be on r slash weaponized incompetence. I don't even know if that is a subreddit. Oh, that's funny. I just Googled Reddit weaponized incompetence and what's coming up is um all <laughs> feminist pages. Oh dear, oh dear. Anyway, the jar of spaghetti sauce Charlie had stuck in the microwave was only on its first revolution. Uh, revolution, was it? Shut up. When I yanked the door open and pulled it out. You're supposed to take the lid off first, dad. Metal's bad for microwaves. How would you not know that? I swiftly removed the lid as I spoke, poured half the sauce into a bowl, then put the bowl inside the microwave and the jar back in the fridge. I fixed the time and pressed start. Oof. This is riveting, a blow by blow account of how to put something in the microwave. That's why Eclipse is 650 pages long, by the way, just does this the whole time. Charlie watched my adjustments with pursed lips. Did I get the noodles right? I looked in the pan on the stove, the source of the smell that had alerted me. Stirring helps, I said mildly. I found a spoon and tried to declump the mushy hunk that was scalded to the bottom. Thankfully, Bella is there to be a good house whammon Oh. and cook food for the ignorant man folk whilst he chops wood all day or something. Charlie is being surly, so Bella thinks about how Edward is her eternal companion. All right, good for you. Don't remember where I asked. Don't care, didn't ask. Got my merch down below. Afternoons were the hardest part of my day. Ever since my former best friend and werewolf, Jacob Black, had informed on me about the motorcycle I'd been riding on the sly, a betrayal he had devised in order to get me grounded so that I couldn't spend more time with my boyfriend and vampire Edward Cullen. Edward, this is a very long run on sentence. Edward had been allowed to see me only from 7 to 9.30 p.m., always inside the confines of my home and under the supervision of my dad's unfailingly crabby glare. That is for your own good, though, to be fair. Of course, I still saw Edward at school because there wasn't anything Charlie could do about that. And then Edward spent almost every night in my room, too, but Charlie wasn't precisely aware of that. I, I was convinced that Stephanie was convinced she was Bella. This isn't very Mormon of them. I feel like I have cake in my <laughs> <gasps> like icing or something. I couldn't bear to hurt my dad by moving out now when a much more permanent separation hovered, invisible to Charlie, so close on my horizon. So ready to cut off every human she's ever known just for Edward. At least make it someone worthwhile, like Keanu Reeves. 
That's it. We ate in silence for a moment. Charlie was still scanning the news, so I picked up my much abused copy of Wuthering Heights from where I'd left it this morning at breakfast and tried to lose myself in turn of the century England while I waited for him to start talking. Wuthering Heights is just as boring as Bella is. I will die on that hill. I read like some pages and it was just going on about dogs barking at some bloke. It's like, he fucks as boring. Probably gonna upset loads of classical purists by saying that, but come at me. I was just to the part where Heathcliff returns Gosh, spoiler alert, come on, some of us haven't read it all. Charlie wants to talk to Bella about a Jacob and says Jacob was responsible for telling on Bella about the motorbikes. So what? We already know that. Charlie says Bella can become ungrounded on one condition. He sighed again. I know you're satisfied to spend all of your time with Edward. I spent time with Alice too, I interjected. Edward's sister had no hours of visitation. She came and went as she pleased. Charlie was putty in her capable hands. That's true, he said. But you have other friends beside the Cullens, Bella. Or you used to. We stared at each other for a long moment. When was the last time you spoke to Angela Webber? He threw at me. Even her father knows that she's an incel loser. She is actually literally an incel because Edward refuses to have sex with her. You know that if like it was down to her, they would be banging by now. Just saying. Before Edward's return, so Edward's a volcel. <laughs> Which there's nothing wrong with wanting to wait or whatever, but it's just, this is steeped in Mormonic, Mormonic, Christianic undertones in it, which look, I'm agnostic. Do you know what I think we should normalize more in the West? Polytheism. I don't know why everything turned to monotheism. Was it just easier to keep up with the idea of one all grand all knowing God? But polytheism would be so much more interesting. Look at ancient Egyptian. I think we should normalize and bring back gods who have jackal heads for heads, crocodile heads, eagle heads, whatever. I think that is so much more interesting and you'd get a lot of people converting. Just Maybe you wouldn't actually. Maybe that's just, I'm just projecting because if I had to choose one, I would probably go for ancient Egyptian ism or Shintoism. The idea that everything just, everything interesting has a spirit quite like that. Before Edward's return, my school friends had polarized into two groups. I like to think of those groups as good versus evil. Us versus them work too. And fantastic tribalism. We love to see it. The good guys were Angela, her steady boyfriend, Ben Cheney, yeah. and Mike Newton. These three had all generously forgiven me for going crazy when Edward left. Lauren Mallory was the evil core of the them side and almost everyone else, including my first friend in Forks, Jessica Stanley, seemed content to go along with her anti-Bella agenda. What a biased perspective. She's the one that behaved like a zombie for months after Edward left in New Moon. Um... And then after being a zombie for ages, she started acting psychotically. No wonder some people just don't vibe with her. There's nothing evil about that. I just realized that I left the fan on. <laughs> so I've had to turn it off to minimize any background noise because I'm just that nice to you, my audience. My fingers are gonna start sweating, you know what I mean? Oh, it's so grim. Anyway, I don't think you should dump all your other friends for your boyfriend, Bella, he said in a stern voice. It's not nice. And I think your life will be better balanced if you kept some pe other people in it. What happened last September, he is right. We are meant to be on Bella's side here. She is the primary protagonist. She's the primary chart guest, <laughs> but Charlie is right. Charlie wants Bella to hang out with Jacob because he doesn't seem to understand that Jacob is the one who doesn't actually want to see Bella because he's in love with her, but she is with Edward. I don't know why Charlie is being this dense. Isn't Edward up for a little healthy competition? Charlie's voice was sarcastic now. I leveled a dark look at him. There's no competition. You're hurting Jake's feelings, avoiding him like this. He'd rather just be friends than nothing. Oh, now I was avoiding him. He's being this pushy because he not so secretly wants Bella to end up with Jacob because he likes Jacob at this point, which is low key weird, right? Because you can dislike Edward and he has every reason to, so that's fine. But you can dislike your daughter's boyfriend without also wanting to foist your daughter off to the next eligible bachelor. Women don't always need men to complete them. Go away, Maya. Bella promises to try to be more inclusive of Jacob, and she's also been accepted into a university she will never go to because she wants to play housewife with a vampire for the next millennia. Education is important, Stephanie Mayer. Get lost yet again. Edward knocks at the door. I steal myself for our first description of Marvel. Wait, 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 hold on a second. Stop the video because I have merch now. 
Yes, we've finally done it. I have merch, I have a merchandise store. We have four different designs and a range of products to choose from. This is the don't care, didn't ask. You know when someone just keeps going on and on and on about something you really don't care about? Well, hit them with one of these. My God, look at that coloring, the tasteful off-white thickness of it. Everything you see here is as eco-friendly as I could have made it. Items are recycled where possible, organic, sustainable, carbon neutral, the prints are all vegan. The supplier that I'm using even has a recycling scheme, so when your clothes get to the end of their life, you can send them back and then they can be remade and recycled into new things. Isn't that amazing? Not only that, but the clothes these factories are made in, in the UK, are powered by renewable energy. I know, I've outdone myself this time. <laughs> So let's get on to the designs. We have the don't care, didn't ask. We have it in the relaxed jumper. Here we have a jumper, which in Japanese says you may. In English, this means famous, as in, why am I not famous yet? We also have Elise in katakana on various items. And the piece de resistance is our die, cry, hate line, a parody of live, laugh, love. We have a puzzle made of recycled cardboard featuring die, cry, hate. For all the masochists out there who really enjoy really, really, really hard puzzles, look at all the white pieces, you'd be crazy to buy this one. Not only that, we have the tote bag to carry around all of your um, precious items in, and the tie-dye limited edition cry, die, hate t-shirt. So where can all this be found? I'm glad you asked. The website is AY Clothing, as in a, as in A Lameo, ayclothing.tmail.com. I'll put the links in the description. You can head over there if you would like to buy some merchandise to support the channel or just tell the world what you really think of them. Don't care, don't ask, die, cry, hate. I'm really excited to be putting this merchandise out to the world. It's just we've been working on this for a really, really long time and it's amazing to see it finally come to fruition. No, it's not true. Don't trust any YouTuber when they tell you they've been working years on something. But this has been fun. I have wanted to do merchandise for a while, but I wanted something that wasn't going to be the usual kind of thing. I wanted it to stand separately on its own, as if it could be a brand of its own. Maybe we'll just see how it goes. But I also really wanted something to combat the live, laugh lovers of the world. So here we are, my demotivational merchandise line. If it goes well, then we will do a second drop in the future, but only if it goes well. So, you know, let me know if you guys want there to be a second drop. I'll know that by if I make any sales. And the artist I use for this project is my good friend, Jenny Pond. Her links will be in the description as well. So head over to ayclothing.tmail.com if you would like to buy some merchandise. Now, on with the video. I wrenched the door out of my way, ridiculously eager, and there he was, my personal miracle. Time had not made me immune to the perfection of his face, and I was sure that I would never take any aspect of him for granted. My eyes traced over to his pale white features, the hard square of his jaw, the soft curve of his full lips. Reckon he has lip filler. If he's like made of marble in granite, how would he get lip filler? I guess you could just inject quick dry and wet cement, like from a Beano cartoon or something. Twisted up into a smile now, twisted into a smile, <laughs> shut up. The straight line of his nose, the sharp angle of his cheekbones. Oh my God, she's describing me? The smooth marble span of his forehead. Why is she getting hot and bothered over a forehead? Get a grip partially obscured by a tangle of rain darkened bronze hair. I saved his eyes for last, knowing that I, when I looked into them, I was likely to lose my train of thought. I'm losing my mind. They were wide. <laughs> wide, like he'd just been doing loads of meth. Warm with liquid gold and framed by, I can't cry, my makeup will run in this heat, and framed by a thick fringe of black lashes. Staring into his eyes always made me feel extraordinary. Sort of like my bones were turning spongy. I love getting so turned on that my bones just turn to that sponge that I'd use to wipe dishes in the kitchen sink. I was also a little lightheaded, but that could have been because I'd forgotten to keep breathing. Again. It was a face any male model in the world would trade his soul for. Of course, that might be exactly the asking price. One soul. I'm closing this book, I've had enough. He greets her by sniffing her blood. So romantic. I knew that the scent of my blood, so much sweeter to him than any other person's blood, truly like wine beside water to an alcoholic. Meh, I always preferred whiskey. 
Johnny Walker Black, in case you're wondering, just because it got me drunk faster. It made me sad that he had to try so hard. I comforted myself with the knowledge that I wouldn't be causing him pain much longer. It makes me so sad that my vampire boyfriend has to try so hard not to murder and eat me. Good evening, Charlie. Edward was always flawlessly polite, though Charlie didn't deserve it. Are you actually joking, you brat? You ran away? for three days to a different country and didn't contact Charlie to tell him you were okay. Why did I just go so like made in Chelsea then? All because of Edward. Get a grip. Bella is late to applying for unis, but Edward keeps making her and it is heavily, heavily, heavily implied that he is bribing the universities. Why? She's just going to throw her life and hobbies away to suck marble for the rest of her eternal life. Education be damned. Charlie doesn't want Bella visiting Seattle at the moment because of all the murders going on. But the murders are actually this vampire army that Victoria from the first two books is creating to kill Bella and maybe the Cullens with. Spoiler alert. No, that's fine, Charlie, Edward said, interrupting me. I didn't mean Seattle. I was thinking Portland, actually. I wouldn't have Bella in Seattle either. Of course not. Yeah, the men folk decide where the women can and cannot go. Thank you very much. Edward has Bella fill out more uni applications. Be serious, Edward. Dartmouth? Edward lifted the discarded application and laid it gently in front of me again. I think you'd like New Hampshire, he said. There's a full complement of night courses for me, and the forests are very conveniently located for the avid hiker plentiful wildlife. He pulled out the crooked smile he knew I couldn't resist. <laughs> Can you resist this, Bella? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Could have been better. At least Edward wants to continue educating himself, but I'm not really sure why, because he's not done anything with his education, but I go to high school for decades. But it is more than Bella wants for herself, so the bar is incredibly low around here. Edward wants Bella to stay human for as long as possible, but she's having none of it. She can tell me it's because she's scared of the Volturi until she's blue in the face, but I know it's because she doesn't want to look older than a teen for a, for a noncy boyfriend. Bella is planning to turn into a vampire in a few weeks' time. Bella makes a joke about wanting to become a monster, and Edward has a tantrum and tells her the Seattle killings are being done by a vampire. We've been monitoring the situation for a few weeks. All the signs are there. The unlikely disappearances, always in the night, the poorly disposed of corpses, the lack of other evidence. Yes, someone brand new. And no one seems to be taking responsibility for the neophyte. He took a deep breath. Well, it's not our problem. We wouldn't even pay attention to the situation if it wasn't so close to home. Like I said, this happens all the time. The existence of monsters results in monstrous consequences. Monitoring the situation and doesn't realize it's connected with Victoria and somehow Alice hasn't had a vision of this despite them focusing on the situation. I hope it's explained by the end of the book. So I can get it. Edward's family are vegetarian vampires who only eat animals and not humans. So basically they just act like regular human beings. Words and definitions mean nothing. Better he allowed. There are polar bears too. Very fierce. Very fierce. Shut up. And the wolves get quite large. My mouth fell open and my breath blew out in a sharp gust. What's wrong? He asked. Before I could recover, the confusion vanished and his whole body seemed to harden like a metapod. Oh, never mind the wolves then, if the idea is offensive to you. His voice was stiff, formal, his shoulders rigid. Well, yeah, he is made of marble. Also, Bella is such an elitist. Take a tour around a factory farm sometime. She only cares about the wolves being eaten just because her best friend can shapeshift into a wolf. Ugh, whatever. My voice turned pleading in response. Charlie says Jake is having a hard time. He's hurting right now and... It's my fault. You've done nothing wrong, Bella. She totally led him on and used him to try to fill the Edward-shaped hole in her life. But okay, she's done, whatever. I took a deep breath. I need to make it better, Edward. I owe him that. And it's one of Charlie's conditions anyway. His face changed while I spoke, turning hard again, statue-like. You know it's out of the question for you to be around a werewolf unprotected, Bella. And it would break the treaty if any of us cross over into their land. Do you want to start a war? I can understand a bit of jealousy and protectiveness if your partner says they want to hang around with someone who is in love with them. But Edward adamantly being all, you're not allowed to see him because the werewolves are dangerous is controlling and speciesist. Edward dabs on Wuthering Heights and OMG, I love him now. Well, I hope you're smart enough to stay away from someone so selfish. Catherine is really the source of all the trouble, not Heathcliff. Bella hates women confirmed. Bella asks Edward if she can see Jacob and he says, no, bad woman. Stay home, cook dinner for the menfolk. Edward heard my heart accelerate and nodded as if I'd acknowledged the lie aloud. Werewolves are unstable. Sometimes the people near them get hurt. Sometimes they get killed. Bro. Your brother and species, Jasper, literally tried to murder Bella over a paper cut. 
like what, eight months ago? Bella has almost been killed countless times by Edward's own kind. This is as hypocritical as all heck. Edward admits he met the werewolves before, a frame black, Jacob's great-grandfather, 70 years ago. Edward blames Bella for the werewolves existing, but she hits him with the ultimate Uno reverse card, no you, it's your fault that the werewolves currently exist. Bella pleads some more, so Edward calls Jacob a dog to be derogatory, but the joke's on him because dogs are the best, so sharp Edward. Bella resolves to see Jacob anyway, but Edward is all like, I'll stop you, which isn't controlling at all. It's not a major red flag. Chapter two evasion. I felt oddly buoyant as I walked from Spanish toward the cafeteria, and it wasn't just because I was holding hands with the most perfect person on the planet, though that certainly was a part of it. So perfect. I love it when a guy bans me from seeing an entire group of people just because they can turn into giant dogs. Bella plans to go to Angela's house to help her with a task purely to shut Charlie up. What a great friend, hanging out with someone due to an obligation. Alice wants to celebrate Bella being ungrounded, but then Alice has a vision, but she acts as though she was daydreaming so the humans don't get suspicious. Edward and Alice hide the vision from Bella. They go home and Edward breathes on Bella to make her horny. If I had my way, I would spend the majority of my time kissing Edward. <laughs> kissing, that's another word for it. There wasn't anything I'd experienced in my life that compared to the feeling of his cool lips, marble hard, but always so gentle, moving with mine. Sounds thrilling, I'm sure one could get the same experience by snogging Michelangelo's David. So it surprised me a little when his fingers braided themselves into my hair, securing my face to his. My arms locked behind his neck and I wished I was stronger, strong enough to keep him prisoner here. One hand slid down my back, pressing me tighter against his stone chest. Even through his sweater, his skin was cold enough to make me shiver. It was a shiver of pleasure, of happiness, but his hands began to loosen in response. How disappointing. The tip of my tongue traced the curve of his lower lip. It was as flawlessly smooth as if it had been polished and the taste. Sorry, is this smut, 50 shades of gray? Behave. Edward stops Bella from making him even more rock hard than he usually is, and she answers an email from her mother. I scanned through Renee's email, shaking my head now and then at some of the dippier things she'd done. I was just as entertained and horrified as the first time I'd read this. It was so like my mother to forget exactly how paralyzed she was by heights until she was already strapped to a parish. This, that is incredibly inept, I don't believe that and a dive instructor. I felt a little frustrated with Phil, her husband of almost two years, for allowing that one. I would have taken better care of her. I knew her so much better. Parentification. I saw her cornucopia of mistakes. I wish you were in the Hunger Games cornucopia. XOXO. Edward notices that Bella has ripped out her car stereo from her truck and shoved it into the corner of her room. She did that ages ago when they broke up because it was a gift from his family. I don't understand how he's only just noticed this. Oh wait just for the plot, I suppose. Bella still has valid tickets to Florida to see her mum, which was a gift from Carlisle and Esme. Edward insists on going this weekend, but Bella is hesitant. Edward tells Bella about Alice's vision. His expression was composed. There was only the slightest hardening of his topaz eyes. She's been seeing Jasper in a strange place, somewhere in the Southwest, she thinks, near his former family. But he has no conscious intentions to go back, he sighed. It's got her worried. Why didn't you tell me before? I didn't realize you'd notice, he said. It's probably nothing important in any case. My imagination was sadly out of control. I'd taken a perfectly normal afternoon and twisted it until it looked like Edward was going out of his way to keep things from me. I needed therapy. I'm very sure, I'm almost 100% sure that he is lying about the severity of her vision. And now she is questioning her sanity over it. That is gaslighting. Charlie comes home, so Bella makes dinner for him. My God, this is as dry as Charlie's cooking. I'm 51 pages in and nothing is happening. Charlie says that he and Billy spoke on the phone. Yeah, he's invited us down to visit this weekend. He was thinking of having the Clearwaters and the Uli's over too. Sort of a playoff party. Huh, was my genius response. But what could I say? I knew I wouldn't be allowed to hit a werewolf party, even with parental supervision. I wondered if Edward would have a problem with Charlie hanging out in La Push, or would he suppose that, since Charlie was mostly spending his time with Billy, who was the only human, my father wouldn't be in danger? When your boyfriend is so controlling, you think that he might want to control your father too. Such a Romeo. Edward tells Charlie about the plane tickets to try to force Bella's hand into going. That's out the question. Charlie was abruptly in a rage, shouting the words. Why? Edward asked, his voice saturated with innocent surprise. You just said it was a good idea for her to see her mother. Charlie ignored him. You're not going anywhere with him, young lady, he yelled. I spun around and he was jabbing a finger at me. Christ, the way all the blokes try to boss around this girl. Charlie says Bella is grounded for literally no reason. Is this book the character assassination of Charlie Swan? I mean, I've read further ahead, so I kind of know it is. 
R.I.P. Bella threatens to move out so Charlie backs off and she goes out to tell Edward off for being a meddling Mary. Does this sudden urge to see Florida have anything to do with the party at Billy's place? His jaw flexed. Nothing at all. It wouldn't matter if you were here or on the other side of the world, you still wouldn't be going. It was just like with Charlie before, just like being treated as a misbehaving child. I gritted my teeth together so I wouldn't start shouting. I didn't want to fight with Edward too. Well, compared to Edward and his real age, you kind of are a misbehaving child. They go to see Esme and we don't get to see any of that before they're at Bella's again, so why mention it? I don't care. I smiled. Edward and Alice playing chess was one of the most funniest things I've ever seen. They'd sat there nearly motionless, staring at the board while Alice foresaw the moves he would make and he picked the moves she would make in return out of her head. They played most of the game in their minds. I think they'd each move two pawns when Alice suddenly flicked her king over and surrendered. It took... All of three minutes. This is a real beehive of activity, Halberstram. I suppose you just had to be there to see how funny it was. Bella chats with Charlie alone and he tries to give her the birds and the bees talk and Bella has to admit to avoid the awkwardness that she is a, still a virgin. Satisfied, he starts... <laughs> Which is weird in of itself, and then like, like I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure when you're a parent, no one wants to imagine their their child as an adult having sex, but it is a fact of life. Like we're all here as a product of it. And it's just, I don't know, it's just that trope in it of like fathers being weird about their daughters' virginity, linked with purity, like you know that kind of religious crap. Almost everyone bones deal with it. Charlie starts badgering her over Jacob again. Literally get over it. Go out with Jacob yourself if you care that much. Edward is off hunting or something. So Bella decides to take the opportunity to go see Jacob get wrecked better. It was at this point the script just says, oh no, a few times because I knew what was coming up and I actually despise this part with every fiber of my being, every cell in my body. Bella's truck isn't starting. Edward is sitting silently in the back and he tells her that Alice called him. Because she can't see the wolves, you know, he explained in the same low murmur. Had you forgotten that? When you decide to mingle your fate with theirs, you disappear too. You couldn't know that part. I realized that. But can you understand why that might make me a little anxious. Why does he sound like a serial killer? It sounds like a like a villain's monologue. If Edward was not a fictional character, you just met him in, in reality. You know, he's one of those guys who'd be like an axe murderer. Alice saw you disappear and she couldn't even tell if you'd come home or not. Your future got lost, just like theirs. He has taken a part out of her truck engine so she can't go. I'll put your car back together in time for school in case you'd like to drive yourself, he assured me after a minute. With my lips mashed together, I retrieved my keys and stiffly climbed out of my truck. Shut your window if you want me to stay away tonight. I'll understand, he whispered just before I slammed the door. This is such a huge red flag that communists everywhere are jealous. He physically tampered with her vehicle to prevent her from doing something that he doesn't deem acceptable. That is just abuse. But then I hate Bella for this next part. She slams her window shut. I stared at the shivering black glass for a long moment until it was still. Then I sighed and opened the window as wide as it would go. Utterly pathetic behavior. True love does not mean just rolling over and taking it when someone wants to screw you and not in the fun way. She is pathetic, he is a nonce. I hate them both. Me just genuinely getting annoyed with this. Chapter three, motives. Edward and Bella visit Renee, but we join them as soon as they return to Fork. So like, what is the point? I kind of feel like if you're gonna write 650 pages in a book, can we at least kind of see something from it rather than just being told retrospectively, Oh yeah, so that trip happened. It was so long. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. We just get a recap of her visit. This morning, we'd gone for a walk along the beach. She wanted to show off all the beauties of her new home, still hoping, I think, that the sun might lure me away from Forks. She'd also wanted to talk with me alone, and that was easily arranged. Edward had fabricated a term paper to give himself an excuse to stay indoors during the day. <sighs> Edward's life must be really boring. He just spends his time waiting around for Bella to hang out with him. Renee feels like Bella's relationship is too intense. The way you move, you orient yourself around him without even thinking about it. When he moves, even a little bit you adjust your position and say bullshit bullshit no one at shut up it's so unrealistic it's getting harder and harder to not swear in these bloody videos bullshit definitely ain't a swear word and neither's bollocks or dickhead <laughs> grow up you adjust your position at the same time like magnets or gravity yeah yeah their relationship is a real force of nature all right you're like a 
satellite or something. I've never seen anything like it. I hate this description so much. Bella is pathetic. Even her own mother knows that Bella isn't the star of her own show. She's the satellite orbiting another planet. The way Bella talks about her own mother is also incredibly condescending all of the time as well. I can't be bothered to screenshot it and read it out because I would be here for another 10 hours, but just trust me, fam. They get home. Charlie missed Bella because no one could cook him dinner. I'm not even joking. Jacob called whilst Bella was away. Conveniently, he calls right now. Why didn't you call me? Jacob demanded. His angry tone instantly got my back up because I've been in the house for exactly four seconds and your call interrupted Charlie telling me that you'd called. And then he instantly acts like a freak. That he misses her and he acts like a whatever. Jacob vague books and hangs up. I respect that based. I knew Jake inside and out. How? They were besties for like two months. At a, two months at a push. How? Bella wonders if Jacob called because he thought she was turning into a vampire whilst she was away. If a vampire bites a human, the treaty between them and the werewolves breaks. Edward stiffened and a low hiss sounded in my ear. We'll have to leave, I whispered, before, so that it doesn't break the treaty. We won't ever be able to come back. His arms tightened around me. I know. Yeah, I bet Edward can't wait to have Bella isolated from all of her friends and family. If I asked you to do something, would you trust me? Edward asked and edged to his soft voice. We were almost to school. Edward had been relaxed and joking just a moment ago, and now suddenly his hands were clenched tight on the steering wheel, his knuckles straining in an effort to not snap it into pieces. Yeah, extreme mood swings are always really dreamy. What do you want me to do, Edward? I want you to stay in the car. He pulled into his usual spot and turned the engine off as he spoke. I want you to wait here until I come back for you. But why? That was when I saw him. He would have been hard to miss towering over the students the way he did, even if he hadn't been leaning against his black motorcycle parked illegally on the sidewalk. Oh my God, who cares? Oh, Jacob's face was a calm mask that I recognized well. I'll surrender. Not! Oh yeah, can't even have Bella go speak to her former friend personally. That is definitely not controlling at all. They go to speak to Jacob together. He's six foot seven now. I think this is meant to be his character development. You could have called us, Edward said in a steel hard voice. Sorry, Jacob answered, his face twisting into a sneer. I don't have any leeches on my speed dial. <laughs> Sick burn, Jacob. Jake is there to warn the Cullens, as in threaten them, because Emmett crossed over to Wolf Territory lines on Saturday night. All these supernaturals need to just like get a grip. It's, it's not that deep, mate, it don't matter. Jacob knows something that Bella doesn't know and Edward gets big mad over this. You guys know how much I hate repetition, right? I find it really annoying. I don't like how people are clearly getting taught in school when you write a speech to have repetition. Because now, all I ever see on Facebook, I need to do my Facebook account because it's just, it's literally the, it stresses me out so much. It's the worst thing ever for me. What a privileged life I lead. Whenever people want to make a little um, status about something on Facebook that they're a bit passionate about, whatever it may be, it can be about all brand flakes for all I care. I just notice how much people will use repetition and it really, it just bothers me because it's like, I know you're doing it because you've been taught that way to try and make a statement. And now I can see that you're trying really hard to make a statement. And I don't like it when I see people trying hard because it's not natural. Like I, I'm naturally funny. I'm not try hard or mate. I don't know. It's just a pet peeve of mine because I'm an incredibly irritable person and I don't like anyone. So anyway, yeah, repetition. Something Edward didn't want me to know. Something that Jacob wouldn't have kept from me. Something that had the Cullens and the Wolves, both in the woods, moving in hazardous, hazard, hazardous, moving in, had a, moving in, hazardous proximity to each other. Something that would cause Edward to insist I fly across the country. Something that, yeah, okay, I get it. Something's going on. Jesus. Something that Alice had seen in a vision last week, a vision Edward had lied to me about. Something I'd been waiting for anyway. Something I knew would happen again, as much as I might wish it never would. It was never going to end. Was it? I don't know. This paragraph's never going to end. Thanks, Maya. I hate it. Bella realizes that Victoria is back and she starts panicking. These three donuts are having this exchange in front of their schoolmates, by the way. You don't think Bella has a right to know? Jacob challenged. It's her life. Edward kept his voice muted. Even Tyler, edging forward by inches, would be unable to hear. Why should she be frightened when she was never in danger? Better frightened than lied to. Jacob has a point. Edward is always lying to Bella by omission because he arrogantly assumes that he knows what is best for her. Abruptly, Jacob's expression shifted and he was staring at Edward with an odd speculative expression. His eyes narrowed like he was trying to do a difficult math problem in his head. 
I felt Edward cringe. I glanced up at him and his face was contorted. For once, Jacob uses the power of his mind, not his muscles, to trigger Edward the telepath. Very based behavior. Overprotective, isn't he? Jacob said, talking just to me. A little trouble makes life fun. Let me guess, you're not allowed to have fun, are you? He's not wrong though, is he? Jacob decides that he does want to be friends with Bella again. And this is incredibly high school. Then again, they are in high school. So why am I complaining? Jacob's suffering had always triggered my protective side. It was not entirely rational. Jacob was hardly in need of any physical protection I could offer, but my arms pinned beneath Edwards yearned to reach out to him, to wrap around his big warm waist in a silent promise of acceptance and comfort. Edward's shielding arms had become restraints. Hmm. Edward released me, taking just my hand and pulling me behind his body again. All these supernatural beings treat her like a rag doll. The principal comes to break things up so Jacob leaves. Edward and Bella go to class, they pass notes. Victoria has come back but got chased away by the vampires and the werewolves got involved. That's it. Chapter four, nature. I was having a bad week. To be fair to Bella, it's bad enough hand to read this. It must be even worse to be in it. Bella wants to use Victoria sniffing around as an excuse to become a vampire early. Jasper had silently erased all the panic and tension in my body with his curious talent of controlling emotional atmospheres. I'd felt reassured and let them talk me out of my desperate pleading. Of course, that calm had worn off as soon as Edward and I had walked out of the room. Whole family of control freaks, mate. Anyway, Bella is frustrated that Edward won't change her into a vampire personally because his conditions are that they get married first. I don't really know why she's so against marriage. I say this as someone Someone who doesn't see the entire point in it either besides like some tax breaks and certain rights if your partner is in the hospital right beyond that my don't want to spend money on other people enjoying something Pfft. Yeah, right. Regardless of my personal beliefs, Bella is already making a commitment of eternity to Edward. So Really, what is a party to celebrate that? I don't understand. I don't understand why it's such a big deal for her. She doesn't want to look like a teenage bride. Maybe that's it. But why does she care? She's not going to know these people as soon as she turns into a vampire anyway. It's just forced conflict, but I don't believe it's consistent with her decision-making. Edward goes hunting for big prey. I would never admit to him how hard it was for me when he was gone, how it brought back the abandonment nightmares. Codependent mess, see my last video. I think he saw through me though, a little. This morning there had been a note left on my pillow. I'll be back so soon you won't have time to miss me. Look after my heart. I've left it with you. Quick, drive a stake through it. Alice stays behind. I'm staying close to home to hunt. I'll only be 15 minutes away if you need me. I'll keep an eye out for trouble. Translation, don't try anything funny just because Edward is gone. Alice was certainly just as capable of crippling my truck as Edward was. The way that Bella is so normalized to this abnormal and terrible abusive behavior. Love it, love to see it. Not wanting to be ridiculously early for work, I ate my breakfast slowly one Cheerio at a time. Then when I'd washed the dishes, I arranged the magnets on the fridge into a perfect line. Maybe I was developing obsessive compulsive disorder. I've had enough. There's two whole paragraphs about her trying to push two magnets together. It's a clumsy metaphor for Jacob and Edward coexisting. Bella goes to work, but they don't need her. And then she sees a flyer saying, save the Olympic wolf with a wolf on the front. And she gets emotional and quickly dries to the push. Jacob and Bella reunite happily until they talk about Edward. Give it a rest. These books shouldn't be called Twilight, No Moon, Eclipse, Break and Dawn. They should be called Edward, one, two, three, and four. It's all Bella ever thinks of. He struggled for the words. He took a deep breath and tried again. What I'm asking is, Everything is just back to the way it was before he left. You forgave him for all of that. I took a deep breath. There was nothing to forgive. He lied to you and ditched you in a woods and didn't check on you. You could have died, you moron. Jacob wants to know what happened when Bella ran off to save Edward. I rolled my eyes as I sat next to him. There's some action I allowed. It wouldn't be real horror of that action. Horror, I scoffed. Can you listen? Or will you be interrupting me with rude comments about my friends? Bro, you literally witnessed an entire tourist group getting eaten by Italian vampires. Your life is a horror show, all right? Bella tells Jacob some of what happened. In return, Jacob tells Bella what happened on the previous weekend. Emmett. Yeah, him. He made a lunge for her, but that redhead is fast. He flew right behind her and almost rammed into Paul. So Paul, well, you know Paul. Yeah, lost his focus. Can't say that I blame him. The big blood sucker was right on top of him. Why wouldn't you just see that as like an honest mistake and then get back on track to getting the vampire who actually is going around eating people? These people are pathetic. Like, what is the point 
of these people all being like a hundred years old when they have the emotional, no, well, the wolves don't. Well, the vampires themselves, they have like the emotional maturity of 12 year olds, right? And the wolves, they've got all these powers, but they're all teenagers. So they're gonna have emotional reactions and be a bit like ridiculous. Stupid, so stupid. Maybe we should normalize having more fictional fantasy books that aren't revolving around teenagers with less fully formed, rational and emotional responses to things. What a wild idea. I swear most of these problems could just be solved if the characters within went through puberty fully. He sprang, hey, don't give me that look. The vampire was on our land. I tried to compose my face so he would go on. My nails were digging into my palms with the stress of the story, even though I knew it had turned out fine. She is such an oversensitive baby. She wouldn't last a second reading, take a break, that's life or chat. I'm thinking about what you told me, about when the fortune teller saw you cliff jumping and thought you'd committed suicide and how it all got out of control. Do you realize that if you just waited for me like you were supposed to, then the blood Alice wouldn't have been able to see you jump? Nothing would have changed. We'd probably be in my garage right now like any other Saturday. There wouldn't be any vampires and forks and you and me, he trailed off deep in thought. It was disconcerting the way he said this, like it would be a good thing to have no vampires in forks. It probably would be a good thing for forks not to have vampires in it who constantly attract trouble from other vampires. Yes. You know, whilst Bella was moping around in New Moon, she hung out with the wolf pack for days on end because she, uh, her survival depended on their protection, but she did become friends with all of them, I'd say. Like they wouldn't bother protecting her if they didn't like her, right? But she ditched all of them because Edward came back. Bella is lousy, is my point. Like they busted their wolfy asses protecting her. And she's just like, see you later mates. Jacob wonders whether Bella is with Edward for his looks or his money. We absolutely do know that it is his looks. It cannot be his winning personality. All she goes on about is how hot his cold marble six pack is. I love him, not because he's beautiful or because he's rich. I doubt that she would have even looked at him if he wasn't beautiful. I spat the word at Jacob. I'd much rather he weren't either one. It would even out the gap between us just a little bit because he'd still be the most loving and unselfish and brilliant and decent person I'd ever met. Of course I love him. How hard is that to understand? It's impossible to understand. Jacob is right yet again. I think the best place to start would be to look within your own species. That usually works. Bro, you literally turn into a giant dog. I mean, come on, mate. He frowned more deeply. They shouldn't exist. Their existence goes against nature. If something goes against nature, then it just doesn't exist. It's why you can't see people running at the speed of light. Whenever people bring that up in real life, like, you know, this way, this way that this person lives is unnatural. That's unnatural. It's unnatural to do X, Y, Z. If it was unnatural, it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't exist. That's the line of reasoning I got from Yuval Noah Harari's book, Sapiens. He uses that exact argument and I was like, oh, that's good. I'm gonna memorize that and steal that. Cause it's true, isn't it? What have they gone about stuff being not natural? If it's not natural, it wouldn't exist, so. Live and let live, shut up. Shut up haters, stop flaming me. The vampires are just extreme super predators, the best of the best. And that sounds a lot like nature to me. Nature is hardcore, nature is metal, nature is ruthless out there. Jacob starts whinging that he's still human too. Mm. Humans are boring. No offense, everyone watching this. You, psh, pff, who cares? It's a lot cooler to be a shape-shifting giant dog who doesn't age and can heal really quickly. What is this incessant, oh, whatever, forced drama? Jacob was in pain. Right now it was clear and I'm in pain. It's kind of a mixture of looking like slightly constipated and stoned. Right now it was very clear in his eyes. It's clear in my eyes. I didn't know how to help him, but I knew I had to try. It was more than that I owed him. It was because his pain hurt me too. Jacob had become a part of me and there was no changing that now. Jacob's pain is really painful for me. I understand what people mean when they write things like this. You know, my nearest and dearest, if, if they're in emotional distress, then that's distressing too, because you, for me, because I love them and I care for them and I want them to have the best lives possible. I understand, right? But when like people who are this self-centered in books write like this, like, like Zoe Redbird, or Bella Swan. Mm. Is Bella that self-centered? She's Edward centric, if anything. But when it's written like this, it just reminds me of like, you know, you know when you know when certain girls will cry and then like their certain girl mates will be like, oh my god, babes, don't, because when you start crying, I just start crying, I'm just gonna get a floods right now. Oh my god. It's like, but you don't know what she's crying about. 
It's not about you for a second day. It's about them. So try to not like, you know, draw attention to yourself when like it's your friend who's upset, you know, because I've never really got that. Maybe I'm just sociopathic and unempathetic, but I just don't, I don't cry because I see someone else crying. I, I would rather put my attention and focus on sorting out their problem. I'm just like, you know, so emotionally developed and great like that. My emotional IQ is so high. I don't think it is. I don't know, mates. Tell me in the comment section below. Am I just cold blooded? like a reptilian. Chapter five, imprint. Oh, this is gonna be a good chapter. Oh, the title alone, make it stop. Please, Jake, that really bugs me. What does? That you two are so ready to kill each other, I complained. It makes me crazy. Why can't you both just be civilized? I feel like she's being way too reasonable about this. If your boyfriend and your supposed best mate want to genuinely murder each other over you, Maybe it's just time to pack your suitcases and run away in the middle of the night and not tell anyone. Jacob tells Sam's story. He is the leader of the pack. Sam was the first person to phase into a werewolf and have no one to talk to about it. Sam and someone called Leah Clearwater used to date. This is Harry Clearwater, RIP mate, daughter. He was so close, I could feel his warm breath. I reached up casually to take his hand away and free my face, but wound my fingers through his so that I wouldn't hurt his feelings. Stop! It's gonna end up hurting his feelings more when you're ultimately like proper reject him by the end of the book. The elders of La Push ended up telling Sam what was happening. Jacob says he stopped aging, so Bella has a shit fit over it. Am I the only... I'm not shrieking that. Am I the only one who has to get old? I get older every stinking day. I nearly shrieked, throwing my hands in the air. Some little part of me recognized that I was throwing a Charlie-esque fit, but that rational part was greatly overshadowed by the irrational part. Damn it, what kind of world is this? Where's the justice? Yeah, welcome to the real world. If you're that upset by it, just get some Botox. Look at me, Bells. Do I look 16? I glanced up and down his mammoth frame, trying to be unbiased. Not exactly, I guess. Not at all, because we reach full growth inside of a few months when the werewolf gene gets triggered. It's one hell of a growth spurt. He made a face. Physically, I'm probably 25 or something. So there's no need for you to freak out about being too old for me for at least another seven years. Makes it even worse then that a 25 year old ends up imprinting on a newborn baby. Oops, wrong book, we'll get there. Back to Sam's story. Sam can't tell Leah he's a wolf boy and then Leah's cousin, Emily visits. Oh dear. Sam ends up imprinting on Emily. Jacob's eyes strayed to the ocean. Sam did love Leah, but when he saw Emily, that didn't matter anymore. That's not fair, is it? It's really not. Sometimes we don't exactly know why. We find our mates that way. His eyes flash back to me, his face reddening. I mean, our soulmates. What way? Love at first sight? I snickered. Jacob wasn't smiling. His dark eyes were critical of my reaction. It's a little bit more powerful than that. More absolute. Where's the free will? Where is it? How did Emily deal with this? If she was so close to Leah, Sam and Emily were utterly right together. Two puzzle pieces shaped for each other exactly. The predeterminism. Shut up. Still, how had Emily gotten past the fact that he'd belonged to someone else? Her sister almost. I was gonna say, oh, wouldn't that be weird knowing that your cousin, who's kind of like your sister, had like had been, you know, with your current partner. But this is Twilight, they're probably only just Frenched. She was real angry in the beginning, but it's hard to resist that level of commitment and adoration, Jacob sighed. And then Sam could tell her everything. There are no rules that bind you when you find your other half. You know how she got hurt? So basically, Sam groomed her until she conceded. How romantic. Yeah, Leah got the worst end of the stick, he agreed. She puts on a brave face. She's going to be a bridesmaid. That sounds torturous. But hold up. So Sam has this weird wolfy quirk, Gene, where he imprints whatever. He kind of, he kind of can't help it, I suppose. Let's be that gracious. Emily has no such vital urge. She doesn't have werewolf gene. She doesn't have something compelling her to absolutely like do this and try and be with this person. What the hell is her excuse? If she had any respect for her cousin, she would have blocked Sam immediately. Not just like giving in because he was always just there giving her flowers and saying nice things and being so absolute in his commitment to her. She should have seen, still been like, what the hell, go away. This is gonna cause my cousin, who is like my sister, so much pain and maybe it's not worth it. Whatever. Bella remembers Jacob freaking Edward out and asks him how. Not for tips, unfortunately. Jacob laughed with a harder edge this time. I was remembering the way you looked that night when Sam found you. I've seen it in his head and it's like I was there. That memory has always haunted Sam, you know. 
And then I remembered how you looked the first time you came to my place. I bet you don't even realize what a mess you were then, Bella. It was weeks before you started to look human again. And I remembered how you used to always have your arms wrapped around yourself, trying to hold yourself together. Jacob winced, then shook his head. It was hard for me to remember how sad you were and it wasn't my fault. So I figured it would be harder for him. And I thought he ought to get a look at what he'd done. The way that he weaponized her depression when it suited him to hurt his kind of like, in his eyes, love rival. And he's being smug and laughing about it. This is not a good friend. It's not a good bestie. It's just not a, like, it's not a very cash money move. Oh, get a grip, Bella. But then he sort of absolves himself by being based and telling her to get a grip. I wish I could. If you can't be nice, I won't come back at all. I threaten, trying to pull my hand free. He refused to let go and then he ruins it again. All these men need prison. See, I explained, I don't care who's a vampire and who's a werewolf. That's irrelevant. You are Jacob, he is Edward, I am Bella, and nothing else matters. His eyes narrowed slightly. But I am a werewolf, he said unwillingly. And he is a vampire, he said with obvious revulsion. And I'm a Virgo, I shouted exasperated. Bella promises to see Jacob after all of that. Like they meet up and just start arguing but he's still, whatever. Chapter six, Switzerland. It came out of nowhere. One minute there was nothing but bright highway in my rear view mirror. The next minute the sun was glinting off of a silver Volvo right on my tail. He is actually a nightmare. Just put out your hand, put out your hand like a normal person. You can be like a real New Yorker. How did this happen to me? Where am I? This is a scene you would get in a horror film, like, like Christine or something, just this car coming to mow you down. Bella is too anxious to pull over and speak to him, so she drives to Angela Weber's house instead. He follows her all the way to Angela's to make sure she actually goes and doesn't drive off somewhere else. This is abusive. What's Edward doing tonight? She asked after a few minutes. My pen dug into the envelope I was working on. She has such weird overreactions to his name. The stress cannot be good for her. Bella gives Angela a humanified version of her Edward Jacob problems. Nothing is resolved or concluded. It's a waste of a page. Bella goes home. Edward is hiding in her room waiting for her. Oh my God. Edward is the hiding in my room. The incel arc all makes sense now. Edward keeps trying to forbid Bella from seeing the werewolves, like he's her granddad or something. But then Edward just drops the whole issue entirely when Bella calls herself Switzerland. Edward needs to hunt again, so Bella plans to hang out with Jacob with Edward's knowledge, but Alice literally kidnaps her. Like actually kidnaps her. I'm sorry, did Stephanie Mayer think this was cute to write? Because it's really weird. Edward trying to control her behavior, failing, so getting his family to join in, his family of supernatural beings. You're kidnapping me, aren't you? She laughed and nodded, till Saturday. Esme cleared it with Charlie. You're staying with me for two nights and I'll drive you to and from school tomorrow just to make sure she doesn't sneak off to like see one of her friends. This isn't cute. Edward bribed Alice with a new Porsche for her to do this. It's good to see that someone's ethics goes completely out the window just because she, they get a new car, great. Pretty over the top, I grumbled, incredulous. He gave you that just for two days of holding me hostage? Alice made a face. A second later, comprehension came and I gasped in horror. It's for every time he's gone, isn't it? She nodded. I slammed my door and stomped towards the house. She danced along next to me, still unrepentant. These vampires are insane. They have just no respect for Bella's wishes or autonomy or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a little bittersweet, isn't it? Um, for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alice, don't you think this is just a little bit controlling? Just a tiny bit psychotic, maybe? Also the size of Edwards. Not really, she sniffed. You don't seem to grasp how dangerous a young werewolf can be, especially when I can't see them. Edward has no way to know if you're safe. You shouldn't be so reckless. Your own eternal life partner tried to murder Bella, Alice. You don't get to be all high and mighty about some werewolves. I hate these vampires, they're so elitist. It wasn't so bad, except for the fact that I was being held against my will. Maya, this isn't cute or quirky. This is an offense. Can I go back to my place to get my things at least? She grinned, already taken care of. Am I allowed to use your phone? Charlie knows where you are. Trying to withhold contact from the outside world for abusive control freaks. It's hurting my head. I can't deal with this. Alice lets Bella ring Jacob so that she can cancel her plans. Sorry, but the fact that it, it says like, let Bella, an 18 year old, call someone is a ridiculous sentence. It sounds like something you would hear in a kidnapping court case. Don't be, they're just trying to keep me safe. He growled again. I know it's silly, but their hearts are in the right place. Their hearts, he scoffed. Sorry about Saturday, I apologized. I've got to hit the sack, the couch I corrected mentally, but I'll call you again soon. 
Are you sure they'll let you? He asked her escaping tone. Not completely, I sighed. Night, Jake. She's such a simp for the Cullens, it is sickening. I bet she would get over it in five minutes if the Cullens did end up killing Jacob and his pack. Bella gets ready for bed, but Rosalie comes in to talk to her. Chapter seven, unhappy ending. Rosalie hesitated in the doorway, her breathtaking face unsure. <sighs> Just make out already. Um... Rosalie is being soft with Bella for once. She wants Bella to stay human. Did Edward ever tell you what led to this? She asked, gesturing to her glorious immortal body. Get a room already. She looked up at me and smiled. It was a harsh, bitter, but still stunning expression. Stop, stop. Rosalie tells Bella her story. She was 18 in 1933 and very beautiful, born to middle-class parents. They weren't satisfied, but I was. I was thrilled to be me, to be Rosalie Hale. Pleased that men's eyes watched me everywhere I went from the year I turned 12. From the year I turned 12, I'm gonna call the police. It was hard for me to imagine the world that Rosalie had known. Her story sounded more like a fairy tale than history to me. With a slight shock, I realized that this was very close to the world that Edward would have experienced when he was human, the world he had grown up in. Yeah, congratulations for realizing this. Your boyfriend is literally from another time and place. Rosalie gets some Tory for a fiance. He and his friends end up assaulting her in the street and leaving her for dead. Carlisle ends up finding her and takes her to make her into a vampire entirely with her, without her consent. We know that he did this later on with the intention of her maybe being Edward's mate because he thinks that Edward is lonely. So that's kind of weird, turning someone into an immortal being without their consent so that maybe you can shack them up with your already immortal son. That's weird, okay. These books are so disrespectful to women. I couldn't just let her die, Carlisle said quietly. It was too much. Too horrible, too much waste. The Cullens love taking away consent from women. It must run in the family. Rosalie gets her revenge by killing the blokes, but doesn't ever drink any blood. I was overly theatrical. It was kind of childish, really. I wore a wedding dress I'd stolen for the occasion. He screamed when he saw me. Iconic. She broke off suddenly and she glanced down at me. I'm sorry, she said in a chagrined voice. I'm frightening you, aren't I? I'm fine, I lied. Bella is such a wimp. Rosalie asks if Edward ever told Bella why she's been so abrasive of her. And it's because Rosalie was jealous that Edward wanted Bella and not her. Of course, of course that Rosalie was jealous of Bella. Sure, Maya, I believe you. Rosalie is just used to every man ever finding her attractive. So Edward not like, you know, like can see her as beautiful, but being attracted to someone and seeing someone as beautiful are two entirely separate things, right? I don't care about this. I really don't care about this. I don't care. Not that you aren't pretty, Bella, she said, misreading my expression, but it just meant that he found you more attractive than me. I'm vain enough that I minded. But you said at first, that doesn't still bother you, does it? I mean, we both know you're the most beautiful person on the planet. She simps for Rosalie just for Rosalie to admit that she doesn't like Bella. Love that. Don't you see, Bella? Her voice was suddenly more passionate than before, even when she told her unhappy story. You already have everything. You have a whole life ahead of you, everything I want, and you're just going to throw it away. Can't you see that I'd trade everything I have to be you? You have the choice that I didn't have and you're choosing wrong. Rosalie just went from girl boss to gatekeep in one second. It is Bella's boring life, let her do what she wants. There's no right or wrong here. I got half, she grinned. You know that I saved Emmett from a bear that was mauling him and carried him home to Carlisle, but can you guess why I stopped the bear from eating him? I shook my head. With the dark curls, the dimples that showed even when he was grimacing in pain, the strange innocence that seemed out of place on a grown man's face, he reminded me of Vera's little Henry. I didn't want him to die, so much that, even though I hated this life, I was selfish enough to ask Carlisle to change him for me. Absolutely no one in these books are normal. Emmett, a grown man reminded me of my old best friend's baby, so I saved him from dying so we could fall in love and shag. What a load of nonsense. And oddly enough, he needs me too. That part worked out better than I could have hoped, but there will never be more than the two of us, and I'll never sit on a porch somewhere with him grey-haired by my side, surrounded by our grandchildren. There is nothing stopping her from being altruistic and adopting a bunch of orphans, letting them know they're like they're vampires whatever and then giving them the choice of vampirism when they turn 18 or 21 or whatever but no she's probably the type of person that thinks they don't actually count as your kids unless they're genetic trout i'll let you sleep now rosalie's eyes flickered to the bed and her lips twitched i know you're frustrated that he's keeping you locked up like this but don't give him too bad a time when he gets back he loves you more than you know it terrifies him to be away from you bro he actually had alice genuinely kidnap her alice is a vampire bella cannot leave run away nothing alice is too strong and too fast 
The women in these books are all terrible. They all just excuse the awful behavior of men constantly. I hate it. Bella goes to school and sulks all day until Jacob turns up to rescue her. And I'm actually glad for her that he's there because what the Cullens are doing on Edward's behalf is wrong. Bella and Jacob escape to La Push. He laughed triumphantly. What do you want to do today? Anything, I laughed back. It felt great to be free. It is impossible to ignore how much more carefree she feels around Jacob over Edward. Chapter eight, temper. No, I was certain about that. They're going to be furious with me tonight though. He picked up a rock and chucked it into the waves. Don't go back then, he suggested again. Charlie would love that, I said sarcastically. I bet he wouldn't mind. I didn't answer. Jacob was probably right and that made me grind my teeth together. Charlie's blatant preference for my quilliot friends was so unfair. Let's see. One side is a group that Charlie has known, I'm assuming his whole life if they stayed in forks like his whole life. And his best friend is a part of said group. The other side is a family who Bella keeps mysteriously either disappearing or getting hurt around. And they assisted her in running all the way to Italy to help their stupid son. Not that Charlie knows it was Italy, but still cross country for Charlie. No wonder Charlie is team werewolf. Quill, one of Jacob's friends, has imprinted. So that makes three of the wolves now imprinting. Why? They all need to get spayed. Jacob starts walking again. Without seeming to think about it, he reached out and took my hand. We paced silently across the rocks. Something I haven't bothered to note yet because it happens so frequently. Despite Bella knowing Jacob has feelings for her and despite Bella having a partner, they are always holding hands and cuddling or whatnot. Now, you can't physically stop people from going places and doing things, but Edward would be okay in being jealous that his girlfriend acts like this with another gazer. I'm going to hate this next bit. Quill, a teenager, imprinted on Emily's niece, Claire, who is two years old. Do you know what the worst part of this imprinting nonsense is? Do you know what the worst part? There was no reason for Stephanie Mayer to write this. She didn't need to. She didn't need to include it, but she did so anyway. And through her constant justifications through the mouth of, you know, Jacob and the werewolves, she clearly doesn't see an issue with it. But she's a baby, I protested. He looked at me with dark amusement. Quill's not getting any older. He reminded me a bit of acid in his tone. He'll just have to be patient for a few decades. Yeah, that is called grooming, mate. You're making judgments, he accused. I can see it on your face. Sorry, I muttered, but it sounds really creepy. It sounds illegal. It's not like that. You've got it all wrong. Jake defended his friend, suddenly vehement. I've seen what it's like through his eyes. There's nothing romantic about it at all. Not for Quill. Not now. Yeah, not yet. Groom him. He took a deep breath, frustrated. It's so hard to describe. It's not like love at first sight, really. It's more like gravity moves. Just imagine a human doing this, it wouldn't make it okay. It's like gravity moves. When you see her, suddenly it's not the earth holding you here anymore. She does, and nothing matters more than her. And you would do anything for her, be anything for her. You become whatever she needs you to be, whether that's a protector or a lover or a friend or a brother. This is a fancy way of saying, or a pedophile. I find Stephanie Mayer's ideal of true love to be inherently problematic. Nothing matters more than her. Nothing else matters. Nothing else is holding you here. This, this, it's just so like obsessively black and white. I don't know. I feel like real, real love is a bit more balanced than this, a bit less extreme, a bit healthier. Quill would be the best, kindest big brother any kid ever had. There isn't a toddler on the planet that will be more carefully looked after than that little girl will be. And then when she's older and need a friend, needs a friend, he'll be more understanding, trustworthy and reliable than anyone else she knows. And then when she's grown up, they'll be as happy as Emily and Sam. A strange bitter edge sharpened his tone at the very end when he spoke of Sam. Doesn't Claire get a choice here? Of course, but why wouldn't she choose him in the end? He'll be her perfect match, like he was designed for her alone. Yeah, this is just called grooming. Get close to them as a kid. Be their confidant. Wait until it's legal to bang. Grooming. Unethical. Disgusting. Jacob is all, you're the only person I think of, Bella, and she's all, oh, okay. I'll continue to hang out with you then. They ride their motorcycles and then hang out at Jacob's. His fingers brush my hand. Things really have changed. Give her a rest for five minutes, mate, please. She's got a boyfriend. She's not interested in you in that way. Stop it. Bella admits to Jacob that she intends on turning into a vampire, but that they, they will leave Forks. His eyes flashed open, their black depths full of anger and pain. There wasn't a geographic limit to the treaty, Bella. Our great grandfathers only agreed to keep the peace because the Cullens swore that they were different, that humans weren't in danger from them. They promised that they would never kill or change anyone ever again. If they go back on their word, the treaty is meaningless and they are no different than any other vampires. Once that's established, when we find them again, so despite supposedly being in love with this girl, he would help track her and the Cullens down and implied an implication, assist in killing her slash them because of some treaty. No one in this book is normal. You won't be Bella anymore, he told me. My friend won't exist. There'll be no one to forgive. <sighs> 
Bella says she's going to turn in a few weeks and Jacob starts freaking out and almost turns into a werewolf. Way to prove the Cullens right, you asshole. By the way, even if the Cullens are right about the wolves, it still does not give them the right to control Bella, restrict her movements and control her autonomy. Jake is all, I'd rather you die than live forever as a vampire. So Bella runs back to the Cullens with her tail between her legs. Bella falls asleep and wakes up to a nightmare. Edward is back and they kiss and then they touch. He paused there his hand curling around my calf. He pulled my leg up suddenly, hitching it around his hip. I stopped breathing. This wasn't the kind of thing he usually allowed, all of his careful rules. Maybe there was more significance to this bed than I'd originally guessed. My heart pounded almost painfully as I waited for his answer. Edward sighed, rolling back so that we were on our sides again. Don't be ridiculous, Bella. He said, disapproval strong in his voice. I love the way that he is the one who is in complete control of her sexuality and desires and then also patronizes her for having sexual desires. There's a fly buzzing around in my light. He apologizes for having Alice control Bella's life. Apology isn't accepted with me, bucko. Up yours, woke moralists. We'll see who cancels who. I don't know why I wrote that. That's been living rent free in my head for a few days. Edward has magically changed his mind overnight and decided to become more tolerant of the werewolves and trust Bella's judgment. I don't know why. He said he'd rather see me dead. My voice broke on the last word. Edward was too still for a moment, controlling whatever reaction he didn't want me to see. Go back outside, the window's open, shoo. Then he crushed me gently to his chest. I'm so sorry. I thought you'd be glad, I whispered. Glad over something that's hurt you? He murmured into my hair. I don't think so, Bella. This is just classic love bombing. He sighed. I could quite literally kill him for saying that to you. I want to. Everyone in these books needs to calm down with their roid rage, it's not that deep. Bella has a tantrum about some vampire fancying Edward, even though Edward didn't fancy the vampire back and this was like decades ago, whatever. Bella goes to sleep, so will I. <sighs> not to be melodramatic, but I am totally like dying already. It is like half 12 at night and already that light is killing me. I don't know about you, but I love it when there's a heat wave and it's 39 degrees in this country and don't anyone dare comment in my country, it's this degree. Yeah, England ain't suited for extreme weathers. We ain't, we don't have air conditioning. We don't have air conditioning. And I have a fan, but I've turned it off so it doesn't disrupt this lovely audio because I'm that considerate, even though I'm melting and it's half 12 at night. Why is it, why is it this? Bloody, stuffy, and hot. Oh, and I can't even have the door open because what's it called? One of the plagues of Egypt will come in, all the flies that came in last time. Why is it 26 degrees at night? God, you know what? I'm gonna get for as much as I can without melting into a little itty bitty puddle. Chapter nine, target. Bella goes home. There is a message from Jacob. Jacob called, oh, a fantastic message. Charlie had written. He said he didn't mean it and that he's sorry. He wants you to call him. Be nice and give him a break. He sounded upset. Oh, this is really cute because at this point in the script, I said, I'm beginning to despise Charlie too. That's real cute because it turns into a full on I hate Charlie fan club like 20 pages later. The way everyone in these books constantly tells Bella what to do. She's no better though, because she lets everyone talk down to her this way. She just accepts it, but still. Charlie doesn't know why Bella and Jacob fought, but he does know that a fight happened. And if Jake is the one apologizing, then clearly Jake is the provoker, right? And yet Charlie doesn't have his own daughter's back and is telling her to be nice to a stupid boy, hate. Aren't you going to call Jacob? Oh, give it a rest. Charlie asked. He was leaning around the living room wall, watching me pick up. Pick up what, drugs? No, I started up the stairs. That's not very attractive behavior, Bella, he said. Forgiveness is divine. And it's also not attractive being a major control freak. Oh my God, that is the theme of this book, being controlling psychos. Is that my title? Eclipse, a controlling mess. Hmm. We'll see. Bella goes to do the housework like a good housewoman, but notices that her pillow and sweatshirt are missing. She looks for them, but she can't find them. Clearly a vampire has been in to sniff around and steal her stuff, but Bella is so oblivious sometimes that it's not in keeping with her character of being so perceptive. Remember, after all, she is the one who noticed that the Cullens weren't entirely human. Edward arrives and immediately notices that a vampire has been in the house. What are you two hissing about in here? Charlie asks suspiciously, rounding the corner with an empty popcorn bowl in his hands. I felt green. A vampire had been in the house looking for me while Charlie slept. Panic overwhelmed me, closed my throat. I couldn't answer. I just stared at him in horror. 
Charlie's expression changed. Abruptly, he was grinning. If you two are having a fight, well, don't let me interrupt. I completely understand him disliking Edward because any good parent should dislike Edward after all the danger he gets better into. Even if Charlie is oblivious to vampires existing, sure is a coincidence that Bella is falling out of hotel window. No, didn't she fall down the stairs? Did she fall down the stairs and out of window? Because that's ridiculous. Or she just fall down the stairs, don't make that up. Regardless, falling around hotels doing something and running away like across the country and all the other various scrapes she gets into around Edward. It's suspicious. He has every right to dislike her. But being gleeful at the thought of your daughter having an argument with her significant other, i.e. getting stressed out, hurt feelings, upset, whatever, is really, really, really weird behavior. It's very spiteful towards someone you supposedly love. I let him drag me along then, too panicked to think clearly. Charlie met my frightened eyes with a smug grin, which suddenly turned to confusion. Why has Charlie turned into a horrible parent in this book? Eclipse is like the character assassination of both Jacob and Charlie, maybe that should be the title. They go to meet the Cullens. Edward is angry at Alice for not having a vision about this as if she can control her vision. So apparently she can keep like certain notice on, but I thought her visions were kind of uncontrollable. It's a bit convenient. But regardless, she's not omni something. Alice's voice was cold when she answered. You've already got me watching the Volturi's decisions, watching for Victoria's return, watching Bella's every step. You want to add another? Do I just have to watch Charlie or Bella's room or the house or the whole street too? Edward, if I try to do too much, things are going to start slipping through the cracks. So it seems that she can control the visions, but I always thought that they seemed a bit involuntary. When it happens, maybe I've forgotten. Don't know. Edward apologizes for throwing a tantrum and they all start theorizing on what's going on. That's bad luck, Edward muttered. If he'd gone west, well, it would be nice for those dogs to make themselves useful. I winced and Esme rubbed my shoulder. Bella is such a passive baby, literally get a grip. I was slowly realizing, the, the amount of times, <sighs> I'm fresh off the back of writing the script for most of this. The amount of times that she just winces or recoils or whatever at nothing, nothing. And she wants to be a vampire. I was slowly realizing that vampires were much bigger participants in this world than I'd once thought. How many times did the average human cross paths with them completely unaware? How many deaths obliviously reported as crimes and accidents were really due to their first? How has no one else realized this yet? If bodies are just turning up completely bled out every single month, I'm assuming they would be bled out. How does the FBI not know? Or the GCHQ or any authority in England? We've got like so much CCT... Couldn't happen. Couldn't happen in today's society. Bella argues that she should change into a vampire right this second. Think of Charlie, Carlisle reminded me. Think of how it would hurt him if you disappeared. I don't even know if it actually would hurt him at this point, he'd probably be glad. They refused to make her a vampire and instead give her round the clock security. Charlie was in a good mood when we got back. He could see the tension between me and Edward and he was misinterpreting it. He watched me throw together his dinner with a smug smile on his face. Why are you smug at the thought of your daughter being upset, you dickhead? Jacob called again, Charlie said as soon as Edward was in the room. I kept my face empty as I set the plate in front of him. Is that a fact? Charlie frowned. Don't be petty, Bella. He sounded really low. Is Jacob paying you for the PR or are you a volunteer? Screw it. Turn into a vampire and block Charlie from your life. And Jacob too. Charlie hates Edward so much that I preemptively don't believe his convenient change of heart towards Edward at the end of the book. I remember when I read, when I read this as a teenager, like so many things jumped out. I like, I hated it. I, have, I hated every minute of it, but I just had to read it for some reason. And when he does, we'll get there. But when he does just change his mind and he's like, oh, Edward's a good guy, actually. It's so unbelievable. Bella wants to call Jacob because she is a simp. If I was in these books, I would have literally cut every single person off in forks by now, like a true alpha. It is the next day. Bella calls Jacob, she gives in. Bella, he exclaimed. Oh, Bella, I'm so sorry. He tripped over the words as he hurried to get them out. I swear I didn't mean it. I was just being stupid. I was angry, but that's no excuse. It was the stupidest thing I've ever said in my life and I'm sorry. Don't be mad at me, please. Please. Lifetime of servitude up for grabs. All you have to do is forgive me. That's some nice words. Shame he's going to assault her later on. She forgives him. Then Edward wants to speak to Jacob about the vampire situation and they come to some sort of truce. A truce, I think. Hey, do me a favor, Jacob suggested. Try to convince your bloodsucker that the safest place for you to be, especially when he leaves, is in La Push. The way that Jacob didn't believe any of the Quilliot legends and then he became a werewolf and then he immediately started using terms like bloodsucker and leeches and whatnot is just tribalism at its finest. Identity politics, Marxism, 
Jordan Peterism up yours walk Marilis we'll see who cancels who went free absolutely went free Jacob and Bella plot for Bella and Charlie to spend as much time in Lepush as possible to be protected from the errant vampire Jacob plans to track the vampire chapter 10 sent flying through this Jacob is coming over so Edward rubs his face all over Bella that is a sentence that I had to write for this you're welcome. Bella is doing the dishes. I am so sick of this good housewife 101 bullshit. I don't need this in-depth realism. If I wanted to know about someone, someone's blow by blow account of doing the laundry, doing the dishes, whatever, I would do my own bloody dishes. But as you can see, I don't want that. Thank you. Jacob is only wearing jeans because his clothes get ruined every time he phases. So he has to attach his jeans with some sort of string to his leg, what stupid imagery. He grinned. Does my being half naked bother you? Yes. Jacob smells Bella's room and then they do the dishes together. Jacob wants to know what it's like for Bella being with Edward. He wrinkled his nose again. Well, I was wondering, do you, you know, kiss him? Sorry, is he five? Jacob accidentally cuts himself with a knife, but he heals immediately. This reveal goes on for about two pages. That's why these books are so long, yet hardly anything interesting ever happens. Maya longs everything out. You could cut these books in half and still have the same story. Bella almost faints at the sight and smell of blood. How is she gonna deal with being a vampire then? How is she gonna be a good vampire? What a terrible career path for her to go down. There's a description of her bleaching the blood. Again, I would do my own chores if I wanted to read about this whatever there is genuinely it like maya you don't need to write every single action down i don't need to know that bella pours a cup full of bleach into her washing machine yes she actually did write that she does it it's infuriating jacob gives bella a hug but then stops because she stinks of edward's vampire scent clever really seeing as jacob hugs her far more frequently than is appropriate for people in their specific situation i.e he's in love with her and she just puts up with it. Jacob is having a bonfire party and wants Bella to come. He made a noise in the back of his throat. Is he your warden now too? You know, I saw this story on the news last week about controlling abusive teenage relationships and how can Maya write something like that and then not realize the story that she is telling us? Is she this oblivious or has this all been one really big money-making private joke? I don't I would love to get inside her mind. I don't get it. Ugh, not to be totally rude or anything, but I can imagine that E.L. James is just a donut, a wet lettuce, a lampshade. I don't know. Whatever. Put your British adjective in it. But Stephanie Mayer has these moments of self-awareness. I just want to know what's it all about. Dartmouth accepted Bella. Get real. Even with a bribe, still get real. I took a deep breath and counted slowly to 10. That's very generous of them, I finally said. However, accepted or not, there is still the minor matter of tuition. I can't afford it and I'm not letting you throw away enough money to buy yourself another sports car just so that I can pretend to go to Dartmouth next year. They are literally 0.0001 percenters. I'm assuming they are rich unfairly, i.e. using Alice to predict the stock market or whatever, because even with Carlisle being a really good doctor, do doctors make millions a year in America? I don't know, but they do use Alice to... Why is my body hurt? <laughs> We know that they use Alice to predict the stock market to get rich, right? And Edward just throws his money around. But when do we ever see Edward use any of his good fortune to give back to people? Never. He just bribes his way into doing whatever he wants and buys sports cars. At least Carlisle is a doctor and probably the best doctor in the world. Edward benefits from Alice's visions financially. He's not in this position through his own hard work. The least he could do is a bit of charity work every now and then, but we never hear about that. Hmm. And I'm sure I'll think of some excuse by then, you know. I teased half-heartedly. This whole secrecy and deception thing is kind of a pain. Edward's expression hardened. It gets easier. After a few decades, everyone you know is dead. Problem solved. I flinched. Sorry, that was harsh. So dreamy, oh my god. Bella still assumes that Alice cleaned her room and stole her clothes, so she finally mentions this to Edward, who realises immediately it's the vampiric pr prisoner visitor bella is a doofus definitely not dartmouth material i don't know what a dartmouth is i'm assuming it's ivy league definitely no rory gilmore is she edward fetches the old newspaper with the seattle murders written in it and in it hypothesis 
the sizes that it's not the work of just one newborn vampire but several who don't know the rules or that the volturi exist and will kill them for bringing attention to the existence of vampires we need to know more before we can decide that Perhaps if we can talk to these young ones, explain the rules, it can be resolved peacefully, he frowned, like he didn't think the chances of that were good. We'll wait until Alice has an idea of what's going on. We don't want to step in until it's absolutely necessary. After all, it's not our responsibility, but it's good we have Jasper. Newborn vampires are running amok in Seattle, killing humans en masse, and there's no hope of the police catching them or doing anything about it. Well, it's not our responsibility, even though we live next door. So let's allow the body count to pile up. NIMBY, not in my backyard, George Carlin, good set. People say, not in my backyard. People don't want anything near them, especially if it might help somebody else. Part of the great American spirit of generosity we're always told about. Now, technically, newborn vampires aren't the Cullen's responsibility, sure. But Bella is the one constantly telling us, yeah, how they're the most selfless, most good, most special, most this, most that, most blah, 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 people ever. So this attitude of, not my problem, not in my backyard, doesn't line up with the Cullens are my heroes. Now, does it? I'm not suffering at all. I don't, I, I know what day it is right now. Jasper is an expert on young vampires, Edward vague books about. Edward brings up the werewolf party. You don't have to ask my permission, Bella. I'm not your father. Thank heaven for that. Perhaps you should ask Charlie though. Is he joking? Also the way that he was acting for the first 150 pages of his book, you would have think that Bella actually was made from his vampiric venom sperm balls. <laughs> Shut up. Bella decides to go to the bonfire and take her motorbike back to Jacob, but when she gets to the Cullen's garage, 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 she sees that Edward has brought a motorbike too. All I'm thinking about this right now though is motorbike, Edward Cullen, vampires, bat bike, Batman, R Pats, new Batman. Oh my God, is this foreshadowing? Stephanie Mayer is the real Alice Cullen. She's such a psychic. I stared at the beautiful machine. Beside it, my bike looked like a broken tricycle. I felt a sudden wave of sadness inhaling my own hair. I felt a sudden wave of sadness when I realized that this was not a bad analogy for the way I probably no looked next to Edward. Self burn, get wrecked, Bella. Edward realizes that biking is something Bella does with Jacob. So he's like, okay, fine. And is all perfectly understanding about it. Boo! I don't want reasonable Edward. I want irrational, moody Edward. He's much more fun. He came back with one object that was black and shapeless and another that was red and easily identifiable. Please, he asked, flashing the crooked smile that always destroyed my resistance. I took the red helmet, weighing it in my hands. I look stupid. She's been riding this entire time without any protection. And that is how teen pregnancies start. And yet Edward tells me that he thinks that she is Dartmouth material. Are you mad, bruv? She's got minus IQ points. Do you know what happens if you fall off a motorbike where it's going like 70 miles an hour and you're not wearing, you're just wearing jeans or whatever? You're gonna be picking up your skin off the side of the road. It's gross. No, 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 no. No, no, Bella, actually. He seems to be struggling for the right word. You look sexy. I laughed out loud, right, very sexy, really. The S word in my Mormon novel. Go back to church, both of you. As Edward drove me toward La Push a little while later, I realized that this unprecedented situation felt oddly familiar. It took me a moment of thought to pinpoint the source of the deja vu. You know what this reminds me of, I asked. It's just like when I was a kid and Renee would pass me off to Charlie for the summer. I feel like a seven year old. They meet Jacob, so Edward gives Bella a proper snog in front of him, <laughs> based. I knew the exact point that I was in the werewolf territory because Jacob shoved away from his car and loped quickly over to me, closing the distance in three long strides. He took the bike from me, balanced it on the kickstand and grabbed me up in another vice tight hug. I heard the Volvo's engine growl and I struggled to get free. Cut it out, Jake, I gasped breathlessly. The way they both dick swing over her. I am team no one. I am team Bella blocking everyone and then running away from Forks back to Renee. Chapter 11, Legends, me. Jacob leaned back against my knees and toyed with the hot dog he had spitted on a straightened wire hanger. The flames at the edge of the bonfire licked along its blistered skin. He heaved a sigh and patted his stomach. It was somehow still flat, though I'd lost count of how many hot dogs he'd eaten after his tenth. Not to mention the super-sized bag of chips or the two-litre bottle of root beer. I want to be a werewolf now. I want to be able to eat that much. It was easier being with my Quilute friends than I'd expected. Hey, vampire girl, Embry had greeted me loudly. 
Quill had jumped up to give me a high five and kiss me on the cheek. Emily had squeezed my hand when we'd sat on the cool stone ground beside her and Sam. I was just thinking this over my beans and toast that I was having earlier, how two-faced the wolf pack are. They are happy to protect Bella and consider her a friend, but if she gets bitten by Edward, they will track them down to kill Edward and, let's be real, most likely Bella too. And over what? Tribalism. Plain and simple. A stupid made up rule about being sworn enemies with a clan of vampires who have never done them any harm. Furthermore, considering Breaking Dawn, how Jacob thought Bella died, so he and the wolf pack were ready to murder a newborn infant for literally zero reasons. And the only reason they didn't is because of Jacob's pedophilic imprint on the baby. Edward and Bella are terrible parents for allowing Jacob anywhere near that child. If he hadn't have imprinted with Renesmee, he would have killed a newborn baby. Again, over what? Some arbitrary treaty that was entirely invented a few generations ago. It wasn't some solemn doctrine passed down for tens of thousands of years. And even when things are passed down for tens of thousands of years, even when people go, oh, it's tradition. Well, how do you think traditions are made? Traditions are things that are just made up by people. That is it. There ain't nothing sacred about fox hunting. Do you know what I mean? Do you get my point? They don't need to strictly follow a treaty if they don't really want to, but they do want to because they really want to just go around killing babies. Or was it revenge for Bella dying? Because yes, Jacob, I'm sure that's what would make Bella happy. Her dying through childbirth to get her baby born because she wanted to keep that child. And look, I'm pro-choice. She wanted to keep her child, right? So much so that she would die for her child to live. But Jacob's just like, nope, screw that. Screw Bella's final wishes, as it were. I'm just going to straight up rip apart a little newborn defenseless baby. It is indefensible behavior. And from memory, it, it, after he and Prince, he gets so overprotective, thinking that he has some uh, a claim to Renesme, more so than Bella, her actual mother, does. I remember that really wound me up reading that kind of stuff. And the Cullens were all just fine with it. Are you mental? He is a psychopath. He was ready to kill a baby. He is a psychopath. It's indefensible behavior. I don't give a shit if they say, oh, but you know, the baby could have been a monster. It's a baby crawling around. What's it gonna do realistically? Even if it was a, like, a monster, even if it was like Gage from Pet Cemetery. Brought back from the dead, little monster, up to no good. What's a little tiny baby gonna do when there's werewolves and vampires knocking about? Nothing. I hate these books, I hate these books. The wolves are two-faced psychos because they are all pro killing the baby anyway. And Bella and Edward are morons for allowing a bunch of wannabe baby killers around their baby. And I hate these books. I wondered how horrible it was for Leah to sit across the circle from Sam and Emily. Sam and Emily, Sam and Emily. Well, have I got a flashback to Mona the Vampire when Sam and Ella, the new cooks, were giving people salmonella? Did that happen? Is that a fever dream? Totally was a real thing. Look at that. Look at this mind. Sam and Emily. Sam and Sam and Emily. Sam and Sam. Sam and Emily. Oh my God, I thought I, just, I thought I died for a second then. Her lovely face betrayed no emotion, but she never looked away from the flames. Looking at the perfection of Leah's features, I couldn't help but compare them to Emily's ruined face. What did Leah think of Emily's scars now that she knew the truth behind them? Did it seem like justice in her eyes? Bella is, in, is so weird. The whole pack was there. Sam with his Emily, Paul, Embry, Quill, and Jared with Kim, the girl he'd imprinted upon. <laughs> preemptively laughing because it's a bit so stupid. My first impression of Kim was that she was a nice girl, a little shy and a little plain. She had a wide face, mostly cheekbones, with eyes too small to balance them out. Her nose and mouth were both too broad for traditional beauty. Her flat black hair was thin and wispy in the wind that never seemed to let up atop the cliff. No one asked for your blow by blow account of why this girl's face ain't like exactly a model. Who do you think you are? That was my first impression. Oh, well, that's okay then. But after a few hours of watching Jared watch Kim, I can no longer find anything plain about the girl. The way he stared at her, it was like a blind man seeing the sun for the first time. Like a collector finding an undiscovered da Vinci. Like a mother looking into the face of a newborn child. Like me watching these books burn. His wandering eyes made me see new things about her. How her skin looked like russet coloured silk in the firelight. How the shape of her lips were a perfect double curve. How white her teeth were against them. How long her eyelashes were brushing her cheeks when she looked down. 
Has Bella ever considered being bloody normal? Watching them, I felt like I better understood what Jacob had told me about imprinting before. It's hard to resist that level of commitment and adoration. Well, you know what predators and toxic dating coaches say, persistence beats resistance. Billy starts telling them their true legends. Their ancestors were magical spirit warriors who could astral project and protect themselves against other settlements. The last spirit chief, Taha Aki, got betrayed by one of his former outcasted warriors, Utlapa, who stole Taha Aki's body when he was astral protecting one day. Rookie mistake, bruv. He became a burden, seeking privileges that Taha Aki had never had requested, refusing to work alongside his warriors, taking a young second wife and then a third, though Taha Aki's wife lived on, something unheard of in the tribe. Taha Aki watched in helpless fury. Why didn't the tribe just oust him? Always question authority, always rebel, always overthrow your leaders, always just do it. Being bodiless was disorientating, uncomfortable, and horrifying. Taha Aki had been away from his body for so long that at this point he was in agony. He felt he was doomed, never to cross over to the final land where his ancestors waited, stuck in this torturous nothingness forever. This is a better story than Twilight. Taha Aki asks a big wolf to share his body to stop himself from going mad, and the wolf accepts. As a wolf, he manages to communicate with someone from his tribe called Yut. Yut jumped back into his body, but Utlapa had his knife at his throat and a hand covering his mouth. Taha Aki's body was strong and Yut was weak with age. Yut could not even say one word to warn the others before Utlapa silenced him forever. This, small, this short story is genuinely better than Eclipse itself. Now I'm wondering if Stephanie Mayer actually made it up himself or if she i wanted to look up whether Taharaki actually you know if it was mythology or folklore within native american mythology and instead i found a site kuliot facts versus twilight fiction fiction the wolf pack exists to fight vampires uh, fact kuliot people do not turn into wolves oh well that's a relief then isn't it <laughs> Taha Aki re-enters the wolf body to kill Utlapa, but somehow manages to shapeshift back into human form, but like as an ultimate human warrior. He kills Utlapa and makes everything right again, but stops spirit travels because it's too dangerous. From that point on, Taha Aki was more than either man or wolf. They called him Taha Aki the Great Wolf or Taha Aki the Spirit Man. He led the tribe for many, many years, for he did not age. When danger threatened, he would resume his wolf self to fight or frighten the enemy. So the poor wolf whose body he took, just has to sit at the back of his mind, wait impatiently whilst Tahaaki runs around being human, or did they mold together? Is this the plot of Moon Knight, except with werewolves? Wagwan, I did it! You got planted! There's another story. Trouble happens in the Makad tribe when young women begin disappearing. So Tahaaki's son, Tahawi, goes to find what's causing the problem. It's clearly a vampire doing it, who kills Tahawi. The vampire returns after a year to continue killing and kills a bunch of the wolf pack. Loads of wolf warriors died to one lousy vampire. Yahauta, Tahaaki's son, brings back the corpse of the vampire. We learn something interesting about the vampires. But the creature learned quickly and soon was matching their maneuvers. It got its hands on Yahauta's brother. Yahauta found an opening on the creature's throat and he lunged. His teeth tore the head off the creature, but the hands continued to mangle his brother. Yahauta ripped the creature into unrecognizable chunks, tearing pieces apart in a desperate attempt to save his brother. He was too late, but in the end, the creature was destroyed. Or so they thought. Yahauta laid the reeking remains out to be examined by the elders. One severed hand lay beside a piece of the creature's granite arm. The two pieces touched when the elders poked them with sticks, and the hand reached out towards the arm piece, trying to reassemble itself. This is a little bit overkill, isn't it? It's like it's like in the first Pirates of the Caribbean when the pirates just don't die. But that was a that was a good film. So I'm not complaining about that. But this is it's just a bit ridiculous. The vampires can pull themselves back together. Pull yourself together, mate. They set fire to the remains to stop it reassembling. The tribe is down to one wolf protector when the vampire's girlfriend comes back to get revenge. She kills a load of Kuyas, including Yahauta, the last airbender. I mean, wolf warrior. Tahaaki is old, but he becomes a wolf to fight the vampire. However, this story is about his third wife, who's only referred to as the third wife. This story is about the sacrifice of Tahaaki's third wife, and she doesn't even get a name, even though she ends up saving him and the entire tribe. 
sexism. The wife sticks a knife into her own heart to distract the vampire. She could have just cut her hand and let it bleed a little, that would have done the trick, but oh well, I suppose. Whilst distracted, Tahaaki kills the vampire. Two of his young sons also turn into wolves after seeing their mother die. Tahaaki stays as a wolf because he's just grieving and he goes to live in the wild after losing his wife. For generations after, the wolves pass the knowledge of vampires down to their sons to defend the tribes, but vampires aren't much of a hassle after the first two. The Cullens are mentioned making a treaty with Ephraim Black, story time over. That's Jacob's granddad, by the way. Bella falls asleep, so Jacob carries her like a five-year-old to his car and she wakes up. It's like when you're a kid and you fall asleep in the car and then you wake up or you fall asleep on the sofa and then you wake up inside your bed because your parents carried you there. It is exactly like that. Edward takes Bella home. She has a dream. Edward reads Wuthering Heights, I also don't care. And there you see the distinction between our feelings. Had he been in my place and I in his, though I hated him with a hatred that turned my life to gall, I never would have raised a hand against him. You may look incredulous, if you please. I never would have banished him from her society as long as she desired his. The moment her regard ceased, I would have torn his heart out and drank his blood. But till then, if you don't believe me, you don't know me. Till then, I would have died by inches before I touched a single hair of his head. Edward identifies with this paragraph because the only thing stopping him from killing Jacob is that it would make Bella sad. That is not a good thing, by the way. For a vegetarian vampire, he really has no respect for life. Shane gets realistically, at this point in the book, what has Jacob actually done? He was just there for Bella whilst Edward was prancing around different countries when he, when he left her in New Moon. So he's got no reason to want to murder Jacob just because of that. Everyone in this book is an unhinged nutcase. Chapter 12 time. Alice is throwing a graduation party for Bella. Bella freaks out that graduation is getting nearer and nearer and she's not ready to say goodbye to everyone yet. In theory, I was anxious, even eager to trade mortality for immortality. After all, it was the key to staying with Edward forever. I think she just wants to be immortal for immortality's sake, really. I just think she just wants to live forever and be beautiful and stay young. Don't we all? In practice, being human was all I knew. The future beyond that was a big dark abyss that I couldn't know until I leaped into it. I suppose it also doesn't help that Edward keeps her in the dark about so many things on purpose. So no wonder she's feeling very anxious and not knowing what the future holds. He doesn't bloody talk to her. This simple knowledge, today's date, which was so obvious that I must've been subconsciously repressing it. I will give Stephanie Mayer credit where credit is due. At least she knows how a subconscious works. I'm looking at you, E.L. James. Edward and Bella discuss Bella's fears. He took a deep breath before he answered. You could do so much better, Bella. I know that you believe I have a soul, but I'm not entirely convinced on that point. And to risk yours, he shook his head slowly. For me to, why are they both just in agreement that souls exist? Hmm. For me to allow this, to let you become what I am just so that I'll never have to lose you, is the most selfish act I can imagine. I want it more than anything for myself, but for you, I want so much more. Given in, it feels criminal. It's the most selfish thing I'll ever do, even if I live forever. If there were any way for me to become human for you, no matter what the price was, I would pay it. If I'm delirious from this heat wave, or that is the nicest thing that he has ever said to her. <laughs> story prompt, a love story where a vampire finds a way to become human again for his love interest. Just trying that one out there seeing what grows. I don't think you realize how much easier it will be for me, Bella, he said, the echo of his humor still there in his voice, when I don't have to concentrate all the time on not killing you. Certainly there are things I'll miss, this for one. He stared into my eyes as he stroked my cheek and I felt the blood rush up to my color my skin. He laughed gently. This is basically foreplay for these two. And the sound of your heart, he continued, more serious, but still smiling a little. It's the most significant sound in my world. I'm so attuned to it now. I swear I could pick it out from miles away but neither of these things matter. This, he said, taking my face in his hands. You, that's what I'm keeping. You'll always be my Bella. You'll just be a little more durable. Oh, stop it. I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna get the tissues. Edward asks why Bella doesn't want to be his wife. And it's because she thinks it's embarrassing. Good for her, I guess. I'm not that girl, Edward. The one who gets married right out of high school like some small town hick who got knocked up by her boyfriend. Do you know what people would think? Do you realize what century this is? People don't just get married at 18. Not smart people, not responsible, mature people. I wasn't going to be that girl. That's not who I am. I trailed off, losing steam. Why do you care about what people are gonna think or say though, considering you're gonna turn into a vampire anyway? Who cares? That's all, he finally asked. I blinked. Isn't that enough? It's not that you were 
more eager for immortality itself than just me. Eternity is a huge decision for an 18 year old to make, to be honest. It all sounds grand, but what, like, how are you gonna feel when you're like thousands of years old and everything's really boring? Story prompt, a vampire who's like super old, but then lives through a nuclear apocalypse. Yeah, they, they survive it obviously, because of course they did, they're a vampire, but this world is just desolate sparse there's no one to to talk to because everyone's turned into super mutants or lived underground a la fallout or whatever you know actually no not a story i'm keeping that one for myself stay away from it edward explains that in his world and his time he would have married bella as soon as he found her he is from a different generation he is like an ultra boomer but at the same time it's not like he's a time traveler he has lived through the entire 20th century 21st century what century are we in so i don't know how he hasn't already lost his ideals from over 90 years ago especially considering they're not meant to remember that much about their human life so i don't know how he's hanging on to these ideals still get over it grow up get with the times man the thing is edward i said in a shaky voice avoiding question in my mind marriage and eternity are not mutually exclusive or mutually inclusive concepts and since we're living in my world for the moment maybe we should go with the times if you know what i mean but on the other hand he countered you will soon be leaving time behind you altogether. So why should the transitory customs of one local culture affect the decision so much? Reasonable arguments from both sides, I'll give them that. Too bad I don't give a shit. It's graduation day. Seattle is still being plagued by vampiric attacks. 39 humans have been killed so far. Alice still can't see what's happening with the vampires. Edward decides to go see Jasper and take Bella with him to the Cullens, skipping school. You know, if I was a vampire, I actually would do college several times and get several different A-levels and then I'd go to university several times over as well. Might as well. I've got the time. I would have the time. That should be my new goal, being a vampire. I could do it. I think I could do it. If anyone was going to become a vampire, who's a better contender for it? I'm just saying. I actually have put myself back in. Did I even men already mention this? I don't know. But I'm doing philosophy now, my A-level. because so I didn't do my A-levels at college because I smoked too much weed and I failed the exams on purpose. So I thought it'd be funny. And then I had to restart and do media. So now I'm retaking my A my A levels in philosophy. So then maybe, maybe I'll go, maybe I'll go do a degree in philosophy and maybe I'll become a, I've decided that I want to become a philosopher. I'm just going to chat shit and get paid. Pretty much what I do already anyway, right? Why not just add philosopher to that title? You know, happiness is for me a very conformist category. But if I was a vampire, a vampiric philosopher, I think this heat has cooked my brain. I didn't write any of that on air. You can really tell when I go off the script because it just doesn't make sense. Jasper thinks that he has it, a eureka moment. And Edward, who can hear his thoughts, considers what Jasper thought too. We're all confused, Emmett grumbled. You can afford the time to be patient, Jasper told him. Bella should understand this too. She's one of us now. His words took me by surprise. As little as I'd had to do with Jasper, especially since my last birthday when <laughs> he tried to kill me, I hadn't realized that he thought of me that way. When I wrote this, I, I thought that was kind of nice because I was clearly sensitive from the heat and whatever, maybe hormones most likely. Now I don't care go away. Like they don't even talk to each other like since he tried to kill her, whatever. Bella knows nothing of Jasper's past because Edward doesn't tell her shit. Every two seconds I'm sticking to this table. This is, this is vile. Jasper shows Bella that he is covered in vampire bites. Dun dun dun. Chapter 13, newborn. Vampire venom is the only thing that leaves a scar on vampire skin. I'm so uncomfortable. Jasper tells his story. In the South, there are covens of vampires always at war over territories of areas where human population density is high. Some vampire guy called Benito made an army of newborn vampires because they are crazy and dangerous and super strong. You see, though newborns are dangerous, they are still possible to defeat if you know what you're doing. They're incredibly powerful physically for the first year or so. If they're allowed to bring strength to bear, they can crush an older vampire with ease, but they are slaves to their instincts and thus predictable. Usually they have no skill in fighting, only muscle and ferocity. And in this case, overwhelming numbers. Vampires in Southern Mexico also made a newborn army and then everyone lost the plot. When the body count reached epidemic proportions, in fact, your histories blame a disease for the population slump, the Volturi finally stepped in. <laughs> The entire guard came together and sought out every newborn in the bottom half of North America. Benito was entrenched in Puebla, building his army as quickly as he could in order to take on the prize, Mexico City. 
The Volturi started with him and then moved on to the rest. Anyone who was found with the newborns was executed immediately, and since everyone was trying to protect themselves from Benito, Mexico was emptied of vampires for a time. This is a better story than Twilight. The wars resumed on a smaller scale, and the vampires were, were more intelligent about their methods, so the humans remained oblivious. Thus, the Volturi didn't care. Jasper was born in Texas in the 1800s and he joined the Confederate Army. I don't know what that is, confused in British. Jasper becomes a major because he's super talented and special and he just has this way about him where people just like listen to him or something. That's his, you know, super special empathetic power, I don't know. But then he comes across three vampire women one day. They had such pale skin. I remember marveling at it. Even the little black haired girl whose features were clearly Mexican was porcelain in the moonlight. Is this whitewashing? The vampires decide to turn Jasper into a vampire as well because he's so special. There were six of us when I joined Maria's band. She added four more within a fortnight. We were all male. Maria wanted soldiers and that made it slightly more difficult to keep from fighting amongst ourselves. I fought my first battles against my new comrade in arms. I was quicker than the others, better at combat. Maria was pleased with me. Maria. Maria was, what was I saying? Maria. Marry her. No. Maria. Why was I having trouble with that? Maria was pleased with me, though put out that she had to keep replacing the ones I destroyed. I was rewarded often and that made me stronger. Are these vampires? This bit of text reads like these vampires are just turning people into newborns just to have them fight to the death of one another to find out who is the strongest. And if I've read that correctly, then that is incredibly based. Jasper helps lead the newborn vampires against other covens to victory thanks to his army training and the power of being an empath. Shane Dawson could never. Maria gets too big for her boots though, tries claiming territories and overstretching herself. So they begin to start losing. Maria and Jasper stick with each other. The, the other two, like get killed or whatever by them maybe maria and jasper were banging maybe who am i kidding it's twilight they probably just held hands for decades maria and i always kept a dozen or so newborns ready they meant little to us they were pawns they were disposable when they outgrew their usefulness we did dispose of them my life continued in the same violent pattern and the years passed i was sick of it all for a very long time before anything changed jasper was doing this for decades sure yeah people can change people do change all the time all the time. I change my mind like a hundred times a day about something. But how can the Cullens genuinely trust the vampire who has murdered hundreds of times, excluding, I'm assuming, the thousands of times of, of like murdering humans to drink their blood? I'm assuming, right? Because he's pretty old. How can they trust this, like, let's be real, serial killer to go to a school around a bunch of kids? It's ridiculous. After decades, Jasper actually gets a friend called Peter who is a good newborn, but he's reasonable and sympathetic to the other newborns. And then Peter ends up running away with a lady vampire called Charlotte and Jasper lets them go. Jasper is suffering with depression. Peter comes back after five years to tell Jasper that vampires don't always have to fight and can coexist as this is all Jasper has ever known. Jasper leaves with Peter, but he still feels depressed. He realizes it's because of his empath abilities. It affects him to kill humans because he feels their emotions, feels their fear as he kills them. He leaves Peter too after a while and he tries to stop killing humans, but can't as he keeps slipping up. Until one day he meets Alice who is expecting him because she's psychic and then they go to find the Cullens and live happily ever after. The end, I would rather be reading that story than this one. Jasper thinks someone slash Victoria is creating an army of newborns in Seattle. Jasper doesn't think it's Victoria. We know it's Victoria. We know because we're not stupid. Jasper will teach the Cullens how to kill the newborns. Not indecision, Edward growled. Knowledge. Someone who knows you can't see anything until the decision is made. Someone who is hiding from us, playing with the holes in your vision. Who would know that? Alice whispered. Edward's eyes were hard as ice. Our own knows you as well as you know yourself. But I would see if they decided to come, unless they didn't want to get their hands dirty. A favour, Rosalie suggested, speaking for the first time. Someone in the South, someone who has already had trouble with the rules, someone who should have been destroyed is offered the second chance. If they take care of this one small problem, that would explain the Volturi's sluggish response. I have no idea what's going on and I have a headache now, thank you. Edward says Aro wants him and Alice at his side so he can be omniscient and that he also might be considering wiping out the rest of the Cullens to force them to join. Jasper disagrees and says that this work is too sloppy to be the Volturi. How have none of them made the connection that it's Victoria? I don't know. Carlo rings that other vegetarian clan, Denali, Tanya, to ask for help. Irina was more involved with our friend Laurent than we knew. She's holding a grudge against the bulls for destroying him to save Bella. She wants, he paused, looking down at me, 
Go on, I said as evenly as I could. His eyes tightened. She wants revenge, to take down the pack. They would trade their help for our permission. Kill, kill, kill. Do any of these supernaturals ever think of anything else to do? Change the record. Get a hobby. This isn't good, Jasper said. It's too even a fight. We'd have the upper hand in skill, but not in numbers. We'd win, but at what price? His tense eyes flashed to Alice's face and away. I wanted to scream out loud as I grasped <laughs> what Jasper meant. We would win, but we would lose. Some wouldn't survive. She's such a baby man. I looked around the room at their faces. Jasper, Alice, Emmett, Rose, Esme, Carlisle, Edward. The faces of my family. You absolutely cannot sell me on this lie. Firstly, Rosalie doesn't even like her. Secondly, she's been buddy buddy with them a few months since they ditched her in New Moon because of Edward's tantrum. Go away. Chapter 14 declaration. We're back at school and Alice is still going ahead with her party to Bella's chagrin. Carlisle is trying to get non-veggie vampires to help. When are you going? I asked in a hollow voice. I couldn't stand this. The idea that someone might not come back. What if it was Emmett, so brave and thoughtless that he was never the least bit cautious? Or Esme, so sweet and lovely that I couldn't even imagine her in a fight? Or Alice, so tiny, so fragile looking? Or... I couldn't even think the name, consider the possibility. Stop infantilizing women so much. All of them could murder an army of humans and wouldn't break a sweat. Just because you're a wimp doesn't mean that these vampires are. Bella wants to help. 300 pages in and she finally wants to be proactive and do something. Well, I never. Renee has cancelled coming to the graduation party and I'm sure we will get a blow by blow account which will entirely pertain to the plot as to why she's cancelled. The message light was flashing when I got home. My feeling of relief flared again as I listened to my mother describe Phil's accident on the ball field. While demonstrating a slide, he tangled up with the catcher and broken his thigh bone. He was entirely dependent on her and there was no way she could leave him. My mum was still apologising when the message cut off. Told you, super interesting. His smile still knocked the breath out of me. I wish it would just knock you out. He was so beautiful that it made it hard sometimes to think about anything else. We know, we've had three books full of this shit already. Bella wants to go to La Push while Edward is out hunting. I wish they'd La Push Bella off a cliff. Hey. We want to be as strong as possible, he explained, still reluctant. We'll probably hunt again on the way, looking for big game. That makes you stronger? He searched my face for something, but there was nothing to find but curiosity. Yes, he finally said. Human blood makes us the strongest, though only fractionally. Jasper's been thinking about cheating. Averse as he is to the idea, he's nothing if not practical, but he won't suggest it. He knows what Carlyle will say. Jasper's been casually thinking about going back on his entire ethos and murdering a few humans. If this is the concern, why not just go to a blood bank? Also, I think I said this in the first Twilight book review, but imagine how much better the stakes would be if human blood made them way stronger than animal blood. There'd be more of an actual threat for the climax. There'd be more of a sacrifice that the Cullens are making, not living to their fullest capabilities as vampires. Just saying. I frowned. If something helped even the odds, and then I shuddered, realizing I was willing to have a stranger die to protect him. I was horrified at myself, but not entirely able to deny it either. He changed the subject again. That's why they're so strong, of course. The newborns are full of human blood, their own blood reacting to the change. It lingers in the tissues and strengthens them. Their bodies use it up slowly, like Jasper said, the strength starting to wane after about a year. I'm sure that this is entirely nonsensical, but my head hurts, so I'm, I'm sure also someone in the comment section will explain why that's probably nonsense better than I could. It's the next day and Edward is taking Bella to Jacob. Jacob is tired because Sam is a tyrant or something and hasn't working nights. Bella invites him to the graduation party and Jacob falls asleep. I studied his dreaming face and liked what I saw. Please Bella, just be normal. Poor Jacob. While he slept, every trace of defensiveness and bitterness disappeared and suddenly he was the boy who had been my very best friend before all the werewolf nonsense had gotten in the way. He looked so much younger. He looked like my Jacob. They'd been best friends for like all of two weeks until Jacob had turned, like started his change into being a werewolf. I am so embarrassed for her. When writing this, I started daydreaming a little bit and I thought of something. Bella realistically hasn't been with Edward that long. Not long enough to justify abandoning absolutely everyone in her human life anyway. How would you not hold that against someone after 100 years, 200 years, 500 years of being with them? I gave up seeing my parents ever again, my friends, my family, everyone for you and now they're all dead because I've had to fake my death too and cause them grief. How would that not 
make you crazy after a few hundred years. It sounds like a recipe for disaster. I want a Twilight book where it's a thousand years into the future and they're absolutely sick of each other. Bella wants Edward to do the change for her, i.e. inject her with his rhythm stick. No? Even more embarrassingly, something I would never say aloud, I wanted his venom to poison my system. Is this Bella's version of doing dirty talk? Jacob snorted and rolled to his side. His arm swung off the back of the couch and pinned me against his body. Body, not body. Holy crow, but he was heavy and hot. It was sweltering after just a few seconds. Yeah, don't I know it, mate. Holy crow. Jacob wakes up and demands that Bella stay because he wants to talk to her. I'm in love with you, Bella, Jacob said in a strong, sure voice. Bella, I love you, and I want you to pick me instead of him. I know you don't feel that way, but I need the truth out there so you know your options. I wouldn't want a miscommunication to stand in our way. I'm going to hate this next chapter. Chapter 15, Wager. Bella is dumbfounded somehow as if any of that was a shock, was new information. No, wait, I know that, Bella. But look, answer me this, all right? Do you want me to go away and never see you again? Be honest. It was hard to concentrate on his question, so it took me a minute to answer. No, I don't want that, I finally admitted. Jacob grinned again. See? How does that prove anything? That don't mean that she's secretly in love with you, you donut. It just means that you're mates. Shut up. I thought carefully. I miss you when you're not there. When you're happy, I qualify carefully. It makes me happy. But I could say the same thing about Charlie, Jacob. Your family. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. He nodded unruffled. But you do want me around. Yeah, that, that's called being mates, you freak. Then I'll stick around. You're a glutton for punishment, I grumbled. Yep. He stroked the tips of his fingers across my right cheek. I slapped his hand away. Finally. Do you think you could behave yourself a little better at least? I asked, irritated. No, I don't. You decide, Bella. You can have me the way I am, bad behaviour included, or not at all. Let's rename this chapter the character assassination of Jacob Black to reaffirm that Bella makes the right choice at the end by choosing Edward. Jacob is saying, no, you have to put up my constant inappropriate touching constant inappropriate sex pesting or never see me again personally when faced with an ultimatum like that wouldn't you just choose the latter he laughed i forgive you just try not to get too mad at me because i recently decided that i'm not giving up there really is something irresistible about a lost cause jacob i stared into his dark eyes trying to make him take me seriously i love him jacob he's my whole life you love me too he reminded me he held up his hand when i started to protest not the same way i know but he's not your whole life either not anymore Maybe he once was, but he left. And now he's just going to have to deal with the consequence of that choice. Me. Get a flip in life, you weirdo. What is this obsession in media, in stories, in films, with people constantly chasing after the one they love, even when the person has said no a million times? Just move on. Suddenly, he was serious. He took my chin in his hand, holding it firmly so that I couldn't look away from his intent gaze. Yeah, let me just use my supernatural strength to put this whammon in her place. I don't want options, I disagree, trying to yank my chin free unsuccessfully. And my heart beats unnumbered, Jacob. The time is almost gone. His eyes narrowed. All the more reason to fight. Fight harder now while I can, he whispered. He still had my chin, his fingers holding too tight till it hurt, and I saw the resolve form abruptly into his eyes. So not only is he holding her against her will, he's hurting her whilst doing so. What a romantic guy. Second lead syndrome, am I right? Mm. I started to object, but it was too late. It was assault the moment he physically held her against her will, and now it just gets solidified. His lips crushed mine, stopping my protest. He kissed me angrily, roughly, his other hand gripping tight around the back of my neck, making it escape impossible. I shoved against his chest with all my strength, but he didn't seem to notice. His mouth was soft despite the anger, his lips moulding to mine in a warm, unfamiliar way. My body is physically recoiling at this paragraph. <laughs> I grabbed at his face, trying to push it away, failing again. He seemed to notice this time though, and it aggravated him. His lips forced mine open, and I could feel his hot breath in my mouth. She doesn't want it, so he just pushes further, and he tries to say, in like a page or so, oh, you wanted it, you kissed me back. If she was kissing you back, your lips wouldn't have to force hers open. Acting on instinct, I let my hands drop to my side and shut down. I opened my eyes and didn't fight, didn't feel, just waited for him to stop. This is like something you would read in a trial, a court case, not something you should be reading in a teen supernatural romantic fantasy novel about a girl who's, who's stuck between two guys. It worked. The anger seemed to evaporate and he pulled back to look at me. He pressed his lips softly to mine again, once, twice, a third time. I pretended I was a statue and waited. Finally, he let go of my face and leaned away. Are you done now? I asked in an expressionless voice. Yes, he sighed. 
He started to smile, closing his eyes. After assaulting her, he smiles like a psychopath. He doesn't regret it. He doesn't feel bad about it. Imagine you are Jacob and you say you're in love with this girl. So you kiss her, but she tries to fight you. In what universe would you look at that memory and think, oh, what a great moment, our first kiss. How lovely, how romantic. Clearly a universe in which you are a genuine socio or psychopath. He did it entirely for his own gratification. She did not enjoy it at all. Don't overlook this. It is sexual assault. With his supernatural strength, there is nothing stopping him from her fill in the blank nothing and it's not a leap in logic for me to say that because he feels no guilt that he just forced himself upon her stephanie mayer was on crack when she wrote this and i hate it i pulled my arm back and then let it snap forward punching him in the mouth with, with as much power as i could force out of my body there was a crunching sound ow ow i screamed frantically hopping up and down in agony while i clutched my hand to my chest it was broken i could feel it jacob stared at me in shock are you all right no damn it you broke my hand Bella, you broke your hand. Now stop dancing around, let me look at it. Don't touch me, I'm going home right now. And then he starts victim blaming her. What a great guy. Anyone who read this and was still J team Jacob as juvenile as that sound, sounds, was either 12 or a genuine lobotomite. No thanks, I hissed. I'd rather walk. I turned toward the road. It was only a few miles to the border. As soon as I got away from him, Alice would see me. She'd send someone to pick me up. Just let me drive you home, Jacob insisted. Unbelievably, he had the nerve to wrap his arm around my waist. I jerked away from him. I can't verbally express to you how much I hate this. Stephanie Mayer has written a word that I probably can't say on YouTube, an assaulter. Let's, let's just say that. And she doesn't even realize it. He has zero respect for Bella or her wishes and forces himself upon her whenever he wants. Fine, I growled, do. I can't wait to see what Edward does to you. I hope he snacks your neck, you pushy, obnoxious, moronic dog. Jacob rolled his eyes. He walked me to the passenger side of his car and helped me in. When he got in the driver's side, he was whistling. Considering they are meant to be best friends, as we're told almost constantly, he shows a considerable lack of care for her well-being. He is whistling. He's jovial because he got what he wanted from her. Didn't I hurt you at all? I asked, furious and annoyed. <sighs> she shouldn't be in a car with him. I've written all of this already, but I'm just getting like, I'm just getting annoyed reading this. She sh she just walked home. I asked, furious and annoyed. Are you kidding me? If you hadn't started screaming, I might not have figured out that you were trying to punch me. I may not be made of stone, but I'm not that soft. I hate you, Jacob Black. That's good. Hate is a passionate emotion. I'll give you passionate, I muttered under my breath. Murder, the ultimate crime of fashion. Oh, come on, he said, all cheery and looking like he was about to start whistling again. That had to be better than kissing a rock. Not even close, I told him coldly. He pursed his lips. You could be just saying that, but I'm not. The characters don't take any of what just happened seriously. If a guy forced himself upon me, I wouldn't be getting in a car with him, chatting to him, even if angry, right? She's angry, but she's still just sitting there chatting to him, almost murder, the ultimate crime of passion, almost bantery. I just don't believe Stephanie Mayer has ever met real human beings before. I, I can't explain this, guys. If a guy did that to me, I would not be in the same vicinity as him, never mind a car, but I would remove his golf balls from his ball bag if you catch my drift. The mind of Stephanie Mayer baffles me. I think that she thinks the autonomy of women and ownership of their own bodies is some sort of, like, <laughs> I don't know, private joke. That seemed to bother him for a second, but then he perked up. You're just mad. I. <laughs> He's so dismissive. And oh, I hate this character so much. I don't have any experience with this kind of thing, but I thought it was pretty incredible myself. Ugh, I groaned. You're going to think about it tonight. When you think you're asleep, you'll be thinking about your options. If I think about you tonight, it will be because I'm having a nightmare. He's being smug about it. A girl tries to fight you off and you think it is incredible. I feel bad for his future child bride, Renesme. Jacob pleads for Bella to be with. I'll bet he couldn't even kiss you like that because he would hurt you. I would never, never hurt you, Bella. I held up my injured hand. He sighed. That wasn't my fault. You should have known better. Yeah, you should have known better. I wonder what she was wearing as well when it happened, because that's important. Jacob, I can't be happy about him. You've never tried, he disagreed. When he left, you spent all your energy holding on to him. You could be happy if you let go. You could be happy with me. I don't want to be happy with anyone but him, I insisted. 
Why is she sitting in his car trying to reason with him, having this extended conversation? She should have left, left, had a vampire slash Alice come to get her and never spoken to him again. Not sit there and defend her relationship for the billionth time next to a guy who could quite easily overpower her at any second and, and do what he wants with her. I hate that Stephanie Mayer wrote this and thought it was good. Doing these videos is an occupational hazard. It's hazardous for my health because I genuinely get quite stressed out reading crap like this. Even if it's like over 10 years old or however old it is, e even then I still get annoyed by it because it's like, firstly it's all illogical and it's all just stupid and it's it's so kind of weirdly like dehumanizing because people just wouldn't, wouldn't act like this. But I just have to wonder how many women, how many young teens internalized the terrible messages of constantly putting up with crap and assault from men just because. He grinned over at me. You kissed me back. I gasped, unthinkingly boiling my hands up into fist again, hissing when my broken hand reacted. Are you okay? He asked. I did not. I think I can tell the difference. You just said that you have no experience in kissing. So how would you tell the, you stupid. I'm trying not, I'm just trying not to swear. The Stephanie Mayer approach to writing a book is just violently shitting all over a keyboard. Obviously you can't, that was not kissing back, that was trying to get you the hell off of me, you idiot. But he laughed a low throaty laugh, touchy, almost overly defensive, I would say. You know, this This is the exact defense a sexual assaulter would use, yeah? It was consensual, she wanted it, blah, blah, blah. My blood pressure is rising from reading this. I'm really sorry about your hand, Jacob said, sounding almost sincere. Next time you want to hit me, use a baseball bat or a crowbar, okay? Don't think I'll forget that, I muttered. The way he's joking around about assaulting her and hurting her, and she is just putting up with it, is some straight up sexist, misogynistic bullshit. Mayer. It is Stephanie Mayer bullshit. It's Mayer bullshit. It is some boys will be boys bullshit. That's what it is. Jacob takes Bella home. Hey, Charlie. Jacob answered casually, pausing. I stalked onto the kitchen. What's wrong with her? Charlie wondered. She thinks she broke her hand, I heard Jacob tell him. I went to the freezer and pulled out a tray of ice cubes. The way she's not being directly spoken to, and instead the men are talking to one another about her when she's in, like, hearing distance. Miss me with this constant subliminal crap, Maya, please. I can't take it. Jacob laughed. She hit me. Charlie laughed too. And I scowled while I beat the tray of, of ice against the edge of the sink. The ice scattered inside the basin and I grabbed a handful with my good hand and wrapped the cubes in the dishcloth on the counter. Why did she hit you? Because I kissed her, Jacob said unashamed. Good for you, kid. Charlie congratulated him. This is the chief of police, everyone. Yay. More importantly, that is your daughter that you're talking about. First of all, before we get to the actual deep shit, yeah. Little bit weird for a guy to tell a girl's dad, oh yeah, I kissed your daughter and then she hit me and the dad to be like, good for you, kid. Little bit strange. Little, just, just a little bit. You should be able to rely upon your primary caregivers to have your back and protect you. That's literally what parenting is. If someone had done something non-consensual with me when, when I was a teen and my father found out, laughing about it would be the last thing he would do. My dad would be out there breaking some legs if something like that happened to me and he found out about it. That is called being a parent. And not in the weird, oh, fathers don't want their daughters to have a date because I oh, get the shotgun like, oh, macho, stupid, weird, weird, sexist, bullshit, ownership of daughters and their sexualities. Not in the slightest. My dad's always been nice to my boyfriends, but something non-consensual had happened to me. And I told him. Then he'd really get the shotgun out. Charlie's daughter gets assaulted and he is laughing about it and congratulating the assaulter for it just because he hates Edward. This is inexcusable behavior. And for me, I remember being really angry when I first read this, but looking at it through an adult's eyes, his character is just tainted by this forever. It is inexcusable, it's indefensible. And he obviously knows it wasn't consensual because otherwise if it was consensual, Bella wouldn't have hit Jacob. Bella clearly hit Jacob for a reason. I just hate this so much. Bella calls Edward and tells him what happened. All I heard on the other side of the line was the sound of an engine accelerating. In the other room, Charlie spoke again. Maybe you ought to take off Jake, he suggested. 
I think I'll hang out here if you don't mind. I don't understand why he chooses to do this. Is it because he thinks Edward won't do anything about Charlie? Is it because he just wants to gloat to Edward's face about assaulting Edward's girlfriend? Like, shh. I already decided that Jacob is absolutely the worst character in this book. He's, he's like a hundred times worse than Edward. And that took a lot for me to say. Either way, staying in Bella's house when she clearly doesn't want him there is also an imposition. It is also gross and disgusting behavior. How's your hand? Charlie asked as I walked by. Charlie looked uncomfortable. Jacob lolled next to him on the sofa, perfectly at ease. I lifted the ice pack to show it off. It's swelling. Maybe you should pick on people your own size, Charlie suggested. Parent of the year, yay. Edward comes, finally. It's the only time I'll ever say that. He kissed my hand softly. I'll take care of it, he promised. And then he called, Jacob. His voice was still and even. Now, now, Charlie cautioned. Do you know how hard these videos have become? Because I don't say the F-bomb anymore. So I was told not to. Not because of monetization issues. No, you don't care about that. YouTube don't really care about that. Just because it can impact the amount of people who end up seeing your video. Difference, there's a difference. It's so hard right now. I really just want to break it. Just saying shut up, Charlie, doesn't carry the same weight. Edward wants to do what Charlie should be doing protecting Bella. I don't want any fighting, do you understand? Charlie looked only at Edward when he spoke. I can go put on my badge if that makes my request more official. Edward is being calm and calmly trying to talk to Jacob and he brings out this bullshit of, oh, I'm a cop, blah, blah, blah. Maybe you should put your badge on and do something about the future sex offender and future pedophile, though he doesn't know that yet, who is in your house, just saying. Dad, don't you have a baseball bat somewhere in your room? I want to borrow it for a moment. The way it's being made light of by Bella basically joking around. This is not a legitimate threat coming from Bella, the girl who's always wincing and crying and, eh, and being a little baby and wants to scream at the fourth. This is not a legitimate threat. She is not going to get a baseball from somewhere and hit Jacob. I want to give up. I had to give up. I'm so fed up. This is some Stephanie Mayer. Teehee, just put up with it when men manhandle you and take what they want from you because it just means that they really, really like you. Bullshit. This is some like straight up propaganda for something. The Book of Mormon maybe, who knows? I don't know. Jacob doesn't love Bella because if he did love Bella, he wouldn't be so concerned about what he could get out of her. And he would be taking her feelings into consideration instead of constantly steamrolling all over her. It's funny because in New Moon, I defended Jacob a lot and that was within the context of New Moon. And I said in the New Moon review, I know it like it gets worse and it becomes indefensible. And I do, my conspiracy theory is that it was a character assassination. So more people would just be in favor of Edward ultimately. Because in New Moon, Edward comes off as a complete arsehole and Jacob's there to pick up the pieces and be the nice guy and stuff. The way his cat, his character just completely does a 180 and becomes this cocky, arrogant, this future sex offender shit. Uh, an eclipse is gross. Fine, I said, leaning against him. I wasn't so angry anymore now that Edward was with me. I felt comforted and my hand didn't bother me as much. Oh, so I guess it's all right then, it's fine. Oh, all's well, ends well, whatever. You know it's okay to stay angry at people when they've done you wrong, right? Anger is a valid emotion and you're allowed to feel it when people screw you over and you're allowed to keep grudges and you're allowed to not forgive people. You don't have to forgive anyone unless you want to. And someone saying sorry doesn't mean that you have to forgive them. This weird insistence in some fiction books that I've read of people just getting over their anger really quickly when they should stay angry. There are some people I fell out with like five years ago and I'm still mad about it. Not many, because that'd be bad for my health, but when when there's a situation that, that is worthy enough of that, stick to your guns. Bella gets into Edward's car whilst Edward talks to Jacob. I don't know what the editors or publishers or agents or who the hell ever was meant to proofread this were thinking. Why did no one think maybe this isn't the best idea for a teen young adult book? When I read this as a teenager, I knew that what had happened was assault to Bella. And I didn't think it was acceptable then for this to be treated so lightly. I was a teenager thinking that. Where the hell were the adults at the time thinking this? You could have forgone that entire forced kiss and it would have been fine, except for the coercion of Jacob and the emotional manipulation and Bella da, 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 at the end, we'll get to it. But there, there was no need for this, other than to show Jacob is willing to assault someone to try to get what he wants. And Bella is, she, cause she forgives him obviously, is willing to forgive 
someone doing that to her just just like the, it's just oh, i don't know such a terrible message to be sending to impressionable teens and if anyone's an adult and read that and thought it was fine like what's wrong with you come on edward spoke in a voice so peaceful and gentle that it made the word strangely more threatening i'm not going to kill you now because it would upset bella what is the point of having a vampire for a boyfriend who is fully capable of getting away with murder if he's not gonna do it What's the point? Then he turned back to Jacob. But if you ever bring her back damaged again, and I don't care whose fault it is, I don't care if she merely trips or if a meteor falls out the sky and hits her in the head. If you return her to me in less than perfect condition I left her in, you'll be running with three legs. Do you understand that, mongrel? Jacob rolled his eyes. I'll have broken his teeth for that alone. Who's going back, I muttered. Edward continued as if he hadn't heard me. And if you ever kiss her again, I will break your jaw for her, he promised, his voice still gentle and velvet and deadly. Why not do it now? He's already done it. He has already done it. He forced himself on Bella. Why not break his jaw now? It will just heal because he's got supernatural healing abilities. But why not put him through that pain now? Why not? Hmm? Everyone in this book is hopeless. One more thing, Edward said slowly. I'll be fighting for her too. There's no fight. She chose you. You should know that. I'm not taking anything for granted and I'll be fighting twice as hard as you will. Good, Jacob growled. It's no fun beating someone who forfeits. She is mine. Edward's low voice was suddenly dark, nor as composed as before. I didn't say I would fight fair. Neither did I. Well, clearly you don't, Jacob. You sexual assaulter. You sex offender. You pedo. Best of luck. Jacob nodded. Yes, may the best man win. Make your light 12. Shut up, you mug. Bella already made her choice at the end of the last book. Why does no one respect this? I'm sure Maya was absolutely creaming herself as she wrote this. Oh my God, two guys fighting over who has ownership over a girl. Ooh, ooh, I say. But there is nothing romantic about continuously ignoring someone's choices. Let's say the forced kiss didn't happen and it's just a guy obsessing over a girl who is in a relationship, constantly chasing after her and having no respect for her boundaries. You know that when that happens in real life, it rarely ends with a happy ending. I don't know why it's so prevalent in fiction. If they cheat with you they're probably gonna cheat on you there are exceptions there are exceptions don't think i've ever met any exceptions but i'm sure there are exceptions out there relationships aren't black and white there's always nuance etc etc but imagine looking back and that being your relationship that is how your relationship started and blossomed yeah you were in love with this other guy but i just did not stop until i wore you down and then you 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 snogged me and then we got together i mean what a great love story that's one to tell the grandkids isn't it better love story than this shit though i guess and as for the men dick swinging as if it's a competition there is zero competition she is so obsessed with edward and his marble cock is this meant to cause us to go oh my god conflict i wonder how it's going to end is she going to choose jacob is she going to choose edward no even if you went into this blind reading this for the first time ever you know she's going to end up with edward it is all she goes on about every single page bella is so obsessed with edward that any notion of there being a love triangle is laughable there's no love triangle for you to, right it's a young adult authors not understand how a love triangle works a love triangle right just to go like this like everyone has to like each other that's a love triangle so if it was between a, like you know two guys and a girl there'd be a bisexual element there too that's a love triangle or a woman caught between two guys has to like both men in that romantic sexual way Bella doesn't, and we'll get to the ending as well, because I'm not, uh, I am a little bit in love with you. I'm not convinced that's the case at all. And I'm very sure this Team Edward, Team Jacob, love triangle, tee -hee thing in Twilight influenced so many young adult books afterwards to always have this, this love triangle element. I mean, when Hunger Games come out, even that had a, at least in Hunger Games, she genuinely was torn between Peter and the other geezer not like this she's into edward not jacob jacob grimaced briefly and then he composed his face and leaned around edward to smile at me i glowered back i hope your hand feels better soon i'm really sorry you're hurt childishly i turned my face away from him are you joking mayor as if bella is the childish one here stop it they drive off to the cullen's house and bella has a bisexual panic edward drove around the house to the garage emma and rosalie were there Rosalie's perfect legs, recognisable even sheathed in jeans, were sticking out from the under the bottom of Emmett's huge jeep. Um, uh. Jasper and Emmett have a bet on on how many times Bella slips up in her first year of vampirism. I'm not being funny. In Breaking Dawn, 
she should have killed Jacob as soon as he pedophilically imprinted on her newborn jo- daughter. I'm not joking about that. I don't give a shit that he can't help it. It's just, and it is pedophilic. You can give me all that crap about he's like a brother to her. No, it's grooming as pedophilic because at the end, when Edward has accepted Jacob as like his son-in-law or whatever, Ren- Renesmee has the body of a seven-year-old. She's um, growing supernaturally, like supernaturally fast. And Edward reads Jacob's thoughts. They get told that Renesmee will reach full physical maturity in a few years because she's growing so fast. And Jacob thinks about that and starts getting excited in his thoughts. Edward hears his thoughts and is like, uh, will you stop? Because that's my daughter you're thinking that about. Whilst Renesmee has the body of like a seven-year-old or whatever, Jacob's already thinking about banging her in a few years time when like in three or so years time when she suddenly got the body of an 18-year-old, that is grooming. It is pedophilic. Like that's such a, who does that remind you of? Waiting until they're just of the legal age to then strike. Anision, come on. Edward and Bella should have killed him, not allow him to groom their child. I hate this series. Doesn't he also say, or was this just in the films? I can't remember this this was in the books, but regardless, it's said that, no, Renesmee chose Jacob. She chose him. How? She was an egg. Then she met, Edward's sperm, and then she became a fetus. The idea of a fetus choosing you, oh, the fetus chooses the werewolf, Mr. Potter, is laughable. And also, I'm so sure a paedophile would use that excuse. Hey, that 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 sexy five-year-old was coming on to me. No, I mean, that's something that Jimmy Savile would say. Come on. My hand was broken, but there wasn't any serious damage, just a tiny fissure in one knuckle. I didn't want to cast. And Carlisle said I'd be fine in a brace if I promised to keep it on. I promised. Oh, well, I suppose that's all right then. Whatever. Bella wonders about being a vampire. I'd always known that I would be different. I hoped that I would be as strong as Edward said I would be. Strong and fast, most of all, beautiful. Someone who could stand next to Edward and feel like she belonged there, we. Is she doing this just because she's insecure about how she looks? And she wants to look good enough for Edward. Is that why she wants to be a vampire, really? Can I judge? I do get filler after all. Filler, vampirism, same thing. Chapter 16, Epoch. Bella is complaining about having nothing to wear for the graduation ceremony. Alice swings by to give Bella something to wear. Besides constantly being under threat by the supernatural, her life is kind of easy. Bella has an epiphany. Aren't you going to open it? She asked. She sighed when I didn't move immediately and tugged the top of the box off herself. She pulled something out and held it up, but I couldn't concentrate on what it was. Pretty, don't you think? I picked blue because I know it's Edward's favorite on you. Oh, well, as long as it's Edward's favorite, God forbid it would be Bella's favorite color. Let's be real, Bella's favorite color is just whatever you like, Edward. Oh, these people. Bella works out that the same vampire who's creating the newborn army also stole her stuff. How have they not? Why did they think it was unrelated this entire time? I mean, what a coincidence. Someone is building a vampire army in Seattle. A unknown vampire also passes through Bella's room, steals her stuff, leaves their scent everywhere. How are they not connecting these dots? Edward had it wrong, I whispered. It was a test to see if it would work. If he could get in and out safely, as long as he didn't do anything you'd be watching out for, like trying to kill me. And he didn't take my things to prove he'd found me. He stole my scent so that others could find me. Brilliant, genius. I was through expecting my emotions to make sense anymore. As I processed the fact that somebody had created an army of vampires, the army that had gruesomely murdered dozens of people in Seattle for the express purpose of destroying me, I felt a spasm of relief. I've had enough of her. Part of it was finally solving that irritating feeling that I was missing something vital, but the larger part was something else entirely. I whispered, everyone can relax. Nobody's trying to exterminate the Cullens after all. Oh, look at how selfless she is. What contrived nonsense. She freaks out over stories, stories of people getting hurt. She should be shitting herself that a newborn army is on their way to kill her. She just has no self-preservation skills, does she? Uh, Instincts, urges. Alice leaves and Edward arrives and they go off to graduation together in the back of Charlie's police car, where they both belong. Bella, this is a big deal. You're graduating from high school. It's the real world for you now. College, living on your own. You're not my little girl anymore. Charlie choked up a bit at the end. Yeah, a little girl that you have zero paternal protection for unless it can be used to spite Edward. Shut up, Charlie. Do you know what saved Charlie's character? 
character being played by that person in the films because he was funny, weren't he? They take that bit out of the film, Charlie congratulating Jacob. I feel like they must have done. I feel like that just would not have gone over well at all. They get to the school and Jessica Stanley has been oddly nice to Bella. Maybe Bella is just an unreliable narrator and Jessica has been oddly nice this entire time. Edward kissed me quickly, sighed and went to stand with the C's. Alice wasn't there. What was she going to do? Skip graduation? What poor timing on my part. Alice has graduated dozens of times. I assure you it's not a big deal for her. Bella is constantly admonishing herself over tiny things. I suppose we're meant to find this selfless, but it just comes across as insecure. I heard Mr. Green call my name and I rose from my chair, waiting for the line in front of me to move. I was conscious of cheering in the back of the gym and I looked around to see Jacob pulling Charlie to his feet, both of them hooting in encouragement. I could just make out the top of Billy's head beside Jake's elbow. I managed to throw them an approximation of a smile. Why is he here and why has she clearly forgiven him already? Grow a spine. They graduate. Alice runs out as soon as she's done and Edward is confused. What was she thinking about anyway? To keep you out, I mean. His eyes flashed down to my face and narrowed in suspicion. She was translating the Battle Hymn of the Republic into Arabic, actually. When she finished that, she moved on to Korean Sign Language. They have so much limitless potential. They could do so much more with their lives than just go to high school endlessly. Bella tells Edward what's going on. His face had turned so white that I had a hard time finishing. But no one's coming for you, don't you see? This is good. Esme and Alice and Carlisle, no one wants to hurt them. His eyes were huge, wide with panic, dazed and horrified. He could see that I was right, just as Alice had. They are all vampires with super strength. Stop worrying about them. Worry about yourself. Jacob and Billy had to take off. Did you see that they were here? Charlie asked, taking a step back, but keeping his hands on my shoulders. He had his back to Edward, probably an effort to exclude him but that was fine at the moment. At this point, I'm really over Charlie's grudge against Edward and his love for a wolf boy who sexually assaulted his daughter. Since Edward changed his mind about the werewolves being okay, he's been on mm, semi-decent-ish behavior. I think this was done on purpose so Stephanie Mayer could minimize the amount of fans Team Jacob had. Charlie wants to go for dinner and Edward declines. Do you have plans with your parents? Charlie asked, a frown in his voice. Edward was always more polite than Charlie deserved. The sudden hostility surprised him. See how much changes in 300 pages. At the beginning, I was pro Charlie hating Edward. And now I'm pro anything annoying Charlie because he's a shit dad. What did I say? Charlie asked with a guilty expression. Don't worry about it, dad, I reassured him. I don't think it's you. Are you two fighting again? Nobody's fighting. Mind your own business. You are my business. Shut up, you assault apologist. They have dinner. Charlie chuckled. Well, you look really nice. I wish I thought to get you something. Sorry, don't be silly, dad. It's not silly. I feel like I don't always do everything for you that I should. Yeah, like break Jacob's teeth. I'd love to see Jacob heal some broken gnashes with his wolfy powers. Huh. He'd have to get crowns and then would get the last laugh because in 10 to 15 years, he'd have to have loads of root canals and stuff to deal with getting crowns. So there. That's ridiculous. You do a fantastic job. World's best dad. Please want more for yourself, Bella. How is this not a sarcastic statement? He snorted. Maybe, but I'm sure I slipped up in a few places. I mean, look at your hand. I stared down blankly at my hands. My left hand rested... Word proximity, say hand again. Rested lightly on the dark brace I rarely thought about. My broken knuckle didn't hurt much anymore. I never thought I needed to teach you how to throw a punch. Guess I was wrong about that. <laughs> My dad taught me how to throw punches when I was a child. He told me about the keeping your thumb out so you don't break your thumb. Told me that when I was young. And he also told me to always aim for the nuts. Now that is a dad of the year. I thought you were on Jacob's side. No matter what side I'm on, if someone kisses you without your permission, you should be able to make your feelings clear without hurting yourself. You didn't keep your thumb inside your fist, did you? Where the hell was this Charlie when he was busy congratulating Jacob for forcing himself upon Bella? Charlie laughed. Hit him in the gut next time. Next time, I asked incredulously. Ah, oh, don't be too hard on the kid. He's young. He's obnoxious. He's still your friend. You're in no obligation to stay in touch with anyone who treats you that way. And why is this reasoning big boys will just be boys mentality? I didn't come up with this. I saw someone say it once and I thought, yes, 100%. Us girls are told our entire childhoods and teenage years that boys mature slower, we mature faster. So we have to be the bigger people. We have to just let them off for stupid immature behavior. Let them get away with it. As if the onus is on us, as if it's our fault or responsibility that they mature slower. I did look this up earlier because I wanted to know, is it just an expression, just something people say, or, or is it 
an actual fact that girls do mature faster. It seems to be. Apparently, because of puberty, we physically develop faster. And yes, mentally, we do. Like The brain develops a bit faster when it comes to judgments, decision-making. That's how, apparently, I looked at a few different websites. Imagine a world where girls weren't told, let boys off, boys will be boys, they mature slower. This is your responsibility somehow. Imagine if it was flipped and boys were told, hey, girls mature faster, so you should look up to them. Should You should ask them for advice, look to them for guidance, act more like them, act more mature like girls. Imagine we would be living in utopia. There, I said it. Bella goes to a party. Chapter 17, Alliance. I'm going to bed. See you later, losers. Chapter 17, Alliance. Alice has turned the Cullens house into a nightclub somehow. Maybe that's one of her vampiric abilities. I don't know. Alice nodded seriously and started throwing the educational CDs into a box. I noticed that she had changed into a sequin tank top and red leather pants. Her bare skin reacted oddly to the pulsing red and purple lights. How is she not going to look like a disco ball? Bella is acting like a hostess because everyone else is intimidated by the Cullens and a good woman needs to know how to be the hostess with the mostess. Probably Alice had done this on purpose to force me into the center of attention, a place she thought I should enjoy more. She was forever trying to make me be human the way she thought humans should be. Can Bella not live her life the way she wants to please. Jacob arrives at the party. I don't know why no one likes you. Go away. Jacob was waving at me, calmer than the others, although his nose was wrinkled in disgust. I waved back, waved goodbye, and turned to look for Alice. I squeezed through a space between Connor's and Lauren's back. He came out of nowhere, his hand on my shoulder pulling me back towards the shadow by the kitchen. I ducked under his grip, but he grabbed my good wrist and yanked me from the crowd. Does Maya think this is okay? Does she think this is romantic? The constant manhandling and pulling around that Jacob does to Bella, it's even worse than how much the vampires used to manhandle her in Twilight. They did, didn't they? Whatever. All this time, I thought Edward was the worst, but I was wrong. I concede. I admit when I'm wrong and I was wrong. The worst character in this book undeniably is Jacob. This is what I thought 57 pages into this. At page 100, I knew for certain Jacob was the worst. And it's weird because apparently, I, like I did a lot of research on this, apparently Jacob is one of Stephanie Mayer's favorite characters. So I, I don't even wanna think about what goes on in her head. She's on crack. At least Edward was a mopey emo incel from the moment we met him. Jacob was actually all right in the beginning and he had potential and he was fine in most of New Moon before becoming this possessive, assaulting douchebag. And I know it just gets worse in the next one when he becomes a nonce and then he also gets possessive of Renesmee when she's a baby as well. Like he tries to stop Bella from holding her own kid which is whatever. Maya, this is awful, congratulations. I pulled my hand free and scowled at him. What are you doing here? You invited me, remember? In case my right hook was too subtle for you, let me translate. That was me uninviting you. Don't be a poor sport. I brought you a graduation present and everything. It's not even Bella's house, so I think the Cullens deserve a say in whether they want werewolves to come over, you know, on the whole like sworn enemies thing. How is it fair that the Cullens can't go over the treaty lines, but a bunch of werewolves can just come into their house? He put his hand under my... So much changes. So much change from the beginning of this to the end of it. Anyway, he put his hand under my chin and pulled my face up. Could I please just have a few seconds of your undivided attention, Miss Swan? I jerked away from his touch. Keep your hands to yourself, Jacob. He is still doing this behavior. I'm flitting between hating Smeyer, Steph Mayer for writing such crap and also being concerned that she thinks this is just normal and okay behavior. Is it just she likes Jacob so much she's willing for him to never have responsibility for his weird like boundary skipping actions? Does she just think this is what blokes act like so you just have to let him act like it because they're going to regardless which is a complete fallacy? What? I don't know but it's annoying me. I hate the character of Jacob Black. So much more than that I hated the other people in these books. I think it's because he's so arrogant about everything he does and it's... What is that? A pterodactyl? I don't know what just happened. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I just find really arrogant characters who have zero redeemable qualities very hard to read. Like if they're gonna be complete twats, they have to at least be funny. That's the golden rule for me. 
do whatever, at least be funny. There's certainly a lot of characters in fiction I like who have done undeniably bad things, like Negan in The Walking Dead. He's done a bunch of bad things. <laughs> <laughs> Easy peasy lemon squeezy. This is the kind of thing that just tickles my balls. <sighs> He's still this really good, complex, compelling character. What is going on out there? Have I like been transported back to the Triassic era or whenever it was. I've never heard that noise in my life. But he's funny, he's compelling, he has justifications for the way he's acted. It's also not excused. He, spoiler alert, gets sent to like a makeshift prison for several years because of the things he did. Jacob, maybe favoritism on Smeyer's part, gets away with absolutely everything. Spoiler alert, not really. So I just hate him. Sorry, he said at once, holding his hands up in surrender. I really am sorry. About the other day, I mean, too. I shouldn't have kissed you like that. It was wrong. I guess, well, I guess I deluded myself into thinking you wanted me to. Deluded, what a perfect description. Be nice. You could accept my apology, you know. You aren't owed, like, someone to accept your apologies. <laughs> People don't need. You can say sorry. People don't need to accept your apologies. It is so hard doing these videos about saying the stronger word for flip. So hard. I gave up with the script in the end. And it's just the amount of F-bombs you littered throughout and I'm gonna have to get creative when I get to those parts. Fine, apology accepted. Now if you just excuse me for a moment. Okay, he mumbled and his voice was so different from before that I stopped searching for Alice and scrutinized his face. He was staring at the floor, hiding his eyes. Oh, Jacob's throwing himself a little pity party. Oh, room for one. Mm. His lower lip jutted out just a little bit. I guess you'd be, I guess you'd rather be with your real friends, he said in the same defeated tone. I get it. Because he's not getting what he wants, he then successfully begins emotionally manipulating Bella, who falls for it because she's, I feel like this is a personal vendetta against me. I feel like this book series is just about me. 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 I feel like Maya wrote this deliberately to piss me off. Jacob gives Bella a present. He carved her a tiny wolf attached to a bracelet. He smiled happily at first, but then the expression soured. Well, I figured that maybe it would make you remember me once in a while. You know how it is, out of sight, out of mind. I ignored the attitude. Here, help me put it on. Why is she friends with him? He is such a douchebag. Even if you take away all the other crap, he is just such a douchebag continuously. They were only friends for like a few months in New Moon. It's just not, whatever. Jacob can tell something's wrong with Bella, but she won't say. Jacob stared at me for one short moment and then turned to catch his pack brother's eyes where they stood in the entry, awkward and uncomfortable. When they took in his expression, they started moving, weaving their way agilely through the partiers, almost like they were dancing too. What stupid imagery. Everyone's always just dancing and <laughs> stupid, shut up. In half a minute, they stood on either side of Jacob, towering over me. Now, explain. Embry and Quill looked back and forth between our faces, confused and wary. Jacob, I don't know everything. I kept searching the room, now for a rescue. They had me backed into a... What is that? What if it's a bird that's genuinely in danger? Should I go help? Like a vegan superhero? I feel like nature needs me right now. One second. I can't see what's going on. And if it's not picking up the microphone, I'm going to look a bit odd. I kept searching the room now for a rescue. They had backed me into a corner in every sense. What you do know then. They all folded their arms across their chests at exactly the same moment. It was a little bit funny, but mostly menacing. So they try to intimidate her into telling them what's going on. Bearing in mind, like because they're super wolfy jeans, all these guys are like six foot seven or something. So we love to see that. Alice comes to the rescue. I need to talk to you, she murmured into my ear. Uh, Jake, I'll see you later, I mumbled as we eased around them. Jacob threw his long arm out to block our way, bracing his hand against the wall. Hey, not so fast. Alice stared up at him, her eyes wide and incredulous. Excuse me? I love it when men throw their weight around to block women from leaving or doing anything. And also it's Alice's house. He is so rude. I don't care that he doesn't like vampires. He just has zero manners. You at least be polite. Tell us what's going on, he demanded in a growl. Jasper appeared quite literally out of nowhere. One second it was just Alice and me against the wall, Jacob blocking our exit, and then Jasper was standing on the other side of Jake's arm, his expression terrifying. Luckily, another man appears to protect the Whammon folk, because Alice 
can't do anything. Now would be a good time for Jasper to relive his newborn days. Alice tells them that the newborns are coming to Forks. The noise of the party overwhelmed the sound of my denial. All around us, my friends and neighbors and petty enemies ate and laughed and swayed to the music, oblivious to the fact that they are about to face horror, danger, maybe death because of me. She's such an attention seeker. It's not her fault that Victoria is so unhinged. She created a newborn army in the first place to kill Bella with, to avenge her boyfriend who tried to kill Bella in the first place. And besides, Edward didn't even kill James. It was Edward's brothers, Jasper and Emmett, who tried to kill James. So why Victoria isn't trying to kill Alice and Rosalie? Well, because she's a wimp and she doesn't want to take on a bunch of vampires. She figures she'll just go for the human. But even so, the way that Bella has been made the focal point of attention, even though it's just not consistent with what actually happened at the end of the first book. So Bella can be like, this is all my fault. It's like, if someone came up to me, like, if, if I, if I like was a bit rude to someone in the street and then they turned around and stabbed me, that's still like, that's a disproportionate response. It's not my fault, is it? You know, like they, they've made that choice. Victoria is making this conscious choice to be a maniac. Jacob decides the wolf pack will help defend Bella and Forks against the newborn vampire army. Chapter 18, introduction. They'd all reassured me. Alice was reaching up to pat my head as I left. It's an odd thing to do to an adult, but okay. I don't think anyone has ever patted me on the head. Maybe this is their hand. If they did, bit weird, but okay. Bella feels bad. What else is new? Smeyer, change the record. That the wolves and the Cullens will fight the newborns. What is going on? <laughs> Bella wants to go to the secret meeting that the Cullens are having with the werewolves to discuss strategies and tactics. He frowned. This is an experiment. This is Edward talking. I'm not sure if it would be possible for all of us to cooperate. I don't want you in the middle of that. As if that didn't make me feel all the more anxious to go. If you won't take me, then I'll call Jacob. His eyes tightened. That was a low blow and I knew it, but there was no way I was being left behind. Yeah, I'll go with the guy who harasses me and sex pests me at every chance he gets. Bella is at home from the party with Edward. He was still radiating relief. Nobody but me cared if Jacob and his friends got hurt. Yeah, same, I don't care either, mate. He could tell I was about to lose it. Listen to me, Bella, this is going to be easy. The newborns will be completely taken by surprise. They'll have no more idea that werewolves even exist than you did. Victoria knows about the werewolves though, because she's been chased by them many times. How have they not put two and two together and realized that Victoria is behind this yet? Some geniuses are just seen off a mile off coming. Even when the fight happens at the end, I'm still not sure if the newborns are surprised by the presence of werewolves, who knows? They go to the secret meeting. It took me a minute because it was so dark with the moon hidden behind the clouds, but I realized that we were in the baseball clearing. It was the same place where more than a year ago, how was this like, whole series only a year and a bit ago? The first lighthearted evening with the Cullens had been interrupted by James and his coven. Bella has finally worked out that Victoria is connected to the newborns. When will our guests arrive? Carlisle asked Edward. Edward concentrated for a moment and then sighed, a minute and a half, but I'm going to have to translate. They don't trust us enough to use their human forms. Carlisle nodded. This is hard for them. I'm grateful they're coming at all. I stared at Edward, my eyes stretched wide. They're coming as wolves? <sighs> Her reactions are so like, annoying to things. Like, you hang out with vampires all the time. What's a bunch of big dogs? Get over. He nodded, cautious of my reaction. I swallowed once, remembering the two times I'd seen Jacob in his wolf form. The first time in the meadow of Lauren, the second time on the forest lane where Paul had gotten angry at me. They were both memories of terror. The werewolves arrive and there's more of them, at least 10. Edward translates for the werewolves. The newborns will arrive in four days, so Jasper shows the Cullens and the wolves how to kill the newborns. Again, Emma insisted, his smile gone. It's my turn, Edward protested. My fingers tensed around his. They just want to play fight for a demonstration. I don't understand why she's so highly strung. I would feel offended if I was these vampires. She's constantly just like, like fussing over them. They're vampires, they're, they're made of rock, they're fine. Made of rock. They're basically Pokemon, they're Geodudes. Alice closed her eyes. My heart thumped unevenly as Jasper stalked towards where Alice stood. Bella should see a therapist for this level of anxiety. I'm not team Edward or team Jacob. I am team get therapy, get help. Like, why is she such a warrior? Of course, the way Alice fights slash avoids attacks is like a dance. It's just so graceful. Everything these, these Cullens do is just so graceful. La-di-da. Alice joins Bella. <sighs> I already took a break. 
to eat food. And then I rung my mom for like an hour to just yell about things. But then we started discussing this and what I'm doing this time. Oh my God, there's like crumbs all over this. Oh, you can't see. It's fine. Just put those crumbs on the floor. My boyfriend won't watch this, so he won't know that I've got crumbs everywhere because he doesn't watch my long content. Hmm. We were just talking about this book in particular and I was just, yeah, I, I'll go into it, but there's moments of self-awareness within the text and it's like, so Maya knows what she's written, but, but why write it though? We'll get into it more later. And my mum was just kind of like, well, she's made a million, she's made her money. And I was like, no, absolutely not. It's look, I've never met Stephanie Mayer. I don't think I've ever even seen her talk in an interview, but I'll be damned if I don't know her. And it is not about the money for Stephanie Mayer. This book is not about the series is not about the money. Firstly, she got the idea because she had a horny dream about like a good looking vampire and a girl in the field. But secondly, to paraphrase the end of Breaking Dawn part two, when Bella's talking to Edward in the meadow, she's like, now you know, nobody's loved anything as much as I've loved you. Nobody has loved anything as much as Stephanie Mayer loves this story. The fact that there is a, there's a twilight redux of the first book where she basically rewrote the first book, but gender swapped Bella and Edward. So it's something, I don't know names. It's, it's like Beaufort or whatever. I'm sure I'll get to doing, reviewing that one eventually. She wrote fan fiction of her own novel. There is like a forever dawn where there's only like three copies in existence. The original Breaking Dawn floating around, like one's at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. I am going to go with my fur fly and now I'm going to go out there and find that copy and read it so I can just roast it on this channel. I will give her that at the very least, that she genuinely loves these stories to a point where it is delusional. Have you seen on her website where she writes about the, the process behind writing New Moon, where she said, okay, there's such a thing as when you're writing a story, not that I'd know because I've never bloody completed one, but the characters, you're telling the story initially and then the characters, hopefully, you breathe enough life into them that they start telling the story themselves. Like Stephen King has it, he'll come up with an idea and then the characters, all this stuff, right? I get that. The way Maya talks about Edward though. Edward came to her and was like, Maya, I have to leave and I have to go. And she was begging him like, no, please don't go Edward, please don't go. And he was like, I have to. And then that's how she wrote New Moon. That is delusional. It is psychotic. It is like pure nonsense. And I love it. And I respect that. I, I do respect the grind and just how much she loves these flawed, stupid stories. <laughs> it's like the cast duo of the House of Night series. 12 main series books, four extra main series spin-off books following Zoe when she's 18, four novellas outside of Zoe's story, and four kind of extracurricular vampire handbook 101, the mythology behind the House of Night. I don't like those books, but I, res I will respect where respecters do. I cannot fault them for their bloody productivity. Imagine if I had that much productivity, I would be ruling this world by now. I don't remember the point of my run other than, look, I may say a lot of stuff like, shut up, Mayor, shut up, Mayor. And I do believe that and I stand by it, but not, I'm not begrudging about the fact that like, I do respect how much she loves her own stories. I'm not that cynical. I wish there was something that I loved as much as Stephanie Mayer loves Twilight. <laughs> Anyway, if I had that much like belief and faith in my own writing ability, then I would have written some books there. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? So I don't begrudge her for that. I respect it in a weird way. I would love to get inside her head though, because of these flashes of self-awareness. I would love to just, just ask her like, why the character Jacob, why? Why did you mutilate him beyond redemption? Why? Bless her. Where was I anyway? Something about them all play fighting. Alice joins Bella as Edward play fights. I'll warn him if your plans get any more defined, she threatened in the, oh, threatening. I'll warn him if your plans get, dee, 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 dee. I'll warn him if your plans get any more defined, she threatened in the same low murmur. It doesn't help anything for you to put yourself in danger. Do you think either of them would just give up if you died? They'd still fight? We all would. You can't change anything. So just be good, okay? It's hot in here. The pterodactyl stopped screeching, so there is that. Maybe it got portal back to the, I don't know, Jurassic era or wherever the hell it came from. It's so hot, if I open those doors, oh God. Oh God, this is how I die, cooked to death in my own 
oven. Bella is pathetic. She is so intent on having herself die for no reason. She reminds me of that girl whose name escapes me from Divergent, which I'll cover that one too. Don't you guys worry. The ending of, I, I read Divergent, all of it in a few days just because I was bored probably. I spend most of my life being bored, trying to got, like grasp onto anything to give me distraction from the futility of this existence. The ending of Divergent I found as in the actual trilogy ending, so incredibly pointless. I couldn't believe I'd wasted my time reading the entire thing. Spoiler alert. What's her face? Just, what is her, what is her name? Four? No, that's the boy. Seven, who knows? I don't think, it's noble. There's such thing as having like a heroic noble death, of course, especially in fiction, but I don't see what's so noble uh, about dying for a cause when you're constantly looking for any old excuse to be knocked off. Bella is always thinking of ways to sacrifice herself for what she deems as the greater good, but she does it so much it kind of takes away the nobility of it. At one point is it you're trying to sacrifice yourself to protect the ones you love or I think maybe you need therapy and you need to work on your self-esteem. It's that girl in Divergent, she was constantly looking for any old way to go out. Anyway, everyone took turns. Carlisle, then Rosalie, Esme, and Emmett again. I squinted through my lashes, cringing as Jasper attacked Esme. That one was the hardest to watch. The wolves sniffed the Cullens to learn their scent. What a sentence. What a savings. Bella sees Jacob as a wolf. The wolf's muzzle fell open, pulling back over his teeth. It would have been a frightening expression, except that his tongue lolled out the same side in a wolfy grin. I giggled. Is this flirting in front of her boyfriend? Bella gives Jacob a stroke. No, not like that, you filthy perverts. The fur was both soft and rough and warm against my skin. I ran my fingers through it curiously, learning the texture, stroking his neck where the color deepened. I hadn't realized how close I'd gotten. Without warning, Jacob suddenly licked my face from chin to hairline. Sorry, why does he get a pass for that just because he's kind of in the form of a giant dog? Imagine Jacob, the human, just licking Bella like, mm, you know, like slobbering all over her face in front of her future in-laws and her future husband and all of his his mates, to, these shameless, all of them, classless. It was at that point that I realized that everyone was watching us, the Cullens and the werewolves, the Cullens with perplexed and somewhat disgusted expressions. It was hard to read the wolves' face. It's, I thought Sam looked unhappy. I'm embarrassed for all of them, but I'm most embarrassed for Bella. How, this is not acceptable. You have a boyfriend, stop letting wolf boys lick your face. And then there was Edward, on edge and clearly disappointed. I'm not surprised, like you're, just, you're his girlfriend and you're licking, letting some bloke lick your face, so weird. I realized he'd been hoping for a different reaction from me, like screaming and running away in terror. Why? I get it, they're wolves, but they're also just big dogs, so who cares? Like, is Maya afraid of dogs or something? Because she's really trying to sell the idea that these giant dogs with human minds, and those humans themselves are predominantly protectors of humanity. She's trying to push this idea that they're really scary. I wouldn't find that scary. I'd be like, that is sick, bruv, what are you saying? Maybe I'm just the odd one out, I don't know. My favorite Digimon was always Gururumon. So I thought, oh, that's cool. Like, I like dogs. I like animals, but I like dogs. I wouldn't be scared by this. Pfft. Not baby. Jacob turns into a human to talk to them whilst the other wolves leave. Jacob wants Bella to stay in La Push whilst the fight with the newborns happen, probably so he can just harass her for the duration. Edward argues that Bella's scent is everywhere, so Jacob wants to disguise her scent with his because vampires instinctively don't like the wolf scent. I stared at his open arms suspiciously. You're going to have to let him carry you, Bella, Edward told me. His voice was calm, but I could hear the subdued distaste. I frowned. Jacob rolled his eyes impatient and reached down to yank me up into his arms. Don't be such a baby, he muttered. Is Maya's kink women being yanked around and manhandled? They walk around. You can put me down now. I don't want to take a chance of messing up the experiment. His walk slowed and his arms tightened. You are so annoying, I muttered. Or is Maya's kink men never respecting women's choices? They decide that Bella will leave a false trail to a clearing to entice the newborns, to shack them, to have them head off. I felt sick. How could they be so eager for this? How could I stand having both of them in danger? I couldn't. I wouldn't. Shut up, bruv, you mug. Jasper suggests using Bella as actual bait in the clearing because he is based, but Edward cries, so unfortunately for us that won't happen. Chapter 19. Chapter. Chapter 19. Chapter. 
Good one, dum dum. Oh wait, maybe it actually it's called chapter. Chapter 19, selfish, not chapter. Edward carried me home in his arms, expecting that I wouldn't be able to hang on. I must have fallen asleep on the way. She's like his child. That's it. Infantilization is Maya's king. Bella slept all day. Edward notices her gift from Jacob. Drama, drama alert. Don't you think it's fair then? He asked, looking down at my hand as he spoke. He turned it palm up and ran his finger along the veins in my wrist. If I have a little representation? Representation? A charm, something to keep me on your mind. Edward and Jacob are both one step away from just pissing all over Bella. You're in every thought I have. I don't need reminders. Edward, it's true. Please, I beg, I can just show you these books. It's true. His eyes narrowed. Everyone else is able to get away with giving you things. Everyone but me. I would have loved to get you a graduation present, but I didn't. I knew it would have upset you more than anything. Nope. I knew it would have upset you more than if anyone else did. I knew it would have upset... The... I knew... I knew... I knew... I knew... I knew it would have upset you more than if anyone else did. That's utterly unfair. How do you explain yourself? Easy, I shrugged. You're more important than everyone else and you've given me you. That's already more than I deserve and anything else you just give me just throws us more out of balance. He processed that for a moment and then rolled his eyes. The way you regard me is ludicrous. With that final sentence, I'm team Edward. Well, <laughs> there's definitely something wrong with her. <laughs> yeah, that... That happened. Alice rings Edward to warn him that Bella wants to be live bait for the fledglings. Wrong book. They argue about it. Edward drops a bombshell that Jacob is second in command in the pack. I don't know why this is a bot. Like, who cares? That's only because Jacob's granddad is a frame black. More example of nepotism at work. I got a fascinating look into the pack's mind last night. It was better than a soap opera. I had no idea how complex the dynamic is with such a large pack. The pull of the individual against the plural psyche. Absolutely fascinating. This is the book I want to read. Maya, if you're watching this, write this book, a werewolf soap opera. A werewolf soap opera, akin to a turn of the century, 19th century Russian soap opera. I'm thinking, Tolstoy, I'm thinking Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky, right, rewriting Twilight. Oh, that would be so dramatic, that'd be so good. It's one of my favorite authors, by the way, The Idiot. It's one of my favorite books. In case you do, in case you watch these videos and think, gosh, she complains about literally everything. What books does she actually like? Uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, The Idiot. I've read Crime and Punishment, I like it, but it's something about The Idiot I like more because it basically is a 19th century Russian soap opera and everyone's very like dramatic and I just enjoy that. And also Kazuo Ishiguro's book, Never Let Me Go, ruined my life. Don't read it, but you have to. It's a classic, it's incredible, it's incredible. Those are the types of books I like. And Anything by Stephen King, even if he's always on about honkers. One of the wolves, from the previous night is Leah Clearwater, the first female werewolf. She really got the short end of the stick in these books. Her boyfriend, her love of her life, her high school sweetheart, falls in love with her cousin and her cousin says no initially, but then says screw it and dates him just because he's like obsessed with her and nice with her and whatever. Well, actually he's not even, I, I, I'm I, sure I mentioned this later on, but he's not even nice to her. He literally mauls her. He mauls her and then she's like, oh, I guess I love you now. It's so stupid. And now she, a woman, is a werewolf where all of her thoughts can be heard by the pack when they're in wolf form, but everyone in the pack is basically an immature teenage boy all of them maybe maybe sam isn't oh yeah and she's also in this pack and the leader is sam said x who ditched her for this uh like sure they can't help the imprint but that cousin could have helped dating him just saying and if memory serves she doesn't get a, a resolution or whatever she's just treated very poorly like the whole pack doesn't like her um oh she's moody yeah well you think you think? Oh, I know, he said. The imprinting compulsion is one of the strangest things I've ever witnessed in my life. And I've seen some strange things. He shook his head wonderingly. The way Sam is tied to his Emily is impossible to describe. Or should I say her Sam? Sam really had no choice. It reminds me of a Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm, all right, Maya, we get it, you read books. Wait, no. Maya's kink is definitely people having choice taken away from them. Free will not existing. <sighs> Screw it. If all the flies come in to be attracted by my big light, worth it, I'm not cooking anymore, can't be bothered. I will just become the Lord of the Flies. Like Lord of the Dance, but more unhygienic. Yeah, that's right. I know what tap dancing is. 
I know who Michael Flatley is. I'm well cultured. <laughs> Leah is making all the other werewolves miserable by constantly thinking of things that they don't want to deal with. What's with Embry? I asked, surprised. His mother moved down from the Mecca reservation 17 years ago when she was pregnant with him. She's not Quill Ute. Everyone assumed she'd left his father behind in the Maccas. But then he, Embry, joined the pack. So, <laughs> shut up, Bella, you mug. So, the prime candidates for his father are Quill Ataria Sr., Joshua Yuli, or Billy Black. All of them married at that point, of course. No, I gasped. Edward was right. This was exactly like a soap opera. Love that. Love this bit. Good for Maya. Anyway, Bella wants to either be in the clearing or with Edward. So she emotionally manipulates Edward by reminding him that she went crazy when he left and she can't bear to see him leave her again, even if it's only for an hour or so. Gaslight, girl boss, gatekeep. I'm so proud of her. For once, she's being proactive so proud of her she wants edward to stay away from the fighting alice he sighed could you come babysit bella for a bit one excellent choice of words there who's the third wife he asked me suddenly huh i said stalling i didn't remember having had that dream again you were mumbling something about the third wife last night oh um yeah that was just one of the stories that i heard at the bonfire the other night i shrugged i guess it stuck with me maya has zero subtlety she could have omitted this part and trusted her audience to make a parallel between bella's decision near the end of the third wife story but no we have to be spoon fed because we're all big dum-dums <laughs> <laughs> I was entirely presentable when Charlie got home. Fully dressed, hair decent, and in the... <laughs> fully dressed, hair decent, and in the kitchen, putting his dinner on the table. If this line had zero context, it would sound like Charlie was her husband, and this was written in 1940. Alice clears with Charlie that Bella will be staying with her whilst everyone else goes hiking. But Alice will actually be hunting with them to get ready for the big, you know, hoo-ha whilst Edward stays behind. I thought about that briefly. No Charlie listening downstairs, checking on me every so often. No household of wide awake vampires with their intrusively sensitive hearing. Just him and me, really alone. I mean, technically it should be just he and I, shouldn't it? Isn't that more, you know? And secondly, she wants to do it. They go to the clearing again at night to train more. Jacob ignored him, his dark eyes on me. He put his head down to my level as he had yesterday, cocking it to one side. A low whimper escaped his muzzle. It's amazing how he's become one with dog. Absently, I began pulling my fingers through the fur on his neck. That same strange humming sound that he'd made yesterday rumbled in his throat. It was a homey kind of sound, rougher. <laughs> Hey, homie. <laughs> that was horrible. That's my Simpson. That's horrible. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> no, stop it. Rougher, wilder than a cat's purr, but conveying the same sense of contentment. Furries everywhere are popping semis right now. It's just more of the same Bella anxiety about the upcoming battle, so I'm skipping for out because it's boring and I want to save time. Chapter 20, compromise. Everything is ready for the newborn fight. Alibi is ready. The... Mm. that's it i suppose charlie is staying in la push with billy one piece because there were some things that had not changed and that included the desperate way i loved him i'd had plenty of time to think through the ramifications of jasper and emmett's bet to figure out the things i was willing to lose with my humanity and the parts that i was not willing to give up i knew which human experience i was going to insist on before i became inhuman she wants to lose her virginity bella is at the cullen's house with edward alone. He was back before I'd taken a step, but I ignored him and went to the huge gold bed, plopping down on the edge and then sliding to the center. I curled up in a ball, my arms wrapped around my knees. Okay, I grumbled. Now that I was where I wanted to be, I could afford a little reluctance. Let me have it. Edward gifts her a heart-shaped crystal for her bracelet, a hand-me-down from his human mother. Anything to upstage Jacob. I leaned into him, ducking my head under his arm and cuddling into his side. It probably felt similar to snuggling with Michelangelo's David, except that this perfect marble creature wrapped his arms around me to pull me closer. Yeah, whenever I see Michelangelo's David, I'm always wondering how snuggly he is. I would not trust Stephanie Mayer in a museum full of statues. And that's all I'm saying. Bella starts negotiations for her virginity i bit my lip and just like that 50 shades of gray was born my hands were slightly shaky as i unlocked my arms from around his neck my fingers slid down his neck to the collar of his shirt the trembling didn't help as i tried to hurry to undo the buttons before he stopped me his lips froze and i could almost hear the click in his head as he put together my words and my actions he pushed me away at once his face heavily disapproving be reasonable bella ha get wrecked we're not having this discussion he glared at me while he refastened the two buttons i'd managed to open my teeth clamped together 
I say we are, I growled. I moved my hands to my blouse and yanked open the top bone. Imagine like Bella Swan. Imagine like imagine Kristen Stewart in there. Come on. See, I'm in two minds about this because on one hand, he is trying to control her sexuality. Of course he is. He's like this bloke from another century and Maya's a good Mormon. And, you know, religious understands all this kind of stuff. But on the flip side, he could snap her neck with his little finger. Don't know why he doesn't. And if you really want to get into it, and I do, his boner could do some serious damage. One wrong move and he would puncture her cervix. I do think she is a dumbass for wanting to have sex with a vampire while she is still human. I can't believe I'm going to have this conversation here. But there's this big significance in, I want to say media, but I also do want to say American media as well maybe because like a lot of the media we get is imported from america it's just something that i've noticed anyway so i don't think it's unfair to say there's this big significance in media and american media on having penetrative sex as if that is the be or end all that's like the place to go i don't know if i've mentioned this on my channel before but there is a book called all american girl i think it's by meg Cabot. it's for teenage girls and in this it's a it's a it's the one where it's a sequel and she's at Camp David and, and stuff. She, this teenager, I think she's 17 or 18 or something. She really wants to have sex with her boyfriend and she's getting her, the whole book is she's getting prepared for it. Is she ready to like, you know, make this leap into adulthood and do this kind of stuff, coming of age type of thing, right? Um, but all they've done is had some snogging sessions, some pretty heavy snogging sessions, but that's all they've done. And, you know, I know it's a book for teenage girls, so it's not going to be graphic and talk about the other stuff that you can do outside of just pure pe penetration. But it's just something that I've noticed within like a lot of books and a lot of, a lot of films and stuff. Like there is several steps you can, you can take before penetration and you, it might be wise to take those steps so you can be more ready for... I don't want to be too graphic because I don't want to get too much I start as well so I don't want to have this conversation with my audience, this sex education conversation. Like, if, if your vagina has never had anything in it and then suddenly you've got a penis inside it and you're not prepared because you've never, like, had anything... If that would be like a bit, of a, a bit of a shock. That's why you should experiment. And there's steps to take before penetration. And penetration isn't the ultimate act of like doing sex anyway. And, you know, for like a lot of women, maybe most women, they can't even orgasm to penetration. I think it's the majority of women can't. They need the other stuff done. My point is, Bella and Edward barely even kiss with tongues, but she's ready to just throw down and have his granite pee pee inside her. She wants his literal rock hard penis to rock her world. I think it's just a bit OTT and a bit daft to be honest. Anyway, Bella's feelings are now hurt that Edward won't take her to pound town then and there. You know why I had to say no, he murmured. You know that I want you too. Do you? I whispered, my voice full of doubt. Of course I do, you silly, beautiful, oversensitive girl. He laughed once and then his voice was bleak. Doesn't everyone? I feel like there's a line behind me, jockeying for position, waiting for me to make a big enough mistake. You're too desirable for your own good. Who's being silly now? I doubted if awkward, self-conscious and inept added up to desirable in anyone's book. Most of the male population in Forks does want to bang her though, so I find her faux humility insincere. Insincere, why do I trouble with that? Bella's argument is that she will be physically different as a newborn, not the same Bella. That's why she wants to have sex now. I don't really understand what kind of argument that is. Every day you wake up a little bit different as your brain catalogs and stores the information you learned yesterday. Every day you wake up with a slightly different perspective on stuff. We're all constantly in a change of flights. We're like rivers of water. Who cares? What a flimsy reason. Oh, I'll be a bit physically different. Like she acknowledges that mentally she'll still be Bella, but physically, because she'll be wanting blood and stuff. Whatever. Bella, I could kill you, he whispered. I don't think you could. And thus her tombstone read, death by being dicked down the end. That would absolutely be a metal way to go though, just saying. Edward demonstrates how strong he is by crushing a metal rose from his bed frame into dust easily. Obviously not that you aren't physically able to hurt me if you wanted to, more that you don't want to hurt me, so much so that I don't think you ever could. He started shaking his head before I was done. It might not work like that, Bella. Might, I scoffed. You have no more idea what you're talking about than I do. Exactly. Do you imagine I would ever take that kind of risk with you? <sighs> Why did I write this? 
Imagine he got carried away for a second and screwed her into a pile of dust. The post-nut clarity on that would be intense. For real though, he is being the adult in this, situ in this situation, I'm just saying. Anyway, Edward gives her an ultimatum. He says that Bella will have to marry him first and then he can bash her back doors in. Then they get engaged, wahoo. Wait, no, I mean boo, boo. Edward, run away, you can do so much better. Never thought I'd say that. I shook my head and laughed glumly. You make me feel like a villain in a melodrama, twirling my mustache while I try to steal some poor girl's virtue. His eyes were wary as they flashed across my face. Then he quickly ducked down to press his lips against my collarbone. That's it, isn't it? The short laugh that escaped me was more shocked than amused. You're trying to protect your virtue. I covered my mouth with my hand to muffle the giggle that followed. The words were so old fashioned. I'm screaming into the abyss as I chuck myself head first into it. Let me ask you something, he interrupted quickly. We've had this discussion before, but humor me. How many people in this room have a soul, a shot at heaven or whatever there is after this life? Two, I answered immediately, my voice fierce. All right, maybe that's true. Now, there's a world full of dissension about this, but the vast majority seem to think that there are some rules that have to be followed. The Mormon propaganda in this, I absolutely can't. Like, I'm sure if there is a, if there is a creator of the universe, they're probably not that fussed about like what we're, we're doing sex-wise. I think that's a very human projection. And I, as I said before, I'm agnostic. I think it's a bit arrogant to assume either way. <laughs> Fence sitter, ooh. Enlightened centrist, not really. But yes, I'm agnostic. But I just don't buy that if there is some sort of greater awareness, greater consciousness out there, they're gonna be like, what are you putting your dick into? Yeah, to judge on this type of thing, is a, it's a, that's a human emotion. You don't see dogs going around judging each other for licking each other's bums, do you? I wonder if the werewolves ever like just give in to their instincts and sniff each other's butts. The same principle applies. The only difference is that this is the one area in which I'm just as spotless as you are. Can't I leave one rule unbroken? One? You know that I've stolen, I've lied, I've coveted. My virtue is all I have left. He grinned crookedly. I, look, I mean, I see his point. He just wants to hedge his bets a little bit. <laughs> He raised one eyebrow at me and I knew why. What did it matter what they said about me when I'll be leaving soon and not coming back? Was I really so oversensitive that I couldn't bear a few weeks of sidelong glances and leading questions? Maybe it wouldn't bug me so much if I didn't know that I would probably be gossiping just as condescendingly as the rest of them if it was someone else getting married this summer. One rule for thee, another for me. So elitist. Edward interrupted my fretting. It doesn't have to be a big production. I don't need any fanfare. You ain't have to tell anyone or make any changes. We'll go to Vegas. You can wear old jeans and we'll go to the chapel with the drive through window. What? <laughs> you can get like a drive through marriage in Vegas? That's... Oh no, what's that? what's happening? Am I dying? I feel like someone just shoved a needle in my eye. God, is that you? Do you care about where our bits go? I just want it to be official, that you belong to me and no one else. Is he feeling threatened by a puppy? Because he really shouldn't be. I understand what he's trying to say. She is his love. He is her love. We belong to each other, our souls slot in together like peanut butter and jam, like... Don't I really? No. Don't I? I understand the gist of what he's saying. I get it, I understand it, right? But there's a more romantic way of saying these things that don't come across as totally possessive. Maybe that's Maya's kink, being possessed like in a Ouija board. I am renaming this video, the new title, Work in Progress, a clips in which I try to discover Stephanie Maya's kink, a video essay by me, Elise Yeezy, the Elise Yeezy story, screenplay written by Elise Yeezy, colon, don't I. Edward has a ring, so Bella screeches like a banshee, and now he doesn't want to show her, and I don't even blame him for once. Please, I asked quietly, experimenting with my newly discovered weapon. I touched his face lightly with the tips of my fingers. Please, can I see it? Calm down, Christian Grey. Is there an unprecedented heat wave, or is it getting hot in here? Shut up. The ring is a hand-me-down, his mother's engagement ring. One day I will stop playing in my hair, but it's not this day. I just realized you would be better off set in Twilight in the UK. Because remember in the first book how I mentioned that um, it doesn't actually rain that much in Forks? Well, the weather is constantly miserable here. It's either cloudy or rainy or drizzly with about two weeks of sunshine per year. And of those two weeks, a week of that is a heat wave. The Cullens would do fine if they were knocking around East London. Could you imagine? Edward being like, bruv, bruv, what you saying? 
Imagine. Anyway, Edward is really happy that the ring fits and this book is weird. It's weird in the way the first half, Edward is the worst and I hated him. And yet by this point, I'm actually rooting for him more than anyone else. He just wants to be a happy virgin with his one true love, guys. Can we not just respect that? No, but it's just weird how Jacob gets progressively worse and Edward is fine in the second half, which makes me think that Maya did this on purpose so Edward was the clearer choice for Bella to be with, but then there's no choice because like it was always going to be Edward. She's so obsessed with him. Whatever. He proposes, she says yes. Chapter 20 one trails. Bella really thinks that they're going to get married in a future road trip to Vegas. Alice is grumpy because she can't see Edward and Bella's future because they will be with Jacob and the werewolves. Da, da, da. Bella is impervious to other vampires' powers, so how has Alice been able to see her future anyway? How does Jasper's mood-enhancing abilities affect her too? Is this a plot hole? Does anyone else care? Don't worry, it gets filled in. You're going to have to just keep watching to find out how. Bella calls Billy. Considering Bella is allowed to know about the wolf stuff now, it would have been nicer to have more scenes of her interacting with Billy positively. Well, whatever. Don't you worry about Charlie, Bella, Billy said. I've got my part of this under control. Yeah, I know Charlie will be fine. I didn't feel so confident about his son's safety, but I didn't add that. I wish I could be with the rest of them tomorrow, Billy chuckled regretfully. Being an old man is a hardship, Bella. The urge to fight must be a defining characteristic of the Y chromosome. They were all the same. Speak for yourself, love. I like swearing up to... <laughs> <laughs> Imagine it's late at night, someone's trying to square up and you just see this coming towards you. What would you do? <laughs> My overconfidence is shocking. I'm surprised that I've never been killed. Do you think between the depictions in these books and then further depictions in The House of Night and probably more in Young Adult because Twilight probably inspired it, yeah? Native Americans, or as I like to call them, the original Americans. Do you reckon they just want to be left alone when it comes to the media and fiction? I had no idea. I have never met someone who is original American. Imagine that if that like genuinely annoys some American, some like non-original American, I'm just, I'm just saying. I've never met an indigenous American before. So I can't ask someone about this. I live in England, who am I gonna ask? But then I don't wanna speak on anyone else's behalf, but wouldn't, but would you maybe not get a bit sick of being represented in media as the trope of the mystical, magical, darker skinned people. I think it's one thing if someone's culture wants to represent themselves in a certain way, but Stephanie Mayer is a white woman writing about these Native Americans and they've got these magic powers and like a lot of them don't really come across well in this book either, but like that's a big conversation that maybe we'll, we'll have a little bit of that conversation at the end. The thing is, is like what I'm saying isn't original because I know she's had these criticisms and from people who have far more of an idea about this topic than I would. It's not in not my reality and I'd got no frame of reference for it because I'm, English living in England, especially if these tropes pertain to something a little bit more different from human and humanity, supernatural werewolves, shapeshifters, magical beings in this. In the House of Night, there's a lot of reference to Cherokee ancestors and magic and, and this type of thing. And whilst maybe some people look at it as it's, is it positive discrimination? I'm not sure. It's still, whether it's positive or not, whether it's, oh no, but it's cool that they can change into this. It's still slightly de dehumanizing, is it not? And I'm sure there was, a, there was a bunch of copycat stuff after Twilight because it re reignited the young adult supernatural romance genre. If, if there was that much, well, there was probably, I don't know. I don't know. It's a difficult subject and I'm not qualified to talk about it. But at the same time, I'm interested because I, I, I want to know. I like knowing stuff from a variety of people. <sighs> Moving on. Alice is upset. What's wrong, Alice? Don't you love me? She asks in that same sad tone. Of course I do. You know that. Then why do I see you sneaking off to Vegas to get married without inviting me? Emotional meditation, we love to see it. Who taught who? Did Edward teach Alice or did Alice teach Edward? Or are all vampires just really manipulative? Well, they are the perfect predators, right? Brilliant. Marriage is about a commitment being made between two people. If the two people involved don't want it, then they don't need to include others or have a big party or whatnot. It's about your love, not your love shared with everyone else. Comrade, let's share the love. No, it's about your love between you and that person or this person, or I don't know, 10 people if that floats your boat. It's like I always see on r slash am I the arsehole. People, they're preparing for their weddings and then they've got these distant relatives making these ridiculous requests or demands and then like family members making demands. It's like, but it's meant to be your day. It's not about them. Sack them off. That means half the family don't go. Screw it. More food for everyone else. Who cares? 
your day. You don't have to have anyone. I don't feel pressured into doing stuff that you don't want on a day to celebrate your love between you and your partner or partners. Ah. Besides, Alice doesn't just want to be invited. Please, 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 she whispered. Please, Bella, please, if you really love me, please let me do your wedding. You'd owe me for a century. Her eyes glowed. Is that a yes? No, I don't want to do this. You won't have to do anything but walk a few yards and repeat after the minister. Eclipse! The book in which everyone makes Bella's decisions for her. Working title. Thanks so much, Alice, Edward said acidly, coming from behind me. I turned to let him have it, but his expression was so worried and upset that I couldn't speak my complaints. I threw my arms around him instead, hiding my face, just in case the angry moisture in my eyes made it look like I was crying. I'm gonna, cr- I'm gonna cry in a minute. Why do other people in this series exist just to inflict constant emotional damage on Bella? Emotional damage. And why does she let everyone do it and get away with it? I can't support a main character in anything without backbones unless that's a defining point of the story, unless it serves an actual purpose. The purpose of this is meant to be, oh, she's so selfless, she just lets everyone walk all over her. That's not commendable. That's not something to look up to, it's pathetic. Like in the book, as I mentioned earlier, Never Let Me Go, spoiler alerts here, just skip over like a minute or so. It won't take me long to explain. Kathy, the main character, the protagonist, never considers running away from her fate. Never considers it. Doesn't even cross her mind. But there is a point to it. To show that perhaps they've been manipulated at a biological level. Their genes have been edited to not defy authority, to not run away from their ultimate pre-decided fate. Or maybe it's purely psychological and the behavior never crosses their minds because they've just not been raised that way to do so. So maybe it's genetic, maybe it's psychological, or maybe it's just purely allegorical for how none of us can escape death. So where would you run to? What's the point? Why run? You can't. You just have to accept it. My point is, in Never Let You Go, there is a point to Kathy never running away from her fate. There is a point to it. It's to make you think. It's to make you consider these things. There is no point to Bella being this doormat, being so passive. And yet we're told by other characters like Edward that Bella is, you know, spunky, probably not that word, probably not that word ever used in Twilight, but you know, she's she's defiant and, and she's strong and, and all this nonsense, but she's really not. I'm trying to make you happy too, Bella. It's just that I know better what will make you happy in the long run. You'll thank me for this. Maybe not for 50 years, but definitely someday. Let's play a game called Who Said This? Edward? Jacob? Alice? It was Alice. The tagline of this book should be, I know what's best for Bella, quote, every other character. Edward and Bella leave to set a false trail of her scent. Bella trips because she is such a klutz. She's not a Mary Sue. Actually, she like falls over sometimes and gives herself concussions. And her hand starts bleeding. So she smears her blood around on the trees and rocks to strengthen her scent and make the newborns crazy when they find the scent. Is she not worried about tetanus? I'm always worried about tetanus. Edward cleans her hand and her blood doesn't bother him anymore. Edward pursed his lips, seeming to search for the words. I looked for an entire 24 hours thinking you were dead, Bella. That changed the way I looked at a lot of things. Did it change the way I smelled to you? Not at all. But having experienced the way it feels to think I've lost you, my reactions have changed. My entire being shies away from any course that could inspire that kind of pain again. I didn't know what to say. That's nice, character development or something. Jacob meets them, Edward leaves. Jacob carries Bella up a path to meet with Edward later. What is this obsession with Bella being carried by strong men all the time? Maya, I've had enough. You are just eternally horny. I feel like I shouldn't even be reading this book. I feel like this is something that Maya should have kept personally for herself, for nights when her husband was fast asleep. When I read it, it seemed like wasn't it was like it was a book that wasn't supposed to be published i shrugged been thinking about that last time a lot have you nope he laughed either you're lying or you're the stubbornest person alive i don't know about the second part but i'm not lying now jacob has bella alone it's a perfect time to continue his harassment campaign and sex pesting a smart person looks at all sides of us the dismissal and undermining of the choices that she makes. A smart person looks at all sides of a decision. I have, I retorted. If you haven't thought at all about our uh, conversation the last time you came over, then that's not true. This is what we call a classic negging technique. Insult her intelligence and maybe then she'll pity bang you. I despise any scene that Jacob is in now. It's just, it's infuriating to read. Does that mean he's a better kisser than I am? Jacob's asked, suddenly glum. 
I really couldn't say, Jake. Edward is the only person I've ever kissed, besides me. But I don't count that as a kiss, Jacob. I think of it more as an assault. Ouch, that's cold. I'm actually shocked that Mayor wrote this. This lends more to my theory that she has these bursts of self-awareness yet continues to solder on writing this abusive nonsense that I don't understand it, I don't get it, I want to know where her head is at. I still think it's pretty irresponsible, Jacob suddenly said. <sighs> it's none of your business, mate. It's just none of your business, is it? Whatever you're talking about, you're wrong. Think about it, Bella. According to you, you've kissed just one person who isn't even really a person in your whole life and you're calling it quits. How do you know what that's what you want? Shouldn't you play the field a little? I kept my voice cool. I know exactly what I want. Then it couldn't hurt to double check. Maybe you should try kissing someone else, just for comparison's sake, since what happened the other day doesn't count. You could kiss me, for example. I don't mind if you want to use me to experiment. He pulled me tighter against his chest so that my face was closer to his. He was smiling at his joke, but I wasn't taking any chances. Sex offender vibes. Just a sex offender. I can't even be bothered to argue with this text anymore. I can't change it thing it came out regardless, didn't it? But it is continuous. Jacob's harassment of Bella trying to manipulate and convince her to give him a pity shag. Sometimes I think you like me better as a wolf. Sometimes I do. It probably has something to do with the way you can't talk. He pursed his broad lips thoughtfully. No, I don't think that's it. I think it's easier for you to be near me when I'm not human because you don't have to pretend that you're not attracted to me. You know, this is gaslighting, right? It never ends either. He sighed. Do you ever get tired of lying to yourself? You have to know how aware you are of me. Physically, I mean. How could anyone not be aware of you physically, Jacob? I demanded. You're an enormous monster who refuses to respect anyone else's personal space. I make you nervous, but only when I'm human. When I'm a wolf, you're more comfortable around me. Yeah, probably because when you're a human, she's worried that you're about to assault her again. He stared at me for a minute, slowing to a walk, the amusement draining from his face. His eyes narrowed, turned black in the shadow of his brows. His breathing, so regular as he ran, started to accelerate. Slowly, he leaned his face closer to mine. I stared him down, knowing exactly what he was trying to do. It's your face, I reminded him. I'm getting numb to this text now. He refuses to listen to her words and just insists that she secretly wants him, like a sexual abuser would do to a victim. I'm frustrated at how constant and never ending these conversations are. Can't see how Maya wrote this and thought, oh, but Jacob, he's a good guy, he's a good character. Unless maybe in her head she justified his behavior with a sexist defense of he's a guy, he can't help it. I kind of think, that must be it. Jacob jokes about not wanting to fight Edward and leaving the Cullen short one vampire and Bella gets upset at emotionally manipulating Edward into not being in the fight tomorrow. What's the matter with you, Bella? The joke in bravado vanished from his face, revealing my Jacob underneath, like pulling a mask away. If something I said upset you, you know I'm only joking. I didn't mean anything. Hey, are you okay? Don't cry, Bella, he pleaded, revealing my Jacob underneath. When people show you who they are, Believe it. We all like to believe that we are just innocent children deep, deep, deep down. And in a way, yeah, it's true. We kind of are. But what the hell does that matter if you're just like a like an innocent, tortured kid deep down? What does it matter if at surface level, at the, the top level of your being, down here, innocent child, this level, you're out of self. You're just going around hurting people. It doesn't matter if someone's a good person deep down, if like at the shallow end of the pool, they're going around being sex offenders like this. Do you know how many mothers show up to court to exclaim that their child would never hurt a fly? They were such an innocent, like they were such a sweet boy when the same child is in court being convicted of doing murders. Jacob isn't some sweet, innocent, hurting boy. He is a sex offender and a misogynist with the added bonus of having supernatural strength to get his way. Bella reveals to Jacob why she's upset. I don't know why she talks to him about private matters. He is just trying to bang her. I don't know why she confides in him. I've had enough. That doesn't mean anything though. He was suddenly backtracking. That doesn't mean he loves you more than I do. Shut up. Shut up. There is a world of difference between thinking you love someone from afar and then loving someone with the intimacy of a relationship. They are two different things. You can't sway me on this one. Have you ever thought that you loved someone and then got into a relationship with them and actually it wasn't all that it seemed to be or cracked up to be and you know, maybe it kind of sucked or whatever. It happens all the time. It's two different things. And when you're in a close relationship with someone, as begrudgingly I have to admit, Bella and Edward, they are in a close relationship. They spend all their time together. They discuss almost everything when he's not hiding stuff about being a vampire and she's not being, I don't know, daft. It's a different level of intimacy. I mean, I wonder if you can truly be in love with someone without the experience of being in a relationship with someone. Because when you're in a, you know, proper 
and old relationship and you're close with someone you see the sides of them that you wouldn't see if you were just loving them from afar i mean not to be crude but i'm always quite crude i don't think it's that crude actually i think it's just realistic jacob probably has bella on a bit of a pedestal yeah probably glorifies her a bit too much edward has definitely heard her go to the toilet he's got super sensitive hearing and he spends all night around hers it's definitely happened it's just there's a different level of closeness when you're in a close relationship with someone you really see that person for who they are it's a good thing to not put people on pedestals because the end of the day we all go to the bathroom we're all these flawed imperfect beings no matter like how successful or good looking or famous or rich or whatever someone may seem we're all messes wrapped in human skin so i just don't understand well ugh, he's immature but i hate that defense of oh jacob's in immature because it seems to justify all of his terrible behavior no i don't think he could possibly love bella more than edward does and i don't buy it i don't even think that he does love bella at all because if he did he wouldn't hurt her and he wouldn't continuously try to force himself upon her and successfully that one time with the kiss why he asked gruffly why does it matter to you if something happens to me don't say that you know how much you mean to me i'm sorry it's not in the way you want but that's just how it is you're my best friend at least you used to be and still sometimes are when you let your guard down why is she apologizing to him he assaulted her insulted and assaulted her and continuously steps over her boundaries why is she she is a terrible character for any woman he laughed with me and then his eyes were sad when are you finally going to figure out that you love they can't even have a moment of laughing together without him being like you're in love with me you're in love with me you're in love with me i do not buy for a second by the end that she actually did love him a little bit all along i don't buy that i do not buy that she he's stockholm syndrome her <sighs> leave it to you to ruin the moment i'm not saying you don't love him i'm not stupid but it's possible to love more than one person at a time bella i've seen it in action you're like 12 shut up mate i think he is he just manipulates her into that's how i read it that is my interpretation of the text you're free to have your own you're free to think that he's a perfect boy but you i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say anything more jacob is staying with bella and edward overnight so he can communicate to the pack if there's trouble they discuss jacob's rank in the pack it is hard to give a shit about a pedophile I'm just being straight up. It's hard. I'm not invested in his little doggy position. Not interested. They meet Edward at the camp and it's going to blizzard. Chapter 22, fire and ice. <sighs> like the poem from the beginning. See the way that Maya did that? Oh my God. 10 out of 10, would never read again. Bella is freezing inside the tent. Edward is sitting away from her, afraid to make her even more cold. Jacob comes into the tent to be a heater for Bella. Edward snarled, but Jacob didn't even look at him. Instead, he crawled to my side and started unzipping my sleeping bag without asking for her consent as usual. The tagline of this book should be, consent? Question mark? Never heard of her. There is no need for him to get into the sleeping bag with her. He radiates heat because of his metabolism, whatever, he, he feels like he's feverish. He could sit next to her and she would warm up all the same. Wow, this, this, this forced drama, this forced conflict of them, they have to snuggle, they have to like spoon each other all night because they just keep it up. Bullshit, bullshit. I stared at him in outrage. No wonder Edward was reacting this way. I tried to protest. Don't be stupid, he said, exasperated. Don't you like having ten toes? He crammed his body into the non-existent space, forcing the zipper up behind himself. She says no, so he does it anyway. Great character. 10 out of 10. A star. I just don't believe she's secretly in love with him. He's a grade A. See you next Tuesday. Try to relax, he suggested, as another shiver rippled through me violently. You'll be warm in a minute. Of course, you'd warm up faster if you took your clothes off. Edward growled sharply. The sheer audacity that he says these things in front of her boyfriend and the audacity of her because she like get out of the sleeping bag kick him out of the sleeping bag she doesn't have any respect for her relationship with edward she just doesn't she just doesn't um shouldn't get too high that pterodactyl thing might come back if someone acted like this with me i'd knock him out if they did it in front of my boyfriend i'd knock him out two times hard ten times harder you don't disrespect my relationship you get one of these <laughs> so threatening your lips are still beautiful i hate this guy i hate him your lips are still blue he mused want me to warm those up for you too you only have to ask edward sighed heavily i'd make your lips blue with bruises jacob's wolf form is hairier than the others because his hair is longer jacob made a annoyed sound oh he'll tell you anyway so i might as well i was growing my hair out because it seemed you liked it better long i think 
You'll find that she liked it better when you weren't a sex offender, mate. Seth is here, Edward muttered to Jacob, and I suddenly understood the point of the howling. Perfect. Now you can keep an eye on everything else while I take care of your girlfriend for you. Edward has shown more restraint in not killing Jacob than he did in not killing Bella when he first caught her scent in that science class. Maybe, in retrospect, I was too hard on Edward before. Maybe. I actually did read a quite decent analysis on Reddit of all places, which I didn't agree with all of it, but I cherry picked and agreed with some bits, naturally. This person saying that the, the creepy stuff Edward does doesn't, he didn't, they didn't mind it so much because Edward isn't a human and he's not been a human for over a hundred years. He is a vampire. He is weird and creepy and, and stalkery and all this kind of stuff, you know. He's a predator. The bits where he goes into her room by her consent it is creepy. I still think it's creepy. But they did say that in Midnight Sun, and I read Midnight Sun, maybe I just forgot this. Maybe I burned it out of my memory. That he originally was going in her room at night so he could acclimatize to her scent so he wouldn't accidentally try to kill her at school. Which, I mean, Midnight Sun came out ages after Twilight Breaking Dawn finished, right? So it's very possible Maya just shoehorned that in to deflect the criticism of, oh my God, what a freak who's going into her room by consent. Be that as it may, regardless, let's put that to bed for a second. How many more cliches can I get out? If he was doing it purely to get accustomed to her scent so he didn't kill her, then I can overlook it. This is my character development. I can overlook Edward doing that if it was purely for that and not shoehorned in afterwards by Maya to deflect the criticism. It's not too big of an ask. Anyway, this person went on about how, yeah, uh, the, the, the problem with Jacob though, is he started off as a realistic character, like he had human realism. With Edward, there's more explanations for his freaky behavior because he's not a human. Jacob was for the first 16 years of his life and then he turns into a wolf and then he just turns into this massive asshole. And also how Edward's supernatural, you would never come across someone like him in real life because as far as we know, vampires and Maya's vampires specifically don't exist in real life. However, Jacobs do exist in real life. People who think that they are owed a relationship with you. They feel entitled to you because they like you and maybe they supported you for some difficult times. It was quite a good host. I should like remember the Reddit user's name, probably won't might find them putting up here. And whilst I don't agree with a lot of the stuff that Edward has done before, granted, still, still, the control and possessive attitude, all of that stuff. I think it does hit the nail on the head on why I find Jacob so much more infuriating because we have met people like this and they get away with it. There are plenty of Jacobs in the world who are real threats to women. Edward is a vampire. They don't exist. Touch wood. Of course, the further argument is that regardless of real Edward's not actually existing, Twilight does glorify abusive relationships. But even even then, Jacob's still way worse. Especially because he gets away with all of it. Please, Edward Hiss, do you mind what Jacob whispered back to his tone surprise? Do you think you could attempt to control your thoughts? Edward's low whisper was furious. No one said you had to listen, Jacob muttered, defiant yet still embarrassed. Get out of my head. I wish I could. You have no idea how loud your little fantasies are. It's like you're shouting them at me. I'll try to keep it down, Jacob whispered sarcastically. Bella is in a position of vulnerability right now. She's in a snowstorm as a human. She's freezing. That's the only reason she didn't get rid of Jacob because she was so cold that, well, pfft, may have just wanted the forced conflict, but she was so cold. She was like, whatever, I'll just allow it because I don't want to freeze to death. And yet Jacob's lying there next to her, his supposed best mate, right? inappropriately sexualizing her and fantasizing about them banging while she's in, in pain and freezing and such, knowing her boyfriend also has to sit and listen to his thoughts because Edward can't turn it off and on. He can't. Jacob is the worst character in this book. Bella is dozing off and overhears Jake and Edward talking, but she, she keeps thinking it's a dream. She's just stupid. Yes, I would guess that she thinks about you often, Edward murmured in response to Jacob's thoughts, more often than I like. She's worried that you're unhappy. Not that you don't know that. Not that you don't use that. I have to use whatever I can, Jacob muttered. I'm not working with your advantages. Advantages like her knowing she's in love with you. Jacob admits here he uses emotional blackmail and he also knows that Bella is in love with Edward. So why chase after someone who is in love and in a relationship with someone else, especially when they've continuously turned you down? It's entitled an abusive behavior. Jacob was defiant. She's in love with me too, you know. I don't know why Maya insists upon this. We knew her thoughts for all of New Moon. We, we know them for Twilight, New Moon, Eclipse and Ring and Norm. We know Bella was using Jacob as a way of avoiding thinking about Edward because she is so obsessed 
obsessively in love with him. The amount of times Bella considers dating Jacob, knowing she couldn't love him more than platonically, definitely not romantically, basically wanting to people please Jacob, but also use the situation to avoid of thinking of Edward more. Yeah, you know, she 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 considers dating him just just to make him happy, regardless of, of herself. And she's like, that'd be good, wouldn't it? I'd be a good friend if I just made him happy. It's ludicrous. It's ludicrous. But that's not called being in love with someone that's called using them as an emotional crutch maya should read her own books sometime what would you do if she changed her mind jacob asked i don't know that either jacob chuckled quietly would you try to kill me sarcastic again as if doubting edward's ability to do it no why not jacob's tone was still jeering do you really think i would hurt her that way there you have it in this one exchange alone, why Edward will always love Bella more than Jacob could. Even though I think Edward is a screwed up, weird, noncy incel, he still leagues above this dumb, arrogant, noncy assaulter. Jacob would try to hurt, nay, kill Edward, regardless of it upsetting Bella. If it wouldn't cause an all out war of the Cullens, he probably would have would have actually tried to kill him already. That's what I reckon. Edward wouldn't do the same because he values Bella's happiness above all else. He would accept it if she chose something else, even if it like it hurt his heart, broke his heart. Jacob does not value Bella's happiness because he constantly hurts her, manhandles her against her wishes, assaults her, and at the end coerces her all for his own gain and gratification and to gloat about it. What a strange dream this was. Maya, don't you ever tell me via other characters ever again that Bella is intelligent. She cannot tell the difference between a dream and an obviously real, very in-depth conversation between two people in the same room as her. Dumbass. Edward talks about what it was like to lose Bella, blah, blah, blah. We've seen it all before, mate, I don't care. Why Edward is talking nicely to this bloke who constantly harasses his girlfriend, I'll never know. That's another point against Edward. Like, I don't know why you're... Uh, because it would upset Bella. Yeah, well, you don't have to kill him. You don't have to murder him. Um, but I feel like Edward should be putting his foot down at this point. I mean, I was against Edward putting his foot down in the beginning because it was controlling, but this is ridiculous. It's like he gave them, he gave Jacob a chance. All Jacob's doing is being rotten. I'm about to wild out. Given that I don't think you should give up on the first alternative, not yet. I think there's a very good chance that she would be okay after time. You know, if she hadn't jumped off a cliff in March and if you'd waited another six months to check on her, well, you might have found her reasonably happy. I had a game plan. She would have been happiest in the platonic sense and we saw that we, she said these things in New Moon. And regardless, if she'd been happy with you, as soon as Edward turns up and then just makes his merry way back, she would have picked him over and over. He is so delusional and arrogant. Oh, to have the confidence and arrogance of a bloody average 16 year old boy. Yeah, Jake sighed, but suddenly he was whispering so fast the words got tangled. Give me a year, blood, Edward. I really think I can make her happy. She's stubborn. No one knows that better than I do, but she's capable of healing. She would have healed before. She really wouldn't. She was catatonic from Ed from Edward leaving. Come on. It's like, it's unhealthy, but it'd be worse to be of this assaulter. And she could be human with Charlie and Renee, and she could grow up and have kids and be Bella. You love her enough that you have to see the advantages of that plan. She thinks you're very unselfish. Are you really? Can you consider the idea that I might be better for her than you are? How about if you love someone, you respect their decisions? Why can't he respect Bella's decisions? Why does his need to conquer Bella supersede Bella's wishes to be with Edward? May I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm stressed out. But having to read this and then write this stuff and then read from it again. I'm not pretending, like I'm getting really annoyed. But I'm not stupid enough to make the same mistake I made before Jacob. I won't try to force her in that first option again. As long as she wants me, I'm here. And if she were to decide that she wanted me, Jacob challenged, okay, it's a long shot, I'll give you that. I would let her go. Just like that. In the sense that I'd never show her how hard it was for me, yes, but I would keep watch. You see, Jacob, you might leave her someday. Like Sam and Emily, you wouldn't have a choice. I would always be waiting in the wings, hoping for that to happen. Imagine if Bella, at the end of this, had chosen Jacob and then they had kids and then he imprinted on their own daughter together. Edward would have been right. Maya says that Jacob was attracted to Bella's egg containing Renesme, but he thought he was in love with Bella. This makes no sense, of course, and I think it got retconned for Breaking Dawn. Yeah, definitely did. I, I don't think she thought this through properly. But it makes no sense because if that were the case, why would he be so antagonistic to Edward who holds the other half of Renesmee's DNA in his granite stone balls? Why wouldn't Jacob also think he's in love with Edward? He should be bisexual. 
But going by Maya's logic that Jacob just fancied Bella's egg, what a sentence. If they had a, if they had created a child with that same egg, Jacob would have ended up incestually imprinting on his own baby. Now that is a better love story than Twilight. Jacob mentally tells Edward the story of the third wife when prompted, and then Edward gets mad that Bella identifies with the wife because of course she does. She's just trying to be selfless. The chapter ends with Jacob thinking about banging Bella and Edward trying to hum his way above it. Terrible person. Chapter 23, monster. Insert Gabby Hannah meme here. When I woke up in the morning, it was very bright. Even inside the tent, the sunlight hurt my eyes and I was sweating as Jacob had predicted. Jacob was snoring lightly in my ear, his arms still wrapped around me. No way did Edward cuck himself all night having to watch these two spoon. Outrageous. What weird Maya fantasy is this? I feel bad for her husband. Jacob is sleeping, so Edward unzips the sleeping bag and Jacob falls out, but then he rolls back onto Bella accidentally. So Edward throws Jacob and then they start growling at each other. You know, Edward has been supernatural for over a hundred years, so I can understand the more primal, predatory, animalistic noises he makes. It's natural to him. Jacob's been turning into a big dog for like a few months. I just don't think he should be sniffing butts and growling and this type of thing in his human form just yet. <laughs> I turned to Edward. He was looking at me, his expression hard and angry. That wasn't nice. You should say sorry. His eyes widened in disgust. You must be joking. He was crushing you. Because you dumped him on the floor. He didn't do it on purpose and he didn't hurt me. Bro, Edward had to watch you be spooned by Jacob all night. He had to watch some other boy's boner dig into your butt all night. Edward don't have to apologize for shit. I just became team Edward should dump Bella and run away from this toxic codependent mess. Jacob wants to have a tantrum and leave, so he does. We are approaching the climax of this book, this whole book of nothing. And it's fitting that most of the action will be away from Bella, as it usually is. She is the most passive main character you'll ever read. Bella was talking in her sleep. Near the end though, you started mumbling some nonsense about Jacob, my Jacob. I could hear the pain even in the whisper. Your Jacob enjoyed that quite a lot. I stretched my neck up, straining to reach my lips to the edge of his jaw. I couldn't see into his eyes. He was staring up the ceiling of the tent. Sorry, I murmured. That's just the way I differentiate. Differentiate? Between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, between the Jacob I like and the one who annoys the hell out of me, I explained. Yeah, it sounds like a great basis for a happy friendship, let alone relationship. Some mood swingy bloke who never ceases harassing you. Right. I know Edward has mood swings, he does, but Jacob has like really aggressive mood swings in between harassing her. Edward and Bella discuss their best nights together. My best night will be when I get to finish this video and burn this book. Bella doesn't understand why being married is important to Edward. A hundred years from now, when you've gained enough perspective to really appreciate the answer, I will explain it to you. Edward, my dude, do you really want to marry someone who doesn't have the experience and perspective of someone who's, who's even 20 years old? She's only 18. Are you sure you want to go through with this? And no, reading Wuthering Heights a few times doesn't give you life experience. Before he could answer, the silence outside the tent was ripped apart by an ear-splitting howl of pain. The sound ricocheted off the bare rock face of the mountain and filled the air so that it seared from every direction. The howl tore through my mind like a tornado, both strange and familiar. Strange because I'd never heard such a tortured cry before. Familiar because I knew the voice at once. I recognized the sound and understood the meaning as perfectly as if I'd uttered it myself. It made no difference that Jacob was not human when he cried out. I needed no translation. Jacob was close. Jacob had heard every word we'd said. Jacob was in agony. The howl choked off into a peculiar gurgled sob and then it was quiet again. Big W for Edward, legend, best move he's literally ever pulled. Talking about the marriage, so Jacob overhears it and then Jacob gets upset. I forgive you for all of Twilight, mate. Shame he ruins it in Breaking Dawn by letting Jacob groom his daughter. Do you think that matters? I was blinking back tears and this was easy to hear in my voice. Do you think I care whether it's fair or whether he was adequately warned? I'm hurting him. Every time I turn around, I'm hurting him again. My voice was getting louder, more hysterical. I'm a hideous person. <laughs> Good. In New Moon and my New Moon review, things were different. Things were different. Bella was deliberately giving Jacob false hope in a romantic future relationship just to get her mind off of Edward, just, just to keep him around because he felt that he couldn't be around her because he was in love with her and whatnot. And, and she was giving him false hope just to keep him close, where she's incredibly manipulative. In this book, however, she's not really doing much other than just trying to live her life, be with Edward and try to be friends with Jacob. 
None of her actions in this book are trying to hurt Jacob on purpose. He's the one choosing to obsess over some girl with a big titted vampire BF. I don't give a shit about Jacob being hurt. Good, I don't care. Bella freaks out over some poor precious sex offender wolf boy being big bad upset Wee and leaves the tent in a huff. I knew Edward was following me as I stumbled towards the trees. I couldn't hear him, but the sun reflected off his skin in glittering rainbows that danced ahead of me. He didn't reach out to stop me until I was several paces into the forest shadows. His hand caught my left wrist. He ignored it when I tried to yank myself free. I'm gonna allow this one. Hear me out, hear me out. In one hour's time, newborn vampires are gonna descend on this forest to try to kill her in particular and fight everyone. Bella is just a human. I will allow that he's not gonna let her get lost in a forest. He should have done that in New Moon, then none of this Jacob bullshit would have like, happened. Edward offers to fetch Jacob so Bella can talk to him. So she agrees and then she sits around crying pathetically. I was selfish, I was hurtful. I tortured the ones I loved. I was like Kathy, like Wuthering Heights. Only my options were so much better than hers. Neither one evil, neither one weak. And here I sat crying about it, not doing anything productive to make it right just like Kathy. Has Maya ever had an original thought in her life? Have any of us? Why does Maya insist on name dropping classic novels? Does she think by proximity, by association, it will make her novel classic too? Why can't she trust us to see the parallels between her stories and the classics she aspires to be like? We don't need everything spelled out to us, love. Which is why I like Never Like Me Go so much because things don't really get spelled out to you that much. I, I like that. But if Edward did return with Jacob, that was it. I had to tell him to go away and never come back. Why was that so hard? So very much more difficult than saying goodbye to my other friends, to Angela, to Mike. Why did that hurt? It wasn't right. That shouldn't be able to hurt me. I had what I wanted. I couldn't have them both because Jacob could not just be my friend. It was time to give up wishing for that. How ridiculously greedy could any one person be? Why is Bella always on crack? She is so overdramatic. Splitting up with friends does hurt if they mean something to you, it hurts. Even if said friend is toxic and awful, it still hurts. So I don't know why, this is where May is trying to be like, see, see, it's hard for her because she's actually in love with him. No, she's a human experiencing normal emotion. She thinks she's close to this person. She's going to have to cut them off. That would hurt. So shut up, Maya. I could feel that my hair was wild, twisted into clumps like Medusa snakes. I wish she'd turn Jacob to stone. Bella whines some more. It's boring. Jacob returns. Well, you're not the only one capable of self-sacrifice, he said, his voice stronger. Two can play at that game. What? I behaved pretty badly myself. I've made this much harder for you than I needed to. I could have given up with good grace in the beginning, but I hurt you too. This is my fault. Pair of idiots, maybe they deserve each other. I won't let you claim all the blame here, Bella, or all the glory either. I know how to redeem myself. What are you talking about? I demanded. The sudden frenzied light in his eyes frightened me. He glanced up at the sun, then smiled at me. There's a pretty serious fight brewing down there. I don't think it will be that difficult to take myself out of the picture. Yep, yeah, when all else fails, threaten suicide to get a girl to go out of you. What the hell was Maya thinking with this scene? Oh no, Jake. No, 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 no. I choked out in horror. No, Jake, no, please, no. <sighs> Perfect. My knees began to tremble. What's the difference, Bella? This will only make it more convenient for everyone. You won't even have to move. No, my voice got louder. No, Jacob, I won't let you. How will you stop me? He taunted lightly, smiling to take the sting out of his tone. Jacob, I'm begging you, stay with me. I would have fallen to my knees if I could have moved at all. When am I getting rung up by the TV to be on like, where, where's my Netflix show? Hmm? Where is it? I would have called Jacob's bluff and then be like, all right, see you later, mate. Have fun. Adios. Sayonara, bitch. I love you, Bella, he murmured. I love you, Jacob, I whispered brokenly. They smiled. He smiled. I know that better than you do. He turned to walk away. Anything. I called out after him in a strangled voice. Anything you want, Jacob. Just don't do this. Even butt stuff. See how manipulative this is though. He doesn't mean any of this from his end, by the way, FYI. He's just saying he will get himself killed to wind her up, to coerce her, to emotionally abuse her. I don't have to do anything deliberate. I could just do my best on my pack and let what happens happen, he shrugged. If you could convince me that you really did want me to come back more than you wanted to do the selfless thing. How, I asked. You could ask me, he suggested. Come back, I whispered. How could he doubt that I meant it? He shook his head, smiling again. That's not what I'm talking about. What a pedo. He's younger than her, but he's a pedo nonetheless. It took me a second to grasp what he was saying. And all the while he was looking at me with this superior expression, so sure of my reaction. As soon as the realization hit though, I blurted out the words about stopping to count the cost. Will you kiss me, Jacob? 
I want to die. His eyes widened in surprise and narrowed suspiciously. You're bluffing. Kiss me, Jacob. Kiss me and then come back. Yeah, you got it right here, folks. Jacob threatened suicide to get Bella to ask him to kiss her. This is trash. This is coercion, pure and simple. It's up there with people saying, if you break up with me, I will end my life. Does Maya think this is romantic or something? Flip off. I knew he would take advantage of the situation. I expected it. I held very still. My eyes closed, my fingers curled into fists at my side. As his hands caught my face and his lips found mine with an eagerness that was not far from violence. Let me, let's just rename this book. Jacob abusing Bella for 600 pages straight. I could feel his anger as his mouth discovered my passive resistance. One hand moved to the nape of my neck, twisting into a fist around the roots of my hair. The other hand grabbed roughly at my shoulder, shaking me, then dragging me to him. His hand continued down my arm, finding my wrist and pulling my arm around his neck. I left it there, my hand still tightly balled up, unsure of how far I could go in my desperation to keep him alive. She's, she's an idiot. That's unfair. Maybe she shouldn't have fallen for his, his bluff. But if you're in that situation where you think someone you care about is genuinely going to get themselves killed, what choice did she actually have in this moment? It's despicable already. He's, he's a disgusting character. I don't know why Mayo likes him so much. All the while, his lips, disconcertingly soft and warm, tried to force a response out of mine. This isn't uncomfortable at all, is it? As soon as he was sure I wouldn't drop my arm, he freed my wrist, his hand feeling its way down my waist. His burning hand found the skin at the small of my back, and he yanked me forward, bowing my body against his. His lips gave up on mine for a moment, but I knew he was nowhere close to finished. Ugh. His mouth followed the line of my jaw, then explored the length of my neck. He freed my hair, reaching for my other arms, drew it round his neck like the first. Then both of his arms were constricted around my waist and his lips found my ear. You can do better than this, Bella, he whispered huskily. Well, like a dog. Husky. As in like a husky. I don't know why I said that. Husky. <laughs> You're overthinking it. This is very uncomfortable. I'm clenching. I'm clenching at how uncomfortable this is making me feel. I shivered as I felt his teeth graze my earlobe. That's right, he murmured. For once, just let yourself feel what you feel. He sounds like a nonce. Sorry. I shook my head mechanically until one of his hands wound up back into my hair and stopped me. His voice turned acidic. Are you sure you want me to come back? Or did you really want me to die? This is so abusive. Anger rocked through me like the whiplash after a heavy punch. That was too much. He wasn't fighting fair. My arms were already around his neck, so I grabbed two fistfuls of his hair, ignoring the stabbing pain in my right hand, and fought back, struggling to pull my face away from his. And Jacob misunderstood. Even without the predatory overtones and undertones and just predatory behavior, this sounds like a terrible kiss. He was too strong to recognize that my hands trying to yank his hair out by the roots meant to cause him pain. Instead of anger, he imagined passion. He thought I was finally responding to him. With a wild gasp, he brought his mouth back to mine, his fingers clutching frantically against the skin at my waist. The jolt of anger unbalanced my tenuous hold and self-control. His unexpected ecstatic response overthrew it entirely. If there had only been triumph, I might have been able to resist him. But the utter defenselessness of his sudden joy cracked my determination, disabled it. My brain disconnected from my body and I was kissing him back. Against all reason, my lips were moving with his in strange, confusing ways they'd never moved before because I didn't have to be careful with Jacob and he certainly wasn't being careful with me. The tiny piece of my brain that retains sanity screamed questions at me. Why wasn't I stopping this? Worse than that, why couldn't I find in myself even the desire to want to stop? What did it mean that I didn't want him to stop? That my hands clung to his shoulders and lights that they were wide and strong. That his hands pulled me too tight against his body and yet it was not tight enough for me. The questions were stupid because I knew the answer. I'd been lying to myself. I don't like or believe this at all. He has doggedly pursued her despite her wishes for an entire book. I think he has worn her down and genuinely gaslit her into believing there's something more there than there is. He has been insisting that she's in love with him. She likes him too. She wants like him to kiss her and, and all this stuff. And she's a muppet, right? She's a fool. So I think she just started to believe him. I know for a fact that she is too obsessed with Edward to genuinely love anyone else. There is no room in her heart for romantic love for anyone besides Edward. Don't make me laugh, Smeyer. I've analyze these books more than the average person ever should. Malizy, she doesn't want to stop kissing him. What does this mean? I think that's more due to the fact that she's 18 and she's only ever kissed Edward. And she has to be so careful with him so he doesn't accidentally murder her. Despite Maya wanting us to believe otherwise, Bella is a teenager. She has hormones. What teenager hasn't had an out of control snogging session with someone once, twice, every now and then, every weekend? 
drawing on my own experiences here i was a teenager obviously not too long ago i was only like 18 like three years ago obviously i remember what it was like all right it's scary it's exciting like puberty's uh you got all these hormones and you don't really know what to do yourself and then oh boys stop being so gross and then and then and then you kind of stop looking so gross as well i suppose and then boys are interested in you and it's all like Ugh. um bella's not uh experienced that she's only ever snogged edward and they, i don't even think that they've used tongues properly i mean like really jamming their tongue and uh, i'm so sorry i'm so gross it's, it's very hot, okay? I think she's just overwhelmed. She's been put in this awful position by this awful person and she's kind of responded to it. I don't know. Jacob has done nothing but abuse her mentally, emotionally, physically, and sexually at any opportunity he could get. Am I calling this Stockholm Syndrome? Maybe. Bella having Stockholm Syndrome with Jacob is more believable to me than, oh no, she's actually a little bit in love with him. I mean, if you subtract all the bad stuff that I just said, he's still this massively arrogant cock, right? With hardly any redeemable qualities. He's not being nice in this book. So what is there to love regardless? Um, maybe that's too mean. No, it's not. No, he's a douchebag. Like, Maya has tried to retcon and insist that in New Moon, Bella fell in love with Jacob, but we were in her head as she was saying things like, oh, Jacob doesn't want to be my friend because he's in love with me, but Edward's never going to come back. So maybe, you know, could I love Jacob like that? No, no, I couldn't. I couldn't love him like I love Edward, but maybe I could make him happy and that'd be good enough for me because then he gets to stay in my life. And it's like, what the hell are you talking about? You freak. Work on your self-esteem. Women don't exist just to make men happy. Maya, what is this message? Women, we don't exist just to make men happy. <laughs> the pterodactyl comes back. Jacob's right. He'd been right all, no, he's not. He was more than just my friend. He's an idiot. You are too. Both joined it, your stupid personalities. That's why it was so impossible to tell him goodbye. Yeah, it's impossible to tell him goodbye because he's just hounding after you all the time. Because I was in love with him too. I loved him much more than I should and yet still nowhere near enough. I was in love with him, but it was not enough to change anything. It was only enough to hurt us mo both more, to hurt him worse than I ever had. I also think Bella is this very sheltered individual. Before Edward, she had never dated anyone. Outside of Edward and Jacob, she doesn't have any actual friends. Hanging out with Angela one time is hardly the basis of a good friendship. I think she's just starved of connection and affection from people, more than one person. You know, humans, we're social creatures. We're designed to be in, be in tribes, be in groups. That's why like tribalism is still such a thing in this day and age. That's why people are like, oh, it's us and then it's them. That's why that exists. It's in our DNA, which is difficult to get over, which I think is why what with globalization and the internet, lots of head button is arising, trying to all coexist. And yet our DNA for hundreds of thousands of years was you can only really trust up to 250 or 300 people in your tribe. More than that gets difficult. <sighs> I'm literally the best person I've ever met in my life. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, this. I think she just starves of connection from people. And that is why she overthinks every micro movement Edward or Jacob makes because it's not normal the amount she overthinks about the, it's it just, it's just not. Regardless of what Bella confusedly believes, after a whole book of being harassed by Jacob, it does not change, like her kissing him back and losing control in a way that she couldn't with Edward. It doesn't change the fact that he assaulted her, sex pestered her, disrespected her relationship, disrespected her and her choices, continuously manhandled her, whatnot. Then it culminated in him threatening suicide to coerce her into this kiss. Her kissing him back doesn't change any of what I just said. Don't change shit, Maya. Do not test me. I'm ending this chapter because I'm annoyed. Chapter 24, snap decision. Bella is in the tent awaiting Edward, who should just dump her because <laughs> he, she just cheated on you. It stunned me when Edward chuckled reluctantly. And I thought I fought dirty, he said with grudging admiration. He makes me look like the patron state of ethics. His hand brushed against the part of my cheek that was exposed. I'm not mad at you, love. Jacob's more cunning than I give him credit for. I do wish you hadn't asked him though. Edward, I whispered to the rough nylon. I, I, I'm, shh, shh. He hushed me, his fingers soothing against my cheek. That's not what I meant. It's just that he would have kissed you anyway, even if he hadn't fallen for it. So if she hadn't fallen for it, he would have forcibly kissed her anyway because he is a sex offender. Great, thanks, Maya. Great character, good favorite character. And now I don't have an excuse to break his face. I would have really enjoyed that too. Fallen for it? I mumbled almost incomprehensibly. Edward though, darling my favorite character in this book. 
as of these last few chapters. Not really, I don't have a favorite character in this book. No, wait, I'm team that man that almost wipes Bella out in the first book. I feel like Edward should be taking coercion a little bit more seriously. It's not that Bella fell for something. Sure, she did. But when put in that situation, when you're being that emotionally manipulated by someone that they're threatening to die, if you don't ask them to kiss you, that's quite serious. And I feel like he should be taken a little bit more seriously. Bella, did you really believe he was that noble that he would go out in a flame of glory just to clear the way for me? I raised my head slowly to meet his patient gaze. His expression was soft. His eyes were full of understanding rather than the revulsion I deserved to see. Yes, I did believe that, I muttered, then looked away. But I didn't feel any anger at Jacob for tricking me. There wasn't enough room in my body to contain anything besides the hatred I felt towards myself. Stop being so passive, please. You got tricked into snogging someone? Block him, throw him off that mountain. Do anything, just do more than this. I just really don't like it. Imagine how conniving and how much of a disgusting like person you have to be to stand there and know in your mind, like you're saying this stuff to this person. Well, I don't have to come back unless you ask me to kiss you. You're saying that and you're putting on this act of, oh, I'm so depressed by this. I just, I just feel like it has to all end. And in your mind, you're thinking something, you're thinking the complete opposite. You're thinking, yes, yes, it's working, it's working. He's a predator, he's a sex offender, what can I say? Why aren't you angry with me, I whispered. Why don't you hate me? Or haven't you heard the whole story yet? I think I got a fairly comprehensive look, he said in a light, easy voice. Jacob makes vivid mental pictures. I feel almost as bad for his pack as I do myself. Poor Seth was getting nauseated, but Sam is making Jacob focus now. The fact that he completely lied to her, threatened suicide if she didn't kiss him, and then runs off gloating about it to his entire pack, like all these people, he is disgusting, he's dehumanizing, he's a liar, he's a misogynist. He sees Bella as this trophy to lie to and conquer rather than a human being of emotions and wishes of herself. He is the worst character in this book by far. Look, Bella don't have many emo emotions or wishes. Her only wish is to turn into a vampire and be with Edward. But that's still her wish to make. Okay, he should respect that. At least when I do these books, I stay very well hydrated. Because I just, you know, like, get so angry that I just spit everywhere. So I have to... <laughs> No, that's not why. It's because it's hot in here. Edward is being incredibly patient and understanding, either from being 100 years old or just from being a cuck. The jury is still out there. You love him, he murmured gently. Every cell in my body aches to deny it. I love you more, I said. It was the best I could do. Yes, I know that too. But when I left you, Bella, I left you bleeding. Jacob was the one to stitch you back up. That was bound to leave its mark on both of you. I'm not sure those kind of stitches dissolve on their own. I can't blame either of you for something I made necessary. I may gain forgiveness, but that doesn't make me escape the consequences. Don't love him though. I read New Moon page to page. She was using him and he's just been bullying her this whole book. That's not love. Romantic, true love isn't, it's not, I'm just trying to, gonna try and get everything I can out of this person for my own gratification. It's not that. It's not, I'm gonna mislead them and trick them, manipulate them into getting something I want. That is just abuse. That is not love. Edward is being chill, literally in his case, but Bella wants him to fight for her. I'm not trying to prove something. You said I could have any part of you I wanted. I want this part. I want every part. I wrapped my arms around his neck and strained to reach his lips. He bent his head to kiss me back, but his cool mouth was hesitant as my impatience grew more pronounced. My body was making my intentions clear, giving me away. Inevitably, his hands moved to restrain me. So in light of everything that just happened, she tries to bang Edward, of course. Why am I feeling? I'm feeling bad for Edward. He's out there like getting cucked all night, getting cucked now. It, it's, his girlfriend's trying to use him sexually to get over what just happened. I never thought I'd feel bad for Edward, but I do. He, he lists reasons as to why they shouldn't just, you know, drop trow and make stony love. Fourthly, he murmured, dropping his face so he was whispering in my ear. We will try, Bella. I'll make good on my promise. But I'd much rather it wasn't in reaction to Jacob Black. <sighs> I cringed and buried my face against his shoulder. And fifthly, this is a very long list, I muttered. Why is this the funniest thing that Bella has said all book? Where is this Bella? Like, this is... But the newborns have reached the trail. The first group is in the clearing. We can hear the fighting. As always, most of the action happens elsewhere whilst Bella sits passively by. Even when the action like meets her in a few pages, she stands there passively until she does one thing. She's a human, sure, I get it, I get it. But just, it's not that interesting for us to... Like in, in, in the first Twilight, when they had to escape from James and, and... Yeah, it was just James. They have a little, they have a little kind of car chase scene. And then like Bella sits passively at a hotel for a while whilst everyone else goes out to like hunt James. And I, I understand the reason why because she she's a human so she can't do anything but it, that, that's not interesting is it new moon she actually does something doesn't she when she runs into his arms 
and then stands passively by whilst other stuff happens and Volturi talk about her and not to her. They're talking about you, his teeth clenched together. They're supposed to make sure you don't escape. Nice move, Leah. Hmm, she's quite fast, he murmured in approval. One of the newborns caught our scent and Leah took him down before he could even turn. Sam's helping her finish him off. Paul and Jacob got another one, but the others are on the defensive now. They have no idea what to make of us. Both sides are fainting. No. Let Sam lead. Stay out of the way, he muttered. Separate them. Don't let them protect each other's backs. Edward gives us a blow by blow account, but from this kind of third person perspective, I suppose, it's not very interesting. It feels, I, I understand the need for it because Bella can't be in the clearing, but it also feels a little bit lazy. Is this what it was like back in the 60s when you had to listen to the radio to watch a baseball game? Something happens, finally. Who had been lost? There's Roz. Mine. All mine. What was my lost? How does this affect me? Me. Me. <laughs> so quickly that I wasn't exactly sure how it happened. I was on my feet and the tent was collapsing in ragged shreds around me. Had Edward ripped our way out? Why? Seth runs off for help. Had two entire seconds passed? It felt like hours. I was terrified to the point of nausea by the knowledge that something horrible had gone awry in the clearing. I opened my mouth to demand that Edward take me there and do it now. They needed him and they needed me. If I had to bleed to save them, I would do it. I would die to do it. Like the third wife. I had no silver dagger in my hand, but I'd find a way. We get that she wants to be the third wife. You do not have to continuously tell us. Let us infer it for ourselves and draw our own conclusions and metaphors. Please, Maya, I beg, stop spoon feeding me. I'm not your child, please. Relief washed from my mind at the same time that my stomach dropped through the soles of my feet. I'd misunderstood. Relief, nothing had gone wrong in the clearing. Horror, the crisis was here. Yeah, of course she feels relieved that she might die in the next few seconds as long as the precious Cullens and the precious werewolves live. Pfft. What kind of self-preservational instinct is that? If this was like a million years ago and we were all cavemen, she would have been the first picked off by a, one of those big cats with the saber-toothed tiger. Saber tiger. Edward tells her that Victoria is coming. Victoria and a blonde vampire boy arrive. Tension rolled off of her, nearly visible in the air. I could feel the desire, the all-consuming passion that held her in its grip, almost as if I could hear her thoughts too. I knew what she was thinking. She was so close to what she wanted. The focus of her whole existence for more than a year now was just so close. My death. All these vampires really need to pick up a few hobbies. You have eternity ahead of you and this is all most of them do. Plot to kill people all the time. Kill, kill, kill. Go read a book. Go watch Netflix. Why is she not trying to get revenge on Emmett and Jasper? They're the ones that did it. They're in the clearing right now. Contrived. She'd have to stop my heart. Perhaps a hand shoved through my chest, crushing it. What a metal way to go. That's like, spoilers. The end of Soul Reaver 2, when he takes the Heart of Darkness from Janos Audrin. Right of his shit and metal. Now that is a vampire story you should all check out, even though it's a PS1 and PS2 game. It's fan bloody tastic. Edward speaks to the boy who is called Riley to try to reason with him, but it doesn't work. A wolf comes, Seth, and rips Riley up, but Riley survives and breaks Seth's shoulder in retaliation. But yeah, you know, the werewolves quickly heal, so don't shit your pants. So Victoria and Edward dance as a form of fighting. Ugh. Edward goads Victoria into staying and not fleeing. Seth wasn't limping anymore. His circling took him within inches of Edward. His tail brushed Edward's back and Victoria's eyes bulged. No, he won't turn on me, Edward said, answering the question in Victoria's head. He used her distraction to slide closer. You provided us with a common en enemy. You allied us. She clenched her teeth, trying to keep her focus on Edward alone. Look more closely, Victoria, he murmured, pulling out the threads of her concentration. Is he really so much like the monster James tracked across Siberia? I finished writing this and I, I don't understand what that is referencing. Monster James Siberia, I don't know. Riley smashes Seth into a rocky wall and shards of sharp rock fly everywhere. Bella catches a piece and cuts herself on purpose to distract the vampires for a second. Distracted, Edward rips Riley's arm off and throws it at Victoria. Iconic, he's so, like he's redeeming himself so much in the latter half of this book. Seth kills Riley. Edward decapitates Victoria with his teeth. Icon, best character. What the hell has Maya done to me? <laughs> Chapter 25. Mirror. Edward was in motion again, swift and coolly businesslike. He dismembered the headless corpse. Honestly, iconic, a king. We love to see it. We stan. We're team Edward over here. We're team Edward being single and finding his own way in life. Look, I know I'm being a bit OTT right now. Trust me, by breaking dawn, I'm sure all of this goodwill towards Edward is going to go straight back down into the gutter where it belongs. Eddie and Seth pile up the remains of Victoria and Riley and set them on fire. Edward stretched out his arm, his hand curled into a fist. 
Seth grinned, revealing the long row of dagger teeth and bumped his nose against Edward's hand. The bromance between a vampire and a werewolf would be a better book than Jacob harassing Bella for 600 pages straight. Edward now thinks that Bella is afraid of him. Oh, big scary mean vampire because he just saw her decapitate him. Me, me, me. Bella, I just... He hesitated, then forced the words out. I just beheaded and dismembered a sentient creature not 20 yards from you. That doesn't bother you. Why would it? She's not phased that he used to go around murdering murderers either. Big whoop. Seth was faking that he was hurt in order to lure Riley in. All of these werewolves are such lion bluffers, man. You can't, you can't, you can't trust these werewolves. Oh God, did the Cullens have a point? Did the vampires have a No. We don't want to enforce stereotypes, stop. Edward and Seth hear something else going on, so they both vague book like I'm meant to give a shit. His eyes focused on me with obvious effort. He pulled his clenched teeth apart. Oh, it's okay. We're going to be fine. It's, he broke off and winced again. What's happening? I cried out while Seth howled in, in anguish. We're fine. We're going to be okay. Edward gasped, Sam, help him. And I realized in that instant, when he said Sam's name, that he was not speaking of himself and Seth. No unseen force was attacking them. This time, the crisis was not here. He was you. He was using the pack plural. She is such an overdramatic narrator, and that in turn makes Maya an overdramatic writer. Do, do you see in that one sentence alone how I was all proper English then? An overdramatic narrator. Oh, I say, but that in turn makes Maya an overdramatic writer. In it, mate. Yeah, British. Way, heat wave. Way, football. Way. Come on, England. Stop spoon feeding me, Maya, please. I can I can feed myself. I get it. Like, it doesn't certain things don't need this much emphasis, you know what I mean? This is why Twilight is so long, because it's stuff like this, it, it just slows down the text. This constant meandering, pontificating, bigger words. Way. Middle class. No, not middle class. Middle aged, that's it. Middle aged bloke going to the pub. All right, mate, can I order a uh, pint, uh, Stella? Uh, what do you call that? Where's the ad on it? Wait, wait. Has anyone seen that TikTok? I love that. I love that TikTok. Oh, these are... These are marathons. I'm literally a professional talker. My job is great. My, my life is great. What am I saying? I just get to complain for a living and people like it. Hurrah. Seth runs home and Edward takes Bella to run to the clearing because the Volturi have decided to turn up to gatecrash the party. How lovely. Jane and Dimitri are there. I didn't want to think that name. I didn't want to see that blindingly exquisite childlike face in my head. Stop flattering vampires for all of two seconds. This exquisite child could kill you just by think. No, actually she can't catch you. She should kill you just by like giving you one of these. <laughs> It's a good thing I think I'm funny, even if no one else does. One of the newborns had hurt Jacob because he had tried to protect Leah, you know, because women can't do anything right, I guess. But good, newborn, tear his head off. Good, do it, do it. Bella actually faints at this information that the, the newborn hurt, didn't kill, he's fine, just you know, crushed all the bones in his left side of his body, but he's also a werewolf, so they heal super quickly. But Bella faints. How am I meant to support someone this pathetic? Bella comes round to Carlisle touching her face. <clears throat> it's not the only coming round she was doing, I bet. Jacob's fine. Bella gets over her. Yes, he knocked her out of the way, but he didn't have time to defend himself. The newborn got his arms around him. Most of the bones in the right half of his body were shattered. That's what he gets. There's a young vampire who is also with them who surrendered. Have you changed your mind, young one? Carlisle asked, calm as ever. We don't want to destroy you, but we will if you can't control yourself. How can you stand it? The girl groaned in a high, clear voice. I'm losing my voice. I want her. <sighs> yeah, you, Edward, Jacob, Mike, who else? Her bright crimson irises focused on Edward, through him, beyond him to me, and her nails ripped through the hard soil again. <sighs> Take Bella, please. Do us all a solid. The Volturi arrive and Jane is confused by the newborn. Jane's dark eyes flashed to his face. Surrendered. Felix and another shadow exchanged a quick glance. Edward shrugged. Carlisle gave her the option. There are no options for those who break the rules, Jane said flatly. Carlisle spoke then, his voice mild. That's in your hands. As long as she was willing to hold her attack on us, I saw no need to destroy her. She was never taught. That is irrelevant, Jane insisted. Savage emotional damage. The Cullens debriefed Jane on what happened. She tortures the newborn for a laugh. The newborn is called Brie. Yes, we will review that book. Jane tortures her for more information. Jane half smiled. I can't deny that I'm impressed. The big shadows behind her murmured in agreement. I've never seen a coven escape this magnitude of offensive intact. 
Do you know what was behind it? This, it seems like extreme behavior considering the way you live here. And why was this girl the key? Her eyes rested unwillingly on me for one short second. Yeah, they all survived because that's what we call the power of plot armor. Also, who has plot armor? Hmm, the armored titan, an attack on titan. That huge plot armor. The plot armored titan. <laughs> hey, stupid damn titan. <laughs> I will never forgive Izzy Yabba for what, for what he did to me. No, I'm actually over it because like, I'm, I'm, I'm too old to give a shit. Man, I'm too old. I got better things to give a shit about. Like these stupid over decade old books. Jane tries to torture Bella literally just for a laugh, which is so based. Maybe Jane is my favorite character of the series. I'm teen Jane trying to torture Bella, but it doesn't work because of Bella's thick boneheadedness. Jane wants to kill Cheddar the vampire, but Edward wants to offer her a choice of vegetarianism instead. Jane's expression was torn between amusement and disbelief. We don't make exceptions, she said, and we don't give second chances. Medal. Take care of that, Felix, Jane said, nodding towards Brie, her voice dripping boredom. I want to go home. Heavier medal. Bye bye, mozzarella. The chapter ends with Gorgonzola dismembered and added to the fire pile. Chapter 26. Ethics. The counter in Alice's bathroom was covered with a thousand different products, all claiming to beautify a person's surface. Since everyone in this house was both perfect and impermeable. Impermeable? Aren't a lot of rocks porous? <laughs> Maya. I could only assume that she'd bought most of these things with me in mind. I read the labels numbly, struck by the waist. Oh. Alice is like one of those annoying ASMR TikTokers who have cupboards full of beauty products and have those ridiculous nighttime routines where they use like 30 different products and like whatever, okay? Am I meant to give a shit? They have so much products to make up for the emptiness in their skulls. Yes, I recently was on TikTok and I saw someone who really annoyed me because their whole TikTok was just, and it was like, look, I, I got like, you know, makeup products and stuff. But this, it was so excessive. It was like, oh, restocking my guest drawer for when my guests come over. And it was just, just stuff upon stuff. But at the same time, well, if, if stuff and material positions, but possessions make you happy, who am I one to really, who am I one to really judge that? But at the same time, if it's bad for the planet to just be constantly rebuying all of, I mean, it was so much stuff. But who am I to judge someone's pursuit of what gives them meaning just because my values don't align with it? Who would I be to try to ascribe meaning to someone else's life? This is why I'm gonna be such a good philosopher, man. But at the same time, it really annoyed me because it just seemed so, I enjoy, you know, some luxury items here and there, but it just seemed so, so abundant that it seemed almost meaningless. It seemed like there was just so much stuff this person had and the restock in the nighttime's routines. How would they have time for anything else? But then, well, if they don't do, want to do anything else, isn't that fine too? Aren't we just all on this rock in infinity trying to, trying to keep ourselves distracted and happy? Anyway, Bella has to go see Charlie to keep up her alibi of the sleepover or something. I oh, know, I forgot. Alice, can I ask you a question about the future? She was suddenly wary. You know I don't see everything. It's not that exactly, but you do see my future sometimes. Why is that, do you think, when nothing else works on me? Not what Jane can do or Edward or Aro. My sentence trailed off with my interest level. My curiosity on this point was fleeting, heavily overshadowed by more pressing emotions. One of my questions will actually be answered. Alice, however, found the question very interesting. Jasper too, Bella. His talent works in your body just as well as it does on anyone else's. That's the difference, do you see? Jasper's abilities affect the body physically. He really does calm your system down or excite it. It's not an illusion. It affects the body physically. But his ability also affects the other vampires, doesn't it? But if they're frozen in time, crystallized over, how is he affecting their systems? Maya. And I see visions of outcomes, not the reasons and thoughts behind the decisions that create them. It's outside the mind, not an illusion. Either reality, or at least one version of it. But Jane and Edward and Ara and Dimitri, they work inside the mind. Jane only creates an illusion of pain. She doesn't really hurt your body. You only think you feel it. You see, Bella, you are safe inside your mind. No one can reach you there. It's no wonder that Ara was so curious about your future abilities. I will allow this for now until I find something else to nitpick. Bella goes home and meets Charlie. I don't think you need to worry about Jake too much. Anyone who can cuss with that kind of energy is going to recover. Jake was awake when you saw him? I asked, spinning to look at him. Oh yeah, he was awake. You should have heard him. Actually, it's better you didn't. I don't think there was anyone in La Push who couldn't hear him. I don't know where he had picked up that vocabulary, but I hope he hasn't been using that kind of language around you. No F-bombs in my Christian novel. And I couldn't argue. Edward's more mature than Jacob when it comes to your safety. I'll give him that. Yeah, too little too late, old man. Weird day today, Charlie mused after a minute. 
You know, I don't put much stock in that superstitious crap, but it was odd. It was like Billy knew something bad was going to happen to Jake. He was nervous as a turkey on Thanksgiving. <laughs> what an expression. All morning. I don't think he heard anything I said to him. Is Charlie the most oblivious character in all these books? He is, isn't he? Because by breaking dawn, he knows that something supernatural is going on, but he's on a need to know basis and doesn't pry. Well, then shut up. But it's not, maybe that's realistic. If I got turned into a vampire tomorrow, no, I think I could tell my father and be like, dude, I'm a vampire now. And he'd just be like, oh, well, Denise, I was on the hill the other day and I thought, oh, what a lovely day of hang gliding. That would totally be my dad. Oh. I've been talking so much, I thought that I just clicked, I felt like I clicked my jaw out of place then. Ah, they actually like fear in my eyes. I hope we're not going to have a problem with that again. This morning we were out in the boat and Billy wasn't paying attention to me or the fish when all of a sudden you could hear wolves yowling in the woods. More than one, and boy was it loud. It sounded like they were right there in the village. Weirdest part was, Billy turned the boat around and headed straight back to the harbour like they were calling to him personally. Didn't even hear to ask me what he was doing. The noise stopped before we got the boat docked, but all of a sudden Billy was in the biggest hurry not to miss the game, though we had hours still. He was mumbling some nonsense about an earlier showing of a live game. I tell you, Bella, it was odd. So, obli so oblivious. Then the howling started again, right outside the house. I've never heard anything like it. I had goosebumps on my arms. I asked Billy, had to shout over the noise if he'd been setting traps in his yard. It sounded like the animal was in serious pain. I winced, but Charlie was so caught up in his story he didn't notice. Of course, I forgot all about it till just this minute, because that's when Jake made it home. One minute it was that wolf yowling, and then you couldn't hear it anymore. Jake's cussing drowned it right out. Got a set on lungs on him, that boy does. That is just bordering on stupidity, surely. How would you not? I'm, I'm sure like your first thought wouldn't be, maybe that boy can turn into a werewolf, but it's suspicious, isn't it? Charlie paused for a minute, his face thoughtful. Funny that some good should come out of this mess. I didn't think they were ever going to get that over that full prejudice they have against the Cullens down there. But someone called Carlisle and Billy was real grateful when he showed up. I thought we should get Jacob to the hospital, but Billy wanted to keep him home and Carlisle agreed. I guess Carlisle knows what's best. Generous of him to sign up for such a long stretch of house calls. And he paused as if unwilling to say something. He sighed and then continued. And Edward was really nice. He seemed as worried about Jacob as you are, like that was his brother lying there. The look in his eyes, Charlie shook his head. He's a decent guy, Bella. I'll try to remember that. No promises though, he grinned at me. I don't understand this. I don't understand why Edward would just suddenly care so much about this boy who's constantly trying to bang his girlfriend. Everyone in this book is so foolish and makes weird decisions. Jacob had looked so strangely fragile when I'd hurried down to see him as soon as Charlie had left. He'd had braces everywhere. Carlisle said there was no point in plaster as fast as he was healing. His face had been pale and drawn, deeply unconscious though he was at the time. Breakable. Huge as he was, he'd looked very breakable. Maybe that had been just my imagination, coupled with the knowledge that I was going to have to break him. I must break you. No, no, I just want to ask a favour. Charlie frowned, looked at the floor. Have a seat, this won't take long. I sat across from him, a little confused. I tried to focus. What do you need, Dad? Here's the gist of it, Bella, Charlie flushed. Maybe I'm just feeling superstitious after hanging out with Billy while he was being so strange all day, but I have this hunch. I feel like I'm going to lose you soon. How does one man not realise his town is infested with the, with the supernatural when he also is so insistent on just like being around them? He likes Carlisle. He likes hanging out with Billy all the time. Bella goes to Jacobs. He didn't answer at first. He looked at my face for a long moment. Then with some effort, he rearranged his expression into a slightly mocking smile. Yeah, I sort of thought it might be like that. He sighed. Today has definitely taken the turn for the worst. First, I picked the wrong place, missed the best fight, and Seth gets all the glory. Then Leah has to be an idiot trying to prove she's as tough as the rest of us, and I have to be the idiot who saves her. And now this. He waved his left hand toward me where I hesitated by the door. Oh man, has Bella made the wrong choice? How could she turn down this arrogant, sneering man-child? What is going through her brain? She must be just cuckoo. Oh, silly woman. He wasn't even mad at me. He wasn't even mad at you. He's so unselfish. This is about Edward. It makes me feel even worse. I wish he would have yelled at me or something. It's not like I don't deserve, well, much worse than getting yelled at, but he doesn't care. He just wants me to be happy. He wasn't mad, Jacob asked, incredulous. No, he was much too kind. Jacob stared for another minute and then suddenly frowned. Oh. It's hard work talking this much. You won't think it is, but it is. Jacob stared for another minute, then he suddenly frowned. Well, damn, he growled. What's wrong, Jake? Does it hurt? My hands fl- What's wrong, lassie? Is there a boy down the well? My hands fluttered uselessly as I looked around for his medication. No, he grumbled in a disgusted tone. I can't believe this. He didn't give you an ultimatum or anything. Not even close. What's wrong with you? He scowled and shook his head. 
I was sort of counting on his reaction. Damn it all, he's better than I thought. Yeah, you definitely made the wrong choice in not choosing the scheming, emotionally manipulative puppy. He's not playing any game, Jake, I said quietly. You bet he is. Now he's undermining Je Edward for trying to be understanding. Like, because this is how this guy's mind works. That's why he's trying to project it onto, he's being immature. Yes, he is so, well, going around in circles. You bet he is. He's playing every bit as hard as I am. Only he knows what he's doing and I don't. Don't blame me because he's a better manipulator than I am. I haven't been lo around long enough to learn all his tricks. He isn't manipulating me. Yeah, he is. When are you gonna wake up and realize he's not as perfect as you think he is? Yeah, Edward is manipulative, is possessive. He is flawed, he has issues. This guy though, he's just so annoying. Get over it. She's just not that into you. Shut up. He's such a nice guy. TM. Ugh. He's the poster child for nice guys. Ugh. I'm entitled to Bella because you. At least he didn't threaten to kill himself to make me kiss him, I snapped. As soon as the words were out, I flushed with chagrin. Wait, pretend that didn't slip out. I swore to myself that I wasn't gonna say anything about that. He took a deep breath. When he spoke, he was calmer. Why not? Because I didn't come here to blame you for anything. It's true though, he said evenly. I did do that. This is what I mean, Maya, with the self-awareness. You know the horrid stuff that you're writing. Why? I'm not adverse to reading horrid literature, of course. I mean, you know, all stories are based around, most of them are based around conflict. Conflict and resolution, right? That is a story. But this is just kind of like horrible for no reason. It's not like Jacob ever gets any sort of real comeuppance for, for his behavior. Instead, it's almost like his behavior is just accepted and thus normalized to impressionable teenagers reading this who might have put up with bad behaviors from their partners. I don't know. I don't care, Jake. I'm not mad. He smiled. I don't care either. I knew you'd forgive me and I'm glad I did it. I'd do it again. At least I have that much. At least I made you see that you do love me. That's worth something. Doing shitty things because you know that ultimately the other person will forgive you makes you pretty shitty. Why do the shitty thing in the, in the first place? It's really weird that he is so comfortable in knowing that he is a twat. And I just realized Jacob is her future son-in-law. She has snogged her future son-in-law. Way to make future Christmas dinners awkward. Kissing me back like that was inexcusable. He spit the words at me. If you knew you were just going to take it back, maybe you shouldn't have been so quite so convincing about it. I winced and nodded. I'm so sorry. Sorry doesn't make anything better, Bella. What were you thinking? Now he sounded like Edward. I wasn't, I whispered. Yeah, it's totally her fault that she felt coerced into snogging you under threat of your death. Um, and Bella is so passive. About, she's saying sorry. Maya, this is a horrible role model for young girls because obviously characters in fiction don't have to be role models and the more flawed characters are usually the more compelling to follow. But Maya's totally the type of person where she probably thinks that Bella is some sort of like girl icon for teens everywhere, I don't know. 600 pages of Bella Swan accepting and normalizing crappy behavior from men, yay. What do you mean by be good? I'll be your friend, Bella, he said quietly. I won't ask more than that. I think it's too late for that, Jake. How can we be friends when we love each other like this? Love each other like what? All they've done this book is argue. The worst part is knowing what would have been, what might have been, I sighed. No, Jacob shook his head. I'm exactly right for you, Bella. Stop it, so oh God. It would have been effortless for us, comfortable, easy as breathing. I was the natural path your life would have taken. He stared into space for a moment and waited. I waited. If the world was the way it was supposed to be, if there were no monsters and no magic. He's like a drug for you, Bella. His voice was still gentle, not at all critical. I see that you can't live without him now. It's too late, but I would have been healthier for you, not a drug. I would have been the air, the sun. The corner of my mouth turned up in a wistful half smile. I used to think of you that way, you know, like the sun, my personal sun. You balanced out the clouds nicely for me. He sighed, the clouds I can handle but I can't fight with an eclipse. She's done that thing where she mentioned the title in the book. Oh, I like that. So I suppose in this metaphor, Edward is a moon blocking out Jacob's sunlight, but Edward is Bella's universe, not a pathetic moon that just, what does a moon do? Affects the tides and turns people into werewolves. I literally take everything back, this entire review back, the hours I've spent scripting, dismantling, complaining about this book. Stephanie Mayer is a bloody genius. Also, I concede that it is quite iconic that Mayer turned a simple word, twilight, one word that you probably wouldn't use much in day-to-day -day vernacular, but it's now instantly synonymous with vampires and Edward and Robert Patterson and Kristen Stewart and these books. Oh God. These books are always gonna be remembered. They're too much in the public consciousness. Embedded. The worst part, I hesitated and then let the words spill out in a flood of truth. The worst part is I saw the whole thing, our whole life. 
And I want it bad, Jake. I want it all. I want to stay right here and never move. I want to love you and make you happy. And I can't, and it's killing me. It's like Sam and Emily, Jake. I never had a choice. I always knew nothing would change. Maybe that's why I was fighting against you so hard. Or maybe you were fighting against him so much because he's a sex offender who tries to assault you. Tomato. Tomato. Lots of things. I worked to make my voice lighter, but I stayed honest. I've never been much of a masochist, so I'm not looking forward to the pain. And I wish there was some way to keep him away. I don't want him to suffer with me, but I don't think there's any way around it. There's dealing with Charlie too and Renee. And then afterwards, I hope I'll be able to control myself soon. Maybe I'll be such a menace that the pack will have to take me out. He looked up with a disapproving, I'd hamstring any one of my brothers who tried. Bella is so weird. I don't want Edward to see me in pain because it will hurt him. But that, that that's what partners do, babe. They support you during difficult times. It helps lighten the load a bit. It makes you feel better. Stop trying to push this narrative that she's this selfless because this is just bordering on being really, really daft and being like, being masochistic, being like self flagellating, you know, that thing for no reason. Also, I'm glad to see that uh, Jacob changed his mind about murdering all of the Cullens after Bella turns. Maybe this is his character development, not being a bloodthirsty psychopath. I stretched my neck up to whisper in his ear, laying my cheek against his warm skin. You know I love you. I know, he breathed, his arm tightening automatically around my waist. You know how much I wish it was enough. Edward is punching the air right now. He's doing one of these. <laughs> but he's such a cuck, it's unreal. I know he's one in quotations, as if Bella is an object to win, but this is very inappropriate, yeah? Cuddling another boy in bed who's in love with you, and you apparently love them too. Cucked, mate. I wonder when it will happen, I said, when the right girl is going to catch your eye. Don't get your hopes up, Bella. Jake's voice was abruptly sour, though I'm sure it would be a relief for you. Maybe, maybe not. I probably won't think she's good enough for you. I wonder how jealous I'll be. Mm, yes, being jealous of your own uh, daughter. Mm, yes, please. Freud would have an absolute field day with this one. Chapter 27, needs. Bella dries for a bit before having a breakdown and crying. All Bella does is cook food for Charlie and cry. It's not interesting for me to read about someone always crying. At first it was worse because there was that smaller part of me, smaller but getting louder and angrier every minute, screaming at the rest of me that craved a different set of arms. So then there was fresh guilt to season the pain. May I can keep selling this narrative by and by him. She goes home to Charlie who notices that she's been crying. Nothing dad, I just had to talk to Jacob about some things that were hard, I'm fine. The anxiety calmed and was replaced by disapproval. Was this really the best time, he asked. Probably not, Dad, but I didn't have any alternatives. It just got to the point where I had to choose. Sometimes there isn't any way to compromise. He shook his head slowly. How did he handle it? I didn't answer. He looked at my face for a minute, then nodded. That must have been answer enough. I hope you didn't mess up his recovery. Why is Bella always being blamed for everything? And what is this sudden narrative of, I had to choose, I had to choose. There was no choosing. There was never going to be a choosing. It was always going to be Edward. Like. My hindsight seemed unbearably clear tonight. I could see every mistake I'd made, every bit of harm I'd done, the small things and the big things. Each pain I'd caused Jacob, each wound I'd given Edward, stacked up into neat piles that I could not ignore or deny. Well, I'll ignore it for you then, sharp. And I realized that I'd been wrong all along about the magnets. It had not been Edward and Jacob that I'd been trying to force together. It was the two parts of myself. <laughs> Edward's Bella, Jacob's Bella. Not Bella's Bella, just Edward's and Jacob's Bella. But they could not exist together and I never should have tried. I'd done so much damage. Women belong to men. Women cannot exist outside of men. And any woman that tries to in this series is Leah Clearwater, a bitter, bitter werewolf who never gets a good resolution. Thanks, Maya. Remember, if you guys think I'm being too much right now, all of this, I could have been a soulmate. In a normal life, it would have been me and you. Nonsense is retconned in Breaking Dawn by the whole, I was in love with your egg the entire time, Bella. It was always for Nesme. So she's being over dramatic for nothing. Why don't you feel a bit mugged off? If you, let's say that, yeah, okay, let's go along with that. She's in love with him, bullshit. If you thought that you were in love with someone and they thought they were in love with you, but then it turns out that they were just like wanting to imprint on your egg, sure. Why don't you feel mugged off? Like, oh what? So I had this real love feeling for you, but you were just after me ovaries. Bit of an imbalance, isn't it? Bella cries all night and then she stops crying the next day. So she's over it pretty quickly. It's no, um, it's no Edward. It's no new moon. I just wanted to find this one part I remembered to see how she said it. I flipped through the book, finding the page I wanted easily. The corner was dogged from the many times I'd stopped here. Kathy's a monster, but there are a few things she got right, I muttered. I read the lines quietly, mostly to myself. If all else perished and he remained, I should still continue to be. And if all else remained and he were annihilated, the universe would turn it to a mighty stranger. I nodded again to myself. I know exactly what she means. And I know who I can't live without. 
I can live without this book, Maya. Edward and Belle Belle go to see Alice. Bella gives Alice permission to do her wedding. Don't worry, Bella, it'll be perfect. Do you want to see your dress? I had to take a few deep breaths. Whatever makes her happy, I said to myself. Sure. It's your wedding day. It's your day. It should be about what makes you happy. This is not selflessness. This is passivity to the point of, I don't even know. Can't even think of the words to describe it. Alice foresaw she would end up as Bella's wedding planner eventually, and she got Bella a wedding dress already. Wouldn't it be boring to always be seeing the future and then also seeing it play out in the now? Nothing would be surprising. It'd just be a bit... Like watching reruns of a TV show. No, that's not the worst thing in the world. Bella calls the dress her Anne of Green Gables vision. But when I Googled that, this is what came up. So nice dress, nerd. Very handmaiden's tale of you. I don't know. Edward and Bella go to their meadow. Bella has decided to have a wedding so Charlie can walk her down the aisle and she can say her goodbyes to her parents. Edward wants to break off the wedding in light of this information because it means that Bella is doing it for others and not herself. No, we're doing this your way because my way doesn't work. I call you stubborn, but look at what I've done. I've clung with such idiotic obstinacy to my idea of what's best for you, though it's only hurt you, hurt you so deeply time and time again. I don't trust myself anymore. You can have happiness your way. My way is always wrong. So he shifted under me, squaring his shoulders. We're doing it your way, Bella, tonight, today. The sooner the better. I'll speak to Carlisle. I was thinking that maybe if we gave you enough morphine, it wouldn't be so bad. It's worth a try, he gritted his teeth. Edward, no. He put his finger to my lips. Don't worry, Bella, love. I haven't forgotten the rest of your demands. His hands were in my hair, his lips moving softly, but very seriously against mine before I realized what he was saying, what he was doing. He wants to... I made myself focus. It took a great deal of effort just to force my hands to free themselves from his hair to move them to his chest, but I did. And then I shoved against him, trying to push him away. I could not succeed alone, but he responded as I knew he would. He pulled back a few inches to look at me and his eyes did nothing to help my resolve. Look, when she pushes him back, cause she's like, mm -mm -mm, not sure about this buddy. He actually lets up. Take a hint, Jacob. Why? He asked again, his voice low and rough. I love you. I want you. Right now. Cool, what bunch of filth? I'm gonna stop smoking a cigarette in a moment. Bella convinces Edward that she does want a wedding after all. How proper of them. How mature. Pfft. It's a good thing you're bulletproof, I sighed. I'm going to need that ring. It's time to tell Charlie. This is a scene that I really wanted to see and I'd have exchanged it happily for the kissing, coercion, all that nonsense. But no, alas, we do not get that. He once again slid my ring into place on the third finger of my left hand, where it would stay conceivably for the rest of eternity. Beautiful, magical, the end. Thank fuck. Epilogue. Choice. Oh no. Jacob Black. Oh no. Jacob, do you think this is going to take too much longer? Leah demanded, impatient, whiny, my teeth clenched together. Like anyone in the pack, Leah knew everything. She knew why I came here, to the very edge of the earth and sky and sea, to be alone. She knew that this was all I wanted, just to be alone. But Leah was going to force her company on me anyway. Yeah, it's not nice when people force themselves on you, is it, Jacob? Besides being crazy annoyed, I did feel smug for a brief second, because I didn't even have to think about controlling my temper. It was easy now, something I just did, natural. The red haze didn't wash over my eyes, the heat didn't shiver down my spine. My voice was calm when I answered. Jump of a cliff, Leah. I pointed to the one at my feet. That's uh, mature of him. Can't believe Bella passed him over. For you? It took me a minute to believe she was serious. You have to be the most self-absorbed person alive, Leah. Read the pot kettle. Come on, mate. I'd hate to shatter the dream world you live in. The one where the sun is orbiting the place where you stand. So I won't tell you how little I care about what your problem is. Go away. Glad to see Jacob's got a new punching bag. Watch out, Leah, he might try and kiss you. I was just reading something for research earlier and I read that Sam Yuli went to Emily every day to convince her to be with him and she kept rejecting him until one day he got so angry at being rejected for like the hundredth time, he inadvertently shapeshifted, he lost control of his temper and then he mauled her and like ended up scarring her face. Like not actually like mauling, like, uh, but just, you know, in the kerfuffle, he scarred her face. And then he felt so bad about it that she ended up falling in love with him. What type of message is that, Maya? Reject man, get assaulted, fall in love with man, question marks, profit. What? Also, what type of message and representation is it, Maya? I don't think maybe she was the one to be doing the reputation in the first place. Well, just leave it at that. that. That so many of these Native American men have these uncontrollable tempers. They hurt women, Jacob, Sam. It's not a conversation to be led by me, obviously, but it is worth mentioning. But then like the perfect pale, because we're told all the time about how pale all the vampires are. The perfect pale Cullens are always totally in control and they're so good, they're never da 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 da. But then like, you know, these, these, these Native American men, they, they can turn into wolves and they're uncontrollable and all of that. I think a lot of the criticisms had some point. I mean, I don't know, I don't know, Maya. 
I've never met her. I've never spoken to her. I don't, I don't know her. I don't know what her thought process is. She's, she's so like soppy and soft. I've seen enough of that from her website. I'm not sure that she would have intended to be malicious. Never attribute to maliciousness what you can attribute to ignorance or stupidity. I'm not calling her stupid because she's clearly... I know. She's not, she's not, she's not stupid. I'm not saying that. It's just, that's, that's a quote. That is a, that is an actual quote. I didn't come up with that. I feel like my jaw's gonna go, I feel like it's just like, gonna get stuck. The wind's gonna change and then my face is gonna be like, but maybe regardless of what her intention was, I'd like to think that she wasn't trying to be malicious or she wasn't like trying to say something. Regardless of her intent, does it matter when the end result ends up like this? And I, I think the success of the books has to factor into it as well. I mean, if this had just been some fan fiction on Wattpad, right, that got maybe like a hundred visitors or views, who cares? But these books got seen, got read by millions of people. I don't know. It's not a conversation for me to have because I don't know what I'm talking about. It's just, these were my thoughts as I was getting to, to the end of it, these thoughts that were popping up and I do think it's worth mentioning. Maybe people can have a good, good, nuanced, mature discussion about it in the comments below. I ended up reading a lot of things about Leah Clearwater that I missed before because I, I was researching this because I was sure that one time I had read an article defending the terrible treatment she gets in these books. Not defending Maya's treatment of her, but defending her as a character against the, the treatment, if that makes sense. And I read that when Leah turned into a wolf, because it was unprecedented, no female had turned into a werewolf before, she turns into a wolf one day in front of her father, inadvertently, this is what triggered her father's fatal heart attack. Leah hated being a shapeshifter right from the start because she knew that her transformation caused her father to suffer from his fatal heart attack. What the hell, Maya? You can't just like... <laughs> no wonder she's stroppy all the time then. Leave her alone, Christ. Anyway, back to Twilight. I remembered back to when I used to think that Leah was pretty, maybe even beautiful. That was a long time ago. No one thought of her that way now. Pfft. Who cares about you? Except for Sam. He was never going to forgive himself. Like it was his fault that she turned into this bitter harpy. Jacob is such an unempathetic arsehole. Like, okay, they can't control the imprinting. The cousin could have tro controlled herself. Leah's in a really awful situation having to be stuck in this pact with like her ex and blah, blah, blah. Jacob is nasty. He's just nasty. This is making me sick, Jacob. Can you imagine what this feels like to me? I don't even like Bella Swan. And you've got me grieving over this leech lover like I'm in love with her too. Can you see where that might be a little confusing? I dreamed about kissing her last night. What the hell am I supposed to do with that? What? I don't understand how the pack hive mind works. It would be more interesting to get into that. Oh, maybe we, we will by new moon. Leah goads Jacob by telling him to get over Bella and that she's probably gonna die anyway when she's turned into a vampire. If you're upset about gender confusion, Leah, I said, slow, emphasizing each word. How do you think the rest of us like looking at Sam through your eyes? It's bad enough that Emily has to deal with your fixation. She doesn't need us guys panting after him too. Pissed as I was, I still felt guilty when I watched the spasm of pain shoot across her face. How are we meant to sympathize with Jacob when he's such a rotten person? Maya, I really don't care about Jacob's thoughts. He sounds like an edgelord. He, he just keeps complaining about Bella turning into a vampire. I made a face as I pulled my arm through the mm, sling and grabbed my crutches. I called him an edgelord right before I read that line. I'm a genius. And Sue stopped by today. My dad's voice was loud, hard to ignore as always. Amazing woman. She's tougher than Grizzlies, that one. I don't know how she deals with that daughter of hers though. Now Sue, she would have made one hell of a wolf. Leah's more of a Wolverine. He chuckled at his own joke. Now it's coming back to me though, how everyone is rotten to and about Leah. She's reduced down to just being a scorned ex of someone rather than a story potentially being much more interesting because she's the only female shapeshifter in the tribe's history. Though it could have been such a good opportunity, but no. She's just a bitch. Jacob has received a wedding invitation and this triggers the hell out of him. So he phases and runs away, threatening to leave forever and stay living as a wolf, but we would never be so lucky. Now I have some thoughts to conclude this video essay. That is the end. I found this article where it was talking about feminism in Harry Potter and Twilight. And this, this, this author of this article conveniently wrote down a sampling of female Twilight characters. Alice, a clairvoyant vampire of dubious skill who is obsessed with throwing the, about feminism and stuff because Maya thinks that her characters are feminist somehow. So this is a good example of the feminism in Twilight. Obsessed with throwing parties for Bella, despite the fact that Bella hates parties, buying new clothes for Bella, despite the fact that Bella doesn't like fancy clothes, and giving Bella makeovers so Bella won't feel ugly. Jane, another example of girl power according to Maya. Jane is a young female vampire with the ability to mentally torture others. She functions as a sort of attack dog for the powerful Volturi, a trio of male vampires who rule the vampire world. So she's not a ruler herself, she just forms part of their guard and attacks people when she's told to do so. Rosalie is a beautiful blonde who has 
Mm, assaulted by a bunch of dudes and then saved by Carlisle. She was originally named Carol. She is eternally pissed off that now she's undead, she can never have babies. Esme failed at committing suicide when her baby died. She married Carlisle, who thought she was hot in the morgue, turned into a vampire, adopted all the Cullens as her children. Doesn't do much in the stories except pat people on the shoulder in a motherly way when they're sad. It just, it just goes on to explain how all the girls in these books are um, rubbish, <laughs> basically. Uh, and they and they live for men. That's it. I just thought it was a good article. So link it down below. You can go check it out. I have some thoughts on imprinting. They try to insist, and by they, I mean Maya, that imprinting can be a brotherly or friend connection, but ultimately always turns out romantic because who could reject that much obsession? But what if someone did reject the romantic elements? Imagine if Renesme grows up and only wants Jacob as an older brother and falls in love with someone else how would Jacob react? And we know in New Moon that he's already fantasizing about when she is fully physically mature by the ripe old age of seven years old so they can bang, right? Sam got rejected by Emily and lost his cool and mauled her. Do you really think Jacob would be fine to be imprinted upon a girl who doesn't return his feelings? Because, you know, that girl is his life. So what's the chances of him going off and falling in love with someone else to, to you know, have Wolfbird? No. Look at how much he wanted to kill Edward and he threatened it constantly just because Bella loved Edward. He would 100% murder any poor sod who Renesme had an active interest in. I don't think Maya herself really understood the full implications of imprinting when she was conceiving like her well, I'm sure it's not an original idea so conceiving her version of it I think she really just likes the idea of a one true love but she doesn't consider things like consent free will etc that important love shouldn't be a form of slavery but enslaved one person for eternity it should be freeing when doing more research for this book and this script I saw a lot of justification online for Jacob and it always followed the route of not justification for I never saw anyone justify him forcing himself on Bella so that that's that's good um but just his actions because he's young and immature and I don't really like that yeah sure like teenage boys boys are immature and they have hormones teenage girls are also immature and also have hormones okay for starters my closest friends were and have always been boys at least 90 percent of like my friend groups always as a teenager sometimes those boys would at some point or another have a crush on me can you believe it oh my god so flattered uh guess what never happened none of them ever forced themselves on me even if i was alone with them drunk with them high with them sober with them don't matter because they respected me and usually i'd only ever find out about the crush years later from like 15 to 17 i was in a two-year long relationship for over two years and sometimes some of them would have a crush on me during this period and i, I didn't know about it i'd just get told they don't usually like drunkenly chatting with people oh yeah did you know that that guy ever had a crush on you like there's one like person in particular i'm not gonna use names obviously not that they're ever gonna see this but i was really like what really mm -hmm really taken aback but they wouldn't tell me whilst i was in the relationship because they respected me and my choice to be in that relationship they they respected that did any of them ever sex pest or harass me any of my friends like these close male friends no never they would keep it to themselves and get over it and then maybe it was something that we would just like offhandedly discuss years later like like adults when you're just over the situation for me when reading this novel jacob never taking responsibility for his actions in a meaningful way because because he doesn't he will say sorry and then he'll say things like yes i i did it on purpose i i he doesn't exactly say this is paraphrasing yeah i coerced you and i'd do it again and i did it because i know that you'd forgive me that's not an apology is it that's just an admission that you did something wrong and he never he doesn't see the issues with what he does he thinks all is fair in love and war when it's not. He doesn't take responsibility for his actions in any meaningful way. And Bella just getting over his pesting and assaults and harassment, to me, it just reeks of, oh, well, boys will be boys. Gotta let them act that way. Boys will be boys. What can you do? That's just how men are. So we, the women should put up with it, la la la, and always forgive them. Boys do know better. Anecdotally, I know that because I've witnessed that for all my life. Obviously, I've known and experienced men who should know better, do know better, but act badly. But in this situation, we're talking about, you know, close male friends, right? My experience in that has been boys know better and they should be kept to this standard and not be allowed to get away with bullshit. And my experience has been with my close male friends has been positive and I appreciate that a lot of people, it hasn't been positive and a lot of people have had Jacobs and that's why I don't like this 
I don't like that he just gets away with it because some people have had Jacobs in their lives who have managed to get away. I mean, we, we see it in the news a lot. Men, boys getting away with bad behavior and it's sort of just dismissed and the onus is put on the woman. Well, what were you wearing? Were you drunk? Were you drinking? Did, you know, this type of thing. We, we see it reflected a lot. So we don't need to see this behavior normalized and kind of like propped up in fiction, which it is because like, sure, he never gets Bella in the end, but he also just doesn't like, doesn't get his teeth kicked in for coercing her and like uh, harassing her and abusing her in the first. Do I really have to say oh, violence isn't the answer? We're talking about fictional characters here, so it doesn't matter. I refuse to have any empathy for Jacob. I refuse to because boys can do a lot better than this behavior and I've seen it. I don't think shitty behavior should be normalized in these romantic supernatural novels aimed at teenagers. That's my point. If my point is getting lost, it's because I'm really tired. I've been talking for like three hours straight. I genuinely also believe that Maya made Bella in love with Jacob too to justify weirdly all the immoral and illegal and unethical things he did to her as see, she loved me. I helped her realize this by continuously dismissing her relationship, undermining her choices, telling her she's in love with me, ignoring her boundaries and forcing my ideals onto her. Canonically, yes, Bella's in love with Jacob. Canonically, because because she said it. Says so in the text, but I don't infer it as that. It can be canon. I don't, I don't read it as that. I read it as someone that's just been so continuously harassed it's gaslit them into believing something. That's just, that's my, that's what I come away with the text thinking with my adult perspective. I might not have had the words gaslight when I was, you know, 16, but this is my adult perspective on it, right? Someone that's just been pushed into feeling certain way. And I also refuse to believe it's anything more than plot convenience so Maya can live out her odd fantasies of, two supernatural men being into ooh. maybe jacob does represent the life bella could have had had there not been supernatural elements to the world but no one owes you a relationship if they don't want it no matter how nice you are to them if they're not into it no one owes you it and with that we finished this bloody mammoth of a review. I feel like it's going to be so much longer than the others, like an extra hour or so, which is ridiculous. If this is like a five hour video about bloody eclipse, I mean, it's 630 pages long. I think the House of Night books are like 350 and normal Twilight is around the 500 mark for pages. So it's just been a lot. So thank you so much for going along on this ridiculous video with me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all the support that these types of videos get. As much as I like to just sit here and complain, I do enjoy doing these when I'm not getting wound up by ridiculous characters doing stupid things. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Hope everyone has a healthy, nuanced discussion in the comment section below. You guys usually do. You do me proud by being so mature and adult about things. I'm trying to, I'm trying to create the audience that I want. Well, I'm just itching. My makeup is disgusting right now. I feel disgusting. I can't believe I've been talking for like three hours straight. I love the sound of my own voice. What can I say? Thank you watching. Thank you to Ren for sponsoring today's video and I will see you guys soon with another review. Maybe a book review, maybe Love Island. I don't know, it might mix it up a bit. We'll see. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye.